Am I audible? Yeah, yes, sir. You are audible. Okay. And am I visible also? Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you. Welcome to Vinayaka Missions Group, where education meets healthcare excellence. Our academic landscape spans across 13 colleges and 11 schools, situated in four vibrant campuses. We are proud to serve the Union Territory of Puducherry and extend our reach to Salem and Chengalpet districts in Tamil Nadu. Pioneers in private medical education. We established the first private medical college in Puducherry back in 2000. Today, we operate two medical colleges in Puducherry, where we provide healthcare services to an astonishing 4.5 lakh outpatients and over 50,000 inpatients annually. We manage nine rural health centers, where we attend to approximately 1,000 patients every day, ensuring quality healthcare for all. And now, as we embark on our next level in healthcare, we are proud to introduce the Vinayaka Karkinos Oncology Institute or VCOI in collaboration with Karkinos Healthcare. Karkinos Healthcare is a purpose-driven, technology-led oncology platform revolutionizing cancer care in India with a primary focus on early detection, precise diagnosis, patient care and groundbreaking research. Through setting up of the Vinayaka Karkinos Oncology Institute, the aim is to bring comprehensive cancer care closer to the communities under the distributed cancer care network. Our mission, early detection programs through community screening programs, identifying high-risk patients and guiding them throughout their entire care journey. The facility will be equipped with state-of-the-art diagnosis and treatment options. And as part of our commitment to the people of Puducherry, Vinayaka Karkinos Oncology Institute aims to screen nearly one lakh population within the next few months. This collaboration between Karkinos Healthcare and Vinayaka Missions Group, including Vinayaka Missions Research Foundation, in setting up of the Vinayaka Karkinos Oncology Institute, Vikoi in Puducherry and Salem, shall be a testament where education, research and affordable and accessible cancer care come together for a brighter, healthier future.
A very good morning to one and all assembled here for the BMS Econ 2023 conference. Sir, can we start the session, sir? Should I go ahead? Sir, uh, if you're ready, then we will go ahead, sir. Okay, all right. Uh, okay, sir, just a moment. Where are my slides? Okay. Just a moment, sir. All right. A very good morning to all. Greetings to everyone from Arapadi Vedi Medical College and Hospital, Vinayaka Missions Research Foundation, Team TV University, Puducherry. I am Dr. Arti, Assistant Professor, Department of Medical Biotechnology, AVMC. And on behalf of the organizing team of the fourth international e conference, BMS Econ 2023, I extend a warm welcome to you. This year's theme is Beyond Boundaries Exploring Excellence in Basic Medical Sciences. This is the fourth consecutive year that the phase one MBBS departments of anatomy, physiology, and biochemistry, along with the Center for Biomedical Research are organizing this virtual conference. A heartfelt thanks to everyone who has joined us today. As we embark on this intellectual journey, we are privileged to begin the conference with a keynote talk. Our esteemed speaker, Dr. Deepak K. Sarkar, brings a wealth of knowledge, making this session one of anticipation and excitement. I request, the moderators of this session, Dr. M. Gopinath, Professor and Head, Department of Physiology, and Dr. Rakshmi Jatia, Vice Principal, Student Affairs and Professor of Physiology, AVMC, to take over the session. Thank you. Good morning, one and all. My greetings to you all from BMSC Con 2023. We are very privileged to have joins in medical sciences. Dr. Deepak Sarkar is there, Dr. William Stringer, and our chairpersons for this session, uh, Dr. KK Deepak from Delhi, Ames, Delhi. Next slide, please. So uh, our chairperson, Dr. William Stringer, I'm very uh, privileged to introduce our uh, chairperson, Dr. William Stringer. He's professor of medicine at David Geffen School of Medicine at UCLA. Currently the division chief of the respiratory and critical care physiology and medicine division at the same institute. And he is a renowned pulmonary and critical care physician with research interests in improving function and quality of life in pul chronic respiratory illnesses. He has been a part of many research interventions 
which include various devices, medications, behavioral therapy, and exercise rehabilitation in motto of exercise is the best medicine. Yes, very true. His clinical trial on long-haul COVID rehabilitation and recovery research program is the current project on process. So, um, in 2021, uh, Dr. William Stringer gave the same keynote address on long COVID. So, uh, that was very well appreciated by all the delegates. Uh, his research interests are in chronic obstructive lung disease, long-haul COVID, exercise physiology, pulmonary function testing, and rehabilitation sciences. Dr. Stringer received his undergraduate and medical degree from the University of California, San Diego, and his internal medicine residency and pulmonary and critical care training at Harbor UCLA Medical Center. He has published more than 23 international journals on the airway disease and effect of exercise on the airway. He has 38 years of experience. Now, I feel privileged to welcome our next staff person, Dr. K.K. Deepak. Sir is former professor and head in Department of Physiology, Ames, New Delhi, and currently working as visiting professor, Center for Biomedical Engineering, Indian Institute of Technology, IIT, New Delhi. He has contributed to curriculum planning at national level at almost six workshops and contributed as resource faculty for workshops at the regional and international level. He has been awarded Dr. S. Radhakrishnan Memorial National Teacher Award in 2000. 14, the All India Freelance Journalist and Writers Association, and 7th Dr. B.K. Anand Memorial Award at, by 2020 by Nutrition Society of India, NIN Hyderabad. His major general SL Bhatia Oration Award from ABPA and many other awards to his credit from PSA and NAMS, National Academy of Medical Sciences. He has published more than 300 research abstracts and publications. He has contributed to biomedical innovation and device development in collaboration with IITs and NIT Jalandhar. Setting up a autonomic functional lab in uh, 1989, a pioneer uh, diagnostic facility for assessing autonomic dysfunctions and vascular functional lab. And he had the responsibility to supervise and conduct the All India PG entrance examination, AIMS PG entrance examination, and other several uh, postgraduate entrance examinations. He has served as a chairperson for the expert committee, committee which prepared the age appropriate fitness protocol 2020, which were launched by a honorable PM, Sri Narendra Modi. Welcome you, sir. We welcome you for this. Uh, uh, BMS Econ to chair our session. Now I invite uh, Dr. You. William Stringer to introduce our uh, guest speaker, Dr. Deepak Kesaka. Oh, oh, thank, thank you very kindly for the invite and to get to introduce Dr. Sarkar. Um, he was currently a distinguished, distinguished professor of um, the agrochronology program in the Department of Animal Sciences at Rutgers University. Um, he's also the chairman and the director of the Department of Animal Sciences. Um, he got his bachelor's, master's, and PhD at Calcutta University um, in physiology and neuroendocrinology, and his doctor of philosophy at the University of Oxford. Um, he did postgraduate work at Oxford, Yale, and Michigan State, and progressed through the assistant and associate and full professor um, at Washington State um, prior to Rutgers. Um, he and I actually um, were at UCSD in the early 80s, um, but I didn't know him at that time. Um, but he's recognized for academic excellence in both Indian and American universities. Um, he has well over 180 peer-reviewed uh, publications. Um, his interest is in neuroendocrine cell growth, differentiation, and secretion. Um, he's done some very interesting work in um, addiction medicine, both alcoholism and opiate uh, neurotoxicity. And also has an interest in fetal alcohol syndrome and some of the um, abnormalities of circadian rhythm. And finally, the, the effects of stress on infection, cancer, and also those alcohol-related diseases. Um, so he'll be giving the keynote address um, to the fourth international e-conference, um, and econ 2023. And he'll be talking about the identification of new new mode of self cell communication within within the nervous system and focusing on neuroinflammation. So we're really quite anxious to hear your talk. And um, thank you for giving this, um, Dr. Sarkar. It's a real honor to be here with you. mind to run? Yes, sir. All right. Uh, okay. Thank you very much for, for the lovely um, introduction, Dr. Stringer. And, um, and thank you for the invitation. I think this is very exciting. I have never been one of like this. Uh, but when I got a call and I uh, looked at it, I, it really 
uh, got me very interested, uh, especially uh, developing uh, very modern uh, biomedical sciences, uh, uh, in, in, introducing into medicine is very, uh, very exciting. Um, so thank you again for our invitation. So what, what I really want to do today is, um, you know, bringing it to you, uh, giving you a description of something new going on in the neuroscience research. In the neuroscience research, we all know that um, brain is composed of uh, all cell body, particularly neurons and glia cells and others. And, um, and, um, and this glia uh, neuron, you know, as you all know, they, uh, you know, people used to believe the brain is all under control by the electricity. Neurons generate electricity, it transmits from one to other cells and then releases um, some chemicals and then they modify the activity where it terminates. Sir, um, sir, th sir sorry to interrupt you. Will you please share your slide? I'm, I'm on slide. No, sir. Please share your slide. Okay. Am I sharing my slides now? Yes, yes, yes sir. Yeah, 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 yes, sir. Please show in full screen mode. Sir, okay. please start a slideshow. Yes, sir. Now it's fine. You're fine? Okay. All right. Thank you for telling me that. I, I couldn't see it. Uh, but anyway, what I was talking about, that uh, we are dealing with, uh, what I like to deal with today is some mode of new communication uh, which has been uh, understood recently. And there's a lot of excitement going on with this communication. And this communication is within the brain and all, all over the body. But the brain part is very exciting for me. And that's what I'm going to talk about. And this communication is uh, really a little bit different from the traditional one. In a tradition in the brain, we have neurons which communicate by the electrical current and releases chemicals activate the, um, you know, uh, the, the, where the neuron terminates and, and induce the function. That's the way traditional has been known. And also there are, within the brain, there's not only neurons, but also glial cells, uh, uh, varieties type of glial cells, uh, and they are microglia, astrocytes, dendrocytes, and all kinds of other glial cells. And they also participate within this communication. And uh, unlike neurons, these glial cells, they don't really terminate, they don't make actions, uh, terminals. So they communicate through the extracellular fluid. And this extracellular fluid, uh, they releases uh, peptides, they releases growth factors and others. But recently, the discovery was been made that every single cell now is not only uh, you know, endocrine cells secrete things that goes to the new, uh, goes to the blood and travels all over. Neurons secretes and goes to the uh, um, the CSF fluid and goes all over. And these uh, and the glial cells and others they also secrete, but they are predominantly use these chemicals called exosomes or uh, microvesicles. So my talk will be is primarily on these microvesicles. And I also wanted to bring to the issue of micro, how these microvesicles involved in neuroinflammation. Why is neuroinflammation? Neuroinflammation is very important uh, in Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, and one of the diseases we deal with with the fetal alcohol syndrome. So, so here, this cartoon picture showing that these, all these different cells in the brain, they're secreting these the microvesicles and uh, the extracellular uh, vesicles, and they are they these use these, and they have a target size. They have receptors in every cells. They can go in the target cells and act on those cells. So, so I what I like to sh show you then how do they act, what they do when there's a neuroinflammation goes on. 
So he, again, let me bring to these extracellular vesicles I was talking about. And this is all, all cell types. Um, but within these brain, these microglia uh, and, um, and um, uh, um, the other glia cells, they are very much uh, use these. And these extracellular vesicles are uh, really comes from within the cells and uh, the cells make these vesicles and these vesicles then get uh, secreted out and as a as a exosomes and they are smaller sites or they bud out as a microvesicles. And these exosomes or these microvesicles, they contain varieties of cargo materials. And these cargo materials um, are, are uh, various hormone, uh, proteins, uh, genes, uh, 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 and also microRNA and many others. So, so what we are doing, we are trying to see how these microvesicle exosomes are involved in neuronal killing. And neuronal killing takes place, um, you know, during the aging process, we get Alzheimer, uh, during fetal alcohol exposures, during large amount of alcohol drinking, there's a lot of neuronal killing, go killing going on. Uh, and why do they get killed? And how did, they, how did the exosomes participate in it? That was our objective. So that's what I'm going to tell you, how we dealt with it, how we, uh, how we understood it, and how we using this information to go getting into the treatment. So the system we are going to use is, um, is these, uh, 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 the neurons within these part of the, part of the brain called hypothalamus. And uh, this part of the brain uh, get uh, affected by large amount of alcohol or fetal alcohol. And uh, not only this part of the brain get affected, but also various part of the brain like corpus callosum, cerebellum, cortex, hippocampus, and habit, and various other part of the brain also get affected, the neuron get killed. So the question then we started asking, why do they get killed? I mean, you know, the, you know what are the signals? What are the uh, molecular mechanisms involved in this killing process? And this is important not only for alcohol uh, filled, but also important for Alzheimer uh, and and various other uh, uh, neuro neuronal diseases. So, so the way we started looking at you know how did they get killed and wh and what are the molecular mechanism. So what he did, we we know that you know in a uh, in. Uh, a human being where uh, who, or mother drunk um, a sufficient amount of alcohol causing these babies, which are called fetal alcohol syndrome babies, they have a lot of neuronal deficits. They have a lot of neural diet. So we used the animal model to create these fetal alcohol syndrome conditions. And this animal model is this rat particularly, uh, they they were given alcohol in the doses, you know, this very moderate dose, and they were given for um, either in midterm of pregnancy or late term of pregnancy. If you do that, there's, there's a lot of neuronal killing going on, goes on. And the area we are interested, we is an area called hypothalamus. Why we are interested in hypothalamus? Because these babies, which are born, they have a lot of anxiety, depression, um, hyper stress response, and many other uh, behavioral problems. So, so we uh, and we uh, did a lot of studies identifying the majority of this problem goes on because of the defect in the hypothalamus. And what is the defect in the hypothalamus? This is, within the hypothalamus. There is a, a group sets of neuron called pro opio melanocortin or POMC. What are these neurons? This neuron POMC is very much involved in varieties of neuroendocrine function. What are the function? What does POMC does? 
POMC cause activation of uh, uh, you know uh, uh, endorphin release. So when the, you exercise or uh, you eat a chocolate or you eat ice cream, you feel good. And that good cause because of the POMC releases endorphin makes you happy. And also these neurons, when they are not happy, the it, it, stress gets hyper. It's very, uh, very stressful. Why is it stressful? Because this POMC neuron turn down the stress makes it normal. So it controls stress response. It also is very important for metabolic function. When you eat, the POMC neuron gets activated, tells don't eat anymore, don't eat anymore because you might, you might get obese. So POMC reduces the food intake behavior. So abnormality of POMC makes you obese. And it is all POMC neuron also are involved in, uh, in uh, insulin actions. So it also control uh, uh, the glucose imbalance. So there are varieties of function uh, the POMC neuron does. So that's got us interested in these neurons, how this fetal alcohol or alcohol exposure kill this neuron, what are the mechanisms involved in it? Yeah. All right, so let's see what we could do and how we can study this. So we have these animal uh, rat uh, models. We gave them the first uh, uh, four, five days of birth from P, uh, postnatal day two to postnatal day six. And when you do that, we find these neurons in the babies are significantly get reduced. So we have a control AD, pair fat uh, control, and alcohol fed. And then uh, and, and when you do that, we find this alcohol fed has a reduced number. So, so why is that reduced then? We anticipate that this reduction is caused by neuroinflammation. So one of the one of the the cell bodies within the brain causing neuroinflammation is called microglia, and this microglia can be prevented by a drug called minocycline. So when you give this alcohol fed animal with minocycline, minocycline, we see this neuronal death is reduced. So that kind of gave us the idea the microglia is involved in this neuronal killing, all right? So if that is the case, let's see how does microglia do that? So when you do this, study this in confocal microscopy, what you find with this microglia are connected with all these beta endorphin neuron in the normal, normal animals with the control, uh, PF, PR fed, control animal, they are all normal. But when you get the alcohol fed, this microglia is chewing up this neuron, engulfing it. So this uh, confocal microscopy picture showing that microglia is interacting and killing this neuron. And this killing could be blocked by minocycline. So again, proving that microglia is killing these endorphin neuron or POMC neurons. So, so how does the microglia do that? So we started anticipating that it may be using uh, uh, exosomes. So how do you study this? We have a in vivo, exosomes is everywhere. How do you know what is the microglia exosome? How do you know it's not coming from the astroglia or from neuron? So we need to figure out the technique, how to do it. So what we did then, we uh, take these babies, which are alcohol fat or control fat, and then make get the microglia out and cultured them and made a pure microglia culture. Or we keep them in vivo and, and get the microglia uh, separated out and, uh, and, and before we treat them, we did the microglia culture and then put alcohol and, and, and get the exosome out. Or after we treat them, we collect the hypothalamus out and extract and uh, dissociate the microglia, break the my, uh, microglia rupture and got the exosomes out. And how do you know we got the exosomes out? We uh, looked at the varieties of marker of exosomes 
and we found there is a significant number of exosomes. We looked at the other molecule within the cells, uh, like uh, mitochondria, uh, uh, um, uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, Golgi and extracellular uh, uh, vesicles, they are, they are all absent. And uh, when we look at the purity of these, we found there's no neuron, there is a very slightly uh, uh, astrocytes, but primary microglia. And when we looked at these nanoparticles, and we found that they are really very pure excess molecule in it. So, so now we got pure exosomes from microglia, and we ver verified with varieties of marker with a nanoparticle we, with the TM microscopy, and we identify that we have really exosomes from microglia. So let's see how does microglia exosomes is causing these signals, which is uh, killing these pumps in neurons. So now we have the exosomes. And we, we started looking at uh, from control and from alcohol federate, we find indeed the exosome number is high, uh, both in uh, MBH in vivo and uh, in vitro. And when you look at their activity, killing activity, which, which is used the aminopeptidase activity or, or with um, uh, uh, metalloprotease activity, we find indeed alcohol, Feeding, increasing the killing activity of micro, microglial exosomes. So, so how do you know those are really exosomes or they're not others? So what we did, we used the blocker GW4869, which blocked the exosomes transmission. When you do this, we prevent this, this killing activity uh, of beta endorphin uh, by both in vivo and in vitro. So showing that these exosomes are involved in this killing and exosomes coming from microglia killing these neurons. All right, so what are the molecules then in exosomes causing this killing? So well, we took varieties of approaches. One of the approaches called proteomic approaches. What it does, it you, you, you get the proteom, protein uh, out and put in the proteomics and identify all the proteins uh, got changed by the treatment. So we took the uh, alcohol treated microglia and then put in the proteomic. And what do you find? We find separate molecules are upregulated, increased by alcohol, and several molecules are downregulated by alcohol. One of the molecules got us very excited about called uh, complements. I will tell you why they are very exciting. And other molecule, also chemokines, uh, apoptotic molecule, RNA, RNA molecules. So we started looking at what are these molecules and how they are involved in this killing process. So microRNA is one of the molecules we found in the proteomic, indication of proteomic. Then we, we use the tilde RA, which detect all the my, different microRNA. And we found a large number of microRNA are elevated uh, and some of them are also suppressed. And we are currently ongoing all this stuff and I'm not going to present all this, then it will be two hours lecture. So, uh, so microRNA, I'm not going to talk. I'm going to talk some of the, uh, the, the findings which uh, are already been proven and very exciting. So one of the molecules I'm going to talk about is called complement. Complement in the brain? Complement supposed to be in the periphery. Complement supposed to be working as a immune substance. Within the periphery, when the peripheral immune system, complement is very important. How is it important? Uh, uh, the, when there's a viral or, or bacteria comes and the, you get antigens and immune uh, antibody comes and binds the antigen. When it binds, complement get activated, and then it what it complement does it it have a, have a varieties of protein of complements. Uh, they then activate this the antigen bound antibody and go, goes to the bacteria and make a hole in it and kills the kills the bacteria or virus. 
So that's the way complement function in the periphery. But how, why, how it could be this antibody doesn't go to the brain? So how, why is the complement in the brain? The complement in the brain does a different role. They, they are, nowadays they've been fine, they, they, they have been found that they affect the neurogenesis, they affect neuronal migration, they affect synaptic remodeling, varieties of function. For us, we found complement is also involved in microglia killing of neuronal function or ne microglia killing of neuron. So this paper, uh, this work is recently published in Journal of Neuroscience. And so let me go through some of this, what he found and how did he establish this complement is involved in the neuronal killing. So the complement, as I already showed you, complement is composed of uh, varieties of complement protein, C1, C2, C3, uh, C1Q, uh, MAC, and various others. I showed you the chart. I'm going to go through this again, showing you how we prove that complement is involved is neuronal killing. First thing we did, we've, we stained these, these, the hypothalamic beta endorphin neuron and uh, also stained the complement. We find this, look at the complement, the C1Q, these all are are covered with this beta endorphin neuron. So it's binding with the beta endorphin neuron when you st with, uh, stimulate with the alcohol. So alcohol stimulate complement and it binds with the beta endorphin neuron. Microglia secrete this complement protein, which goes to the beta endorphin and it binds on it. So it's showing this alcohol fed animal, uh, the brain C1Q level is high. Um, so, um, the, so it, the, then also it, the, it increases caspase 3, which is marker of the, of killing, uh, uh, the C3 is another bound of complement. So all this thing is, is, is activated when the alcohol is there, or we, we use alcohol activated microglia exosomes put in, we found the similar effect. So here is saying that it, this thing, all this activation could be blocked by minocycline. The minocycline is related to the microglia. So it's the microglia, which is secreting complement and which is causing this neuronal death via the complement system. So, um, so we did then complement with both in vivo and in vitro and with the exosomes, without ex activated exosome and inactivated exosome, what he did find that that when uh, uh, the the alcohol uh, is there uh, is complement C one C one C one Q uh, C three C four they all get activated and this both in vivo and in vitro system so that means that the complement are involved so C one C two C three proteins are involved. Um, we also then uh, start looking at their interaction uh, directly with the uh, we, with the, the neuronal death. Uh, and when you do that, we found is also activate the MAC or C5B9, which is the large part of the molecule which makes the hole in the uh, uh, in the cells. So when the uh, at, uh, the microglia secrete exosomes, which then activate. C1, C2, C3, and then C, C3 get activated the MAC protein, and that caused the, the uh, destruction of beta endorphin neuron and activate the caspase 3. So we also find that with the in vitro, uh, using the exosomes from, uh, from the microglia, and again, we find that C1, C3, C4, C5B all get activated, and they could be all blocked by um, uh, the inhibitor uh, of, of, uh, of the, um, uh, this, this, uh, uh, this uh, the, the, um, the complementary inhibitor, anti C1Q or, uh, or other uh, complementary inhibitor. So the take of message then, the, uh, when ethanol comes, uh, uh, when ethanol is given, is activated microglia, which produce exosomes. Exosomes then have complement. 
complement then comes get activated then it comes to the uh, the new uh, better forms a neuron and then using this the cascade of complement reaction cascade of complement reaction it uh, it uh, uh, the makes a uh, uh, the activate the mac on, on the on the neuron which makes a pore and kills the neuron in addition to that it also activate the mitochondrial ros ros is a, a antioxidant and it also activate caspase 3 so in addition to this mac induce caspase 3 ros also induces a, a, a Cas caspase 3 this is all part of the microglia microglia uh, induce the exosomes which 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 uses this this pathway to kill the bedendor forms in neuron. So this is the one of the processes. In biology, there is no such thing as a single thing or you know does everything. In biology, there are hundreds of things work in concert or in uh, sometimes it works, some other time it doesn't work. And they that's why you is very complex and it has a lot of hate. Uh, 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 the, the, you know, home, uh, the homeostasis maintenance not only caused by one system. So complement system is not the only system. There are many other systems involved in exosome induced neuroinflammation and killing. So the next system we started looking at is called uh, chemokines. The chemokines are um, varieties of chemokines uh, and chemokines are also involved. So when we look at the chemokine array, we find there are two chemokines, MEP1 alpha and MCP1 are very much activated within in the exosomes. And these are both in vitro and in vivo. And uh, so uh, the ethanol activate this. And again, minocycline, uh, which is a, a microglia blocker, is prevents this, uh, this uh, uh, activation of MEP1 alpha uh, and uh, MCP1 and MEP1 alpha. So, um, so we uh, started looking at the role of these MEP1 uh, uh, and MCP alpha, uh, MCP1, uh, MEP1 and MCP alpha. And um, when you look at, we see these, uh, um, when we use the chemokine blocker, uh, when you use exosomes, and it increases uh, from ethanol to exosomes, it increases the killing of the endorphin neuron. But when you put the chemokine blocker, it reverses it. So showing that chemokine are also involved in killing uh, microglia in this killing of uh, bed endorphin or POMC neuron uh, when you give alcohol. And um, uh, furthermore, uh, we see the uh, apoptotic death of these neurons could be um, uh, blocked by the chemokine blockers. And, uh, and MCP1, when you give them, it increases killing. But when you uh, use the chemokine blocker with alcohol, it suppresses it. Uh, or chemokine blocker with MCP1, it suppresses it. So showing that chemokines are also involved in this killing. So how does the, those chemokines do that? So we then looked at the, um, the PCR array of, of the genes taken out uh, 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 from the uh, uh, exosomes, alcohol-activated exosome-treated pumps in neurons and studied all different kinds of genes to understand the mechanism involved within the cells. We found there are varieties of apoptotic genes that are elevated like caspase 3 uh, Caspase 9, uh, uh, you know, BACs, BCL2, there's all kinds of apoptotic genes that are activated. We also find varieties of inflammatory genes that are activated IL 1 beta, um, uh, IL 6, uh, CCL2, um, TNF alpha. So all these inflammatory genes are also activated. In addition to these, the glutamate receptor genes we found activated. And also varieties of transcription signaling genes are activated, like GSK3 beta, MCP, IP, uh, uh, STAT3. So these are all genes are 
involved in this chemokine activated pathway. So when you put them together, what we predict that alcohol, when uh, through the uh, uh, chemokines, it uh, it secretes the exosomes and exosomes have chemokines, uh, MCP1 uh, or uh, MIP1 alpha, and which is also called CCL2. And this MCP1 alpha act on this receptor CCR2 and activate the GSK3 uh, or MCP IP, which then activate the uh, the gene expression uh, related to the uh, 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 apoptotic genes like Caspase 3, Caspase 9, PARP1, and then they go and uh, uh, cause activation of mitochondrial BCL2 and uh, and uh, and, uh, um, and other genes, and also it it causes the um, oxidative stress. Uh, by uh, by uh, NMD uh, receptors uh, and also varieties of inflammatory cytokines and causes the death of this neuron. So this is the molecular mechanism we identify from these chemokine related uh, the involvement in exosomes activated uh, killing of endorphin neurons. Um, and um, and so that's good. So can he make a therapy out of it? Could he uh, use something to prevent some of these? So we used um, some blocker of the these chemokines and and treated those those animals which were given alcohol, and uh, and we found that this blocker indeed uh, reverses some of the actions uh, when he uh, take them in. Um, in the um, uh, uh, in different day different ages, uh, the the, the postnatal period or adult period, we do find indeed both male and female we can reverse some of this healing. This is the adult the previous one of the neonate. The adult we also find this effect is uh, you know we treat them during the puberty. Uh, the, during the neonatal period, and we uh, have alcohol as well as the drug, and we prevent some of the killing. So that gives a lot of excitement that we could, uh, um, you know, we could bring some drugs in the market perhaps and uh, help for preventing these alcohol induced killing. And so, so why do we need this drug? Can we can this drug reverse some of the actions? Also, in with with respect to the behavioral aspect, like anxiety or or hyper stress response, and we find indeed we could also do this by these um, chemokine blockers. Uh, uh, we could reverse some of the effect on the open field and elevated plasmas, which is the the behavioral test you want to use for um, for studying anxiety behavior. And when we use this drug, we find that uh, these, these effects are suppressed, uh, normalized in many a way, uh, both in the, um, the anxiety behavior as well as the stress response, both male and female, very similar way. So these are uh, uh, exciting. And we are currently, we are making some genetic modification of these um, uh, exosomes, we are modifying these uh, these chemokines or uh, co uh, or complements, and then trying to use them in the animal, trying to see whether we can we can reverse some of them. So that uh, work is currently uh, in 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 progress. Uh, also, the uh, microRNA stuff in progress. So anyway, this is the summary of the thing we I presented today, uh, I just showed you that the exosomes or extravesicular pathway is one of the uh, new exciting pathway is, is causing lots of excitement within the field, and not only in the brain, also in the periphery, in the cancer field and others. And this ex the reason behind that exosomes, molecules are natural molecules, and you can you can modify 
the exosomes molecule by putting new genes or uh, putting modified uh, pr proteins uh, uh, and, and treat them. Unlike the uh, drugs, which, which, you know, when you add the drug, drug have a lots of side effect and others, but exosome is a natural molecule and you can load them with the uh, altered um, the, the genes or altered protein and give them to the patients or give them to the subject and and perhaps the and exosomes has the target also target receptors then you can drag the exosomes to the target site and cause the reversal of the effect so that's the, where the excitement comes exosomes gives a new venue of of the therapy therapeutic use of the drugs therapeutics of the uh, gene therapy uh, which might really advance the field of many, many diseases, including uh, fetal alcohol syndrome. With that, I want to acknowledge the contributions of the people who uh, work on this, uh, uh, the Natka, Dr. Vajiva, Omkaram, and uh, Benedict Russo, Tina Franklin, Miguel uh, Saini, Saista, Prashant, Pallavi, and Lucy. The, these are uh, fellows uh, and graduate students and um, and also the National Institute of Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism with multiple grants for this project. Thank you for listening. I'm open for questionings. Thank you, sir. That was a wonderful talk and wonderful research which you have done, sir. Over to chairpersons for their uh, queries. Thank you. Yeah. So can I speak? Yeah. Yes. So thank you so much, Saka. It's wonderful listening to you. And very nicely you have elucidated how alcohol induced activated uh, microglia can and then further uh, the block by which you can uh, reverse that. So it is very important piece of research with the alcohol uh, itself. And we have seen in, in the worldwide uh, alcohol dependence of the pregnant women is on rise. Uh, so this is another issue which has been addressed uh, even in India. And But I was wondering, you told that POMC when it stimulated might uh, induce endorphin. And yeah. normally this is, uh, this, is ac this is related to activity like physical activity and exercise. Yes. So yes. do you think uh, in a fetal state when it's not doing activity uh, exercise it may be activity even in that activity will be uh, releasing endorphins that's my question yes i think there are there are some study going on um with the you know the the children with the fetal alcohol syndrome they use all kinds of uh, exercise phenomenon they they help something but you know the problem is the exercise and others uh, giving it to the kids are often difficult, especially if you have a, you know, anxiety and depression, they don't listen to you, they don't do stuff. So it's very difficult to do that. Uh, but yes. I think that there's also, it's quite beneficial. And believe it or not, this endorphin is not only doing this, but also does a lot of thing with prevention of cancer and others, which we have done yeah. a lot of work with. Um, yes. So the exercise, uh, is very important uh, for health, better health. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you for the nice question. Congratulations for delivering a wonderful talk. Thank you. Over to other uh, chairpersons. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, Dr. Sakai. It was a really nice talk. Um, I just wondered a little bit about um, if you've examined um, the exosomes and microvesicles outside the blood-brain barrier, and whether there's communication with other organs um, with some of those um, you know, messenger RNA or... Um, inflammatory mediators. Yes, uh, I think exosomes, you, you know, there's, the field is making a big difference with the study of exosomes. Exosomes are small molecules. They can pass the blood brain barrier easily. So nowadays, uh, even we are doing some work with the saliva, uh, human saliva, and we are finding a lot of molecule, brain derived molecule in the saliva. So the only way we can explain 
it must be coming through the exosomes. Well, and, and also the question is sort of with um, COVID these days and you know, spike protein and all those things, um, have you actually looked into whether um, some of that's being transferred in the microvessels and uh, maybe associated with some of these neurologic abnormalities we see in long COVID? I, I, I really haven't done any work with long COVID or COVID. Um, so that's the field. I think there are uh, several uh, uh, paper I saw uh, people are working with the exosomes also because yeah. uh, obviously it would, would be a good target. Yeah, there's definitely some some literature out there um, that shows that it, the, either the protein or some of the proteolytic fragments actually may be um, pro-inflammatory to some of the toll life sure. inhibitors. Sure, sure. Well, thank you. Nice talk. Thank you, sir. Thank you, okay. sir and the persons for honoring the session. Um, we would like to give a token of appreciation and felicit our uh, speaker with a e certificate and a mo memento. Thank you, Dr. Sarkar, sir. Thank you. And we'd like to give a felicitation to our uh, chairpersons, Dr. William Stringer. Thank you, sir. Now we'd like to provide an e-certificate and virtual uh, memento for our uh, first chairperson, Dr. William Streeter. Thank you, sir. Now we'd like to give our uh, e-certificate and a virtual memento to our next chairperson, Dr. Uh, Professor K.K. Deepak, sir. Thank you. Okay, thank you, everyone. Another five minutes, we'll start our inauguration program. Dear panelists and uh, resource persons, please be online, sir. We'll uh, resume another uh, five minutes for the inaugural program. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Please stay long as we will commence shortly. Meanwhile, I request the delegates to sit back and enjoy the videos of BMRF and BMC. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, do you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you, sir. Okay, okay. I'll just check my voice, ma'am. Okay, 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 sir. Actually, all our insights will only be waiting for Mahalish, madam, to en enter, sir. Vice Chancellor, sir, Kotur, sir, Dean, sir, uh, Vishnubhat, sir, all are there, sir. Just to remind her? Uh, yeah, I just called, sir. She told uh, she'll be entering. When she enters, yeah. we'll start, sir. Yeah, yeah, we can start. Ask Dean, sir, and VC, sir. Yeah, I'll ask, sir. I'll ask. I'll, I'll ask. Am I audible, man? 
dear delegates, we are about to start the inauguration program. We are just adding all the panelists for the inauguration. Sir, uh, Sudhir, sir, shall we start, sir? Yes, yes. What the, the participants are only 38? No, no, sir. That is only in our link, sir. There are more than uh, that. We have two links, sir. We cannot okay. see the number of participants from this link, sir. This is only for okay. VIPs, sir. Okay. okay. There are a lot of people, sir, around 300, sir. Thank okay. You. Shall I start, sir? Okay. Yes. Professor Sekel has not joined? I have joined. Okay, okay. Good morning. Thank you, sir. A very good morning to everyone. On behalf of the management, faculty, and students of Arupadi Vidya Medical College and Hospital, Vinayaka Missions Research Foundation, deemed to be University for the Chiri, with immense pleasure, I welcome you all to BMSECon 2023, the fourth international e-conference on Beyond Boundaries, Exploring Excellence in Basic Medical Sciences, organized by the phase one MBBS departments of anatomy, physiology, and biochemistry, along with the Center for Biomedical Research, ABMC. I, Dr. Aarti, will be emceeing this inaugural program. The purpose of this conference is to bring together clinicians, educationists, diagnostic consultants, and biomedical researchers on a single platform to share their knowledge towards the advancement of basic medical sciences. To commence our proceedings, let us seek the divine blessings of Goddess Saraswati through a solemn invocation song. Saraswati Namastubhyam Varadi Kamarupini Vidyarambham Karishya Siddhir Bhavatu Me Sada Siddhir Bhavatu Me Sada Siddhir Bhavatu Me Thank you. I request the organizing secretary, Dr. M. Manju, professor and head, Department of Biochemistry, to welcome the gathering. Thank you, Arti. Uh, it's a very, very good morning and a warm welcome to one and all. With the divine blessings of God Almighty, our founder chancellor, Dr. Shanmugh Sundaram, sir, and the benevolence of our beloved trustee, Mrs. Annapurna. Annapurni Shanmugasundaram, ma'am, our beloved Chancellor Dr. A.S. Ganeshan, sir, Madam Chancellor Dr. Anuradha Ganeshan, ma'am, and as the organizing secretary, I, on behalf of the organizing team, take pride in welcoming you all to the inaugural ceremony of BMSECon 23, organized by the departments of anatomy, physiology, biochemistry, and Center for Biomedical Research. We at Arubadi Vida Medical College and Hospital, we are honored and delighted to host this international conference for the fourth consecutive year. And the theme that we have selected for this conference is Beyond Boundaries, Exploring Excellence in Basic Medical Sciences. This conference has the distinction of bringing together such a large number of resource faculty and delegates across the globe for a vibrant and an intense exchange of views, knowledge, and experience on the emerging trends in research, diagnosis, and innovative TL methods. And we are very happy to 
announced that this year too, we had an overwhelming response with 850 registrations and 240 plus abstracts for uh, scientific presentations. On this momentous occasion, I wholeheartedly welcome our Honorable Chancellor, Dr. A.S. Ganeshan, sir, though in absentia, a visionary who has been constantly supporting us in all our endeavors. His wishes and blessings are always with us. Now it's my honor to welcome our Honorable Madam Chancellor, Dr. Anuradha Ganeshan, Vice President, BMRF, whose invaluable guidance is cherished by all of us. We warmly welcome you, ma'am, in absentia. The organizing committee is extremely delighted to welcome the chief guest for today's inaugural program, Dr. Deepak Sarkar. He is a director of the endocrine program in the Rutgers University, United States of America. We just heard his enlightening keynote address. We extend a warm welcome to you, sir. We are delighted to have the illustrious presence of our Honorable Vice Chancellor, Dr. P.K. Sudhir, who is a man of wisdom, vast experience and intellectual acumen, and has always been a support for us. We wholeheartedly welcome you, sir. The organizing team also takes pride in welcoming Mr. Suresh Samuel, the Member Board of Management, BMRF, who is a man of great insight and the one who has always encouraged us to come up with more innovative ideas and support us. And welcome, sir, in absentia. Now it's my pleasure to extend a very warm welcome to our beloved team, Dr. Rakesh Segal, sir. He is actually known as an embodiment of simplicity and efficient. Sir was there as a strong pillar of support in each and every step we took from the planning stage to the execution today. We bow before you and welcome you, sir. Now I would, warmly, I would like to warmly welcome our Tamil Nadu Medical Council Observer, Dr. T. Prasad, who is already logged into it. Welcome, sir. We cordially invite our most respected Provost, Dr. P.F. Kotur, who is a man with unbated energy and enthusiasm. He was a great pillar of support for BMS Econ team in the last three years with his encouraging words and unexplainable support. Welcome, sir. I welcome our super energetic and dynamic Dean Health Professionals Education, Dr. V.N. Mahalakshmi, ma'am, who was very supportive and was kind enough to offer help at any time we have approached her. And even without approaching her, she has offered help, especially regarding the technical support. We wholeheartedly welcome you, ma'am. We also welcome all the honored guests present here today, Dr. Vishnu Bhatt, Advisor, Research and Publication, Dr. Satish Kora Kurvila, Medical Superintendent, Dr. Jay Singh, Director, Health, um, um, Hospital Growth and um, uh, Outreach Services, Dr. Lakshmi Jatia, VP Academics, Dr. Rajan, VP um, Admin, and Dr. Lata, VP uh, Academics, Dr. Arunachalam Sir and Dr. Shankar, who are the DMS, and uh, our outspoken and eloquent resource persons and chairpersons who have joined us, deans of other medical colleges under VMRF, head of the institutions of other colleges in AVMC campus, university officials, members of the STB, HODs of different various departments, faculty members of AVMC, and friends from the present media on this auspicious occasion. We welcome our, uh, before that, a very special welcome to our two vice principals, VP admin Dr. Rajan and VP student affairs Dr. Lakshmi Jatia, ma'am, who are actually my predecessors as organizing secretaries for BMS Econ for the last three years. Your, both of your guidance and support was really appreciable. I really welcome you both to this conference. Uh, now, I would like to extend my warm welcome to our most enthusiastic delegates who are joining us from far and wide. Without your support and encouragement, this conference would not have been possible. We sincerely hope you will enjoy today and the next two days of deliberations and networking. I once again welcome you all to the uh, inaugural ceremony of BMSCon 2023 and a special welcome to our uh, chairpersons of the previous session, Dr. William Stringer sir and Deepak sir, who, are, who sir has given the keynote address last year also. A special welcome to you sir for joining our inaugural program and I wish all of you a great learning. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. As we pursue knowledge, the radiance of illumination serves as a beacon guiding our endeavors. I humbly request our esteemed dignitaries to partake in the virtual illumination of the lamp. This ceremony solemnizes the special occasion, embodies shared wisdom and collective spirit. Shatrubuddhi Vinashaya, Deepa Jyotir Namo Stute, Deepa 
Thank you. I now request Dr. T. Rajan, Vice Principal Admin AVMC, to enlighten the gathering on the history and growth of BMSC Con. Uh, thank you, Dr. Arthi. Do you able to hear me? Yes, sir. Okay. A respect to dignitaries in main hall and delegates at auditorium. Very pleasant morning to all. I, Dr. Rajan, Professor of Anatomy, Vice Principal Admin. Arbalavid Medical College, Puducherry, affiliated to Vinayaga Missions Research Foundation, Salem. Thanks to the organizing team for giving me the wonderful chance to talk about this history and the growth of BMS Khan in this wonderful academic event. BMS Khan, Basic Medical Science Conference, is a modified PANCON, that is Pondicherry Conference. Let me share the slide for a better view on this. Um, can you give me access to share? Yes, sir, please share. Okay, thank you, sir. Uh, do you see the slide, uh, Dr. Arthi? No, sir, it's only the one. Yes, sir. Okay, right. In the year 2003, within a two years of establishment of our institute, Dr. K. R. Srinivasan, who was the head of the Department of Anatomy, organized state-level conference jointly with Association of Anatomists. That was the first conference organized at AVMC. Dr. K. R. Srinivasan organized Again, a state level conference jointly with Association of Anatomists in 2007. Both were a grand success with the support of our management. Our management provided free accommodation for all delegates at the time because the conference was physically organized. That was the talk at the time when I was assistant professor in the AVMC. There was a long gap after the conference. In 2018, myself and a new energy team decided to organize international conference and organized the anatomy conference. It was a grand success. It was possible uh, because me, of our sir. management. You are still not visible, sir. Ah, you are not able to see the slide? Okay. Yes, sir. Again, share it. Do you see the slide? Uh, sir, into full screen. The first slide is there, sir. 
Okay, thank you. It's the first slide, yes. Right. Yes, sir. Yes. Yes. Okay. So this is the conference which we organized physically. Uh, it's the first international conference. Till this, uh, the conference named as uh, PONCON, that's Pondicherry Conference. By seeing this uh, success of all these conferences, we have decided to extend this conference with other department, anatomy, physiology, and biochemistry, as well as Center of Biomedical Research. So we have planned for a, a physical international conference named as a BMS Con due to COVID. We could not do it as a physical conference. So we have organized it as a e-conference. So it was named as a BMS econ. That's the first e-conference organized by the uh, all the three basic medical science department, which was organized by myself. Then in 2021, we planned again. Due to second wave, again it was organized as a e-conference. It was organized by myself and the team. Later, by seeing the request from the uh, delegates to continue this conference as an e-conference, so we have decided to continue to organize this conference as an e-conference. Dr. Lakshmi Chatya, who is the professor and the head of the department that time, and now VP Students Affair, organized this me, third sir. conference. Again, your slide went off, sir. Uh, okay. Uh, it went to the first slide, sir. Uh huh. So I think there is a. I, I'll, I'll come for that. Ah, uh, yes, sir. Ah, uh, yes, sir. Yeah. Okay. So in 2022, Dr. Lakshmi Sathya organized the conference. It's a conference. Now, we are the fourth e conference which is organized by the same team, but the organizing secretaries keep on changing. Now the organizing secretary is Dr. Manju, Professor and Edara Department. This is about the PONCON, how it has become BMS con and other, how it's become a BMS econ. Now here you can see the some of the glimpses of our conferences, our chancellor address, our provost address, these are the organizers, our sovereign release and the, our volunteers, students' volunteers, students' culturals, our resource persons, panelists, award to the resource persons and chairpersons, group photo virtual, chit chat by our faculties, post event. Celebrations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for taking us through the years of PMSA Con. I now request Dr. Lakshmi Chatya, the Vice Principal, Student Affairs and Professor of Physiology, to address this gathering on the theme of the conference. Thank you, Dr. Arti. The topic, the theme which was aptly chosen as crossing boundaries, excellence in basic medical sciences. Excellence in basic medical sciences refers to achieving high standards and significant advancements in the fundamental scientific disciplines like anatomy, physiology, biochemistry, microbiology, and pharmacology that form the basis of medical knowledge. Scientists and researchers across the globe are striving for excellence in conducting rigorous studies, making groundbreaking discoveries and contributing to the foundational understanding of the biological processes essential to medicine. Indicators for this quest of excellence include publications in high index journals, innovative discoveries that showcase a commitment to advancing knowledge and also mentoring the next generation of scientists and medical professionals and collaborations 
engaging in meaningful collaborations with other experts experts and institutions can can enhance the overall impact and quality of research success in securing research grants and fundings and that also indicates trust and support from the scientific community and the funding agencies receiving awards accolades from peers and professional bodies is another testament to one's contribution and impact in research translating this basic medical sciences discoveries into practical application for medical diagnosis treatment and prevention demonstrates the relevance and excellence of this research and this also comes through continuing education continuous continuous learning that we do through our continuing medical education programs and conferences of this kind so i summarize overall excellence in basic medical science transcends geographical boundaries and contribute to global healthcare advancements thank you thank you ma'am we are now request our honorable vice chancellor of vmr dr p k sudhir the epitome of excellent leadership to declare this conference open and address the esteemed gathering can you hear me yes, yes sir can. yes sir i declare this this conference basic Medi basic medical science conference 2023 open respected dr deepak sarkar the distinguished chief guest of this today's function professor rakesh segal the dean professor p f kotur our provost dr mahalakshmi dean hp dr rajan dr lakshmi jetia the organizing committee chairperson dr ilankathir the secretary dr manju distinguished resource persons from india and abroad the delegates from all over the world chairpersons of the sessions ladies and gentlemen a very good morning to you all i am extremely happy to note that this fourth international e conference on basic medical science 2023 organized by the department of anatomy physiology biochemistry and medical biotechnology attracted 800 plus delegates and around 240 scientific presentations at the onset i congratulate the organizing committee the entire organizing committee and the dean for this uh, terrific effort medical education since last one decade in india is undergoing a series of transformations in 2019 national medical commission has come out with a competency based medical education and the first batch is undergoing the final year training now the best attraction of the new regulation is a early clinical exposure the gelling the departments of the basic medical sciences and the para clinical departments and the clinical departments the department of anatomy physiology and biochemistry has a greater role in shaping our physicians and surgeons in medical education i am sure this type of conferences both physical mode and online mode have a serious impact among the faculty members and students Vinaya Mission Research Foundation, Deemed University, always encourage 
our constituent colleges and schools to organize conferences and workshops and focusing on creation of knowledge, dissemination of knowledge, and application of knowledge. I am sure these three days delegations, deliberations on various topics, on especially on the theme beyond boundaries, exploring excellence in medical basic medical sciences, will have a serious uh, takeaways and a very extensive and elaborative deliberations on various topics. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. It is with great enthusiasm that we have prepared the souvenir, a conglomeration of scientific knowledge shared in this conference, blessings and messages from our patrons, administrators and university officials. It's my privilege to invite our beloved Dean, ABMC, Dr. Rakesh Segal, who is our pillar of strength and support to release the souvenir. Good morning, everybody. As uh, our Honorable Vice Chancellor has said, that this is, uh, we have got a gathering of a number of scientists and a number of 800 plus is a huge gathering, I could say, even for an econ. And I congratulate the organizers for uh, having such a scientific uh, or, uh, gathering uh, today in uh, this conference. And uh, this is all with the blessings of our uh, chance, uh, Chancellor and Madam Chancellor and uh, Mr. Samuel, who have been really encouraging. And I found that it is really encouraging to see them and our Honorable Vice Chancellor that they are encouraging even uh, conferences, research, and other activities in the college. So this is a really wonderful thing which I have seen in this uh, VMRF. And I would uh, congratulate the VMRF that uh, for this because I have I have come from PJ Chandigarh and I have seen that the activities are almost as far as what we will see in our uh, institute also, and uh, they are also giving a lot of research funding at their level, which is also very encouraging. So today's conference, I think, uh, as you all know, that it is basic medical scientists who are organizing this conference, and. Uh, they uh, this includes well uh, three departments mainly but it is all a teamwork of avmc and all people have really pitched in i am really grateful to all the help that has been given to organize this conference for uh, from all areas of uh, avmc and all staff of avmc i am really grateful to them also <clears throat> now they as you know that uh, they have announced that there are around 240 abstracts which are to be published and uh, the abstract book is to be released and i think uh, i uh, i i had uh, released this ab abstract book on behalf of the organizers and on behalf of avmc and on the behalf of vmrr thank you very much
you, sir, for the honors. May I now kindly request our beloved provost, Professor P. F. Kotu, an unwavering pillar of strength and steadfast support, to share a few words with us and impart insights and inspiration to mark this special occasion. Sir, sir, please so unmute yourself. Please unmute. Yeah, sorry, sorry. A uh, very good morning to all the distinguished personalities who are here on the virtual dais, the chief guest, Dr. Deepak Sarkar, our honorable vice chancellor of our prestigious university, Professor Sudhir, the respected dean of ABMC, and uh, my colleagues, the vice principals, heads of departments, and the resource persons and the participants. I'm the first hand witness of the evolution of this BMSA con uh, for the past, almost this is the fourth year. I distinctly remember in the post-COVID era when we all were feeling claustrophobic, the trio of uh, three departments along with the, uh, our research uh, center uh, conceived this idea. Professor Rajan, Professor Lakshmi Jatia, and I distinctly remember Dr. Umis, uh, Dr. Mishra, Sashmita Mishra, who is of course not with us and uh, now her place is taken by Manju. We conceived the idea, and initially I remember very well we were, we were waiting, uh, finger crossed, whether how will be the response. And uh, when the, the registration crossed four figures, I remember, in the overwhelm. And it was such a grand success, you know, it was a and first experience as well, which laid down the foundation and for the conduct of consecutive fourth conference. Now I'll say BMS Econ has become the institutional character of. Uh, uh, aviancy. And certainly we all know that uh, research and academics are not, uh, cannot be separated. They are the two sides of the same coin. One will complement each other. Keeping this in mind, in, an, uh, in the impetus that is being given by our university under the leadership of our honorable vice chancellor, our chancellor, and you know, the research along with academics is, uh, 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 is encouraged in all possible ways and at all possible levels. Apart from creating the infrastructure for research, etc., the capacity building in research, how to use the research, you know, not doing is normally not enough. All those things will be possible if we conduct such a platforms wherein the knowledge, expertise, skill of the of persons who have uh, developed expertise in the field will share. And that will be a very much guiding force for all the participants, especially the the younger generation. And uh, I take this opportunity of uh, welcoming all the uh, respected resource persons who have spared their time. You know, I, I very well understand the difficulty of participation by the overseas uh, resource persons. It might be sometimes an odd uh, time but as well. So ultimately, it is uh, for the growth and development of uh, this one. And our, um, then I say, I used to say that the basic medical science department and our research are the pillars of our AVMC, which lay down a strong foundation for the product which we are trying to bring out at the conclusion of the course, the medical doctor. So with these viewers, I'm very, very happy to be a part of this uh, wonderful, excellent function. And I'm sure the memories of this PMS account will be cherished forever in you know, the years to come as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. May I now request our dynamic and inspired Dean H.P. and Dean Faculty of Interdisciplinary Studies, Dr. V. N. Mahalakshmi, to share her thoughts with us. Her leadership and vision have been instrumental in shaping our academic landscape. Thank you, Arti. Good morning, uh, respected uh, speakers and the dignitaries who are sharing this platform with us. It's indeed a very proud and nice moment to be with you all for the fourth consecutive edition of the BMSC Con. And uh, this particular uh, platform has uh, attracted PhD scholars, UG students, and postgraduate students to come and share their research opportunities, not only the esteemed research persons. So I think that is the USP of this particular program that we are able to attract people from the speciality who would come and uh, be part of this event and share their own research work. 
the number of papers which we receive every year for the scientific session that they bears a witness to this particular fact that is the outcome we have received and this year i was told they have more than 400 scientific paper presentations which is a like mind blowing number that's all i could say and uh, the departments have put in a lot of effort to ensure that this uh, program goes in a smooth fashion they have contacted research persons of repute they have got eminent chair persons to be in the session and they have taken care of the technical and participant side also so with all these efforts i think uh, this uh, program no like lord lord krishna keeps telling that if your process is all right, outcome will come automatically. The process has been all right because it is going on for some time. So the outcome also should be very good. I wish them all success. And uh, thank you for uh, making us being a part of this uh, event. All the best. Thank you. Thank you very much, ma'am. We are very honored to have with us today our chief guest, Professor Deepak K. Sarkar. Right before the inauguration, Professor Deepak K. Sarkar graced us with his insights in the much-anticipated keynote talk and set the tone for this enlightening event. Dr. Deepak K. Sarkar is Distinguished Professor, Director, Endocrine Program, Department of Animal Sciences, Rutgers University, USA. He is Director, Alcohol and Drug Abuse Program, Washington State University. He has more than 300 publications. His exceptional contributions have earned him numerous awards and accolades, both from the Indian government and American universities. So we are very happy to have you with us, and we request you to address the gathering. Sir, 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 unmute your mic, please. Okay, okay, okay. I'm okay, right? Can you hear me now? Yes, 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 yes sir. Thank you so much, uh, so very much for inviting me here. I think. This is the first time I attended this, and I've been very delighted to see the uh, group of devoted educationists and scientists are putting a a, uh, a, uh, a a gathering which could really bring the young mind and open up the young mind to build a new era in the scientific field in India. So I, I, I really like the whatever you're doing. And I think it uh, uh, the reward is already coming because you already have 800, more than 800 participants, uh, close to 300 abstract. I mean, that's a good number, very good number for being a e-Congress. So this shows that the organization team is ex out putting an outstanding kind of uh, a contribution here, outstanding kind of group building. So I, I really appreciate for giving me a chance to come and talk and learn these things and in future probably we'll interact and um, and I wish you best of luck. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you for grazing this occasion with your presence. I now request Dr. S. Ilankhatar Professor and Head, Department of Anatomy, to propose the vote of thanks. Good morning, one and all. Myself, Dr. Elan Kadir, organizing chairperson, feel humble and privileged for being given this opportunity to present the vote of thanks. Thank you, Team BMSC Con 23. I thank the Almighty for the blessings showered upon us for the ever success of our conference. My sincere and heart Felt gratitude to our founder, Chancellor, late Dr. A. Shanmugasundaram, sir, and Annapurni Shanmugasundaram, madam, who has given us this platform for conducting this mega conference. On behalf of our university, institute, and the organizing team, I would like to thank the Honorable Chief Guest for today, Dr. Deepak Sarkar, sir, Distinguished Professor, Director of Endocrine Program, Department of Animal Science, Rutgers University, USA, for his guest lecture. Sir, you have been readily accepted our invitation and granted us your valuable time amidst your busy schedule to enlighten us, us in identification of a new mode of cell-to-cell -cell communication within the nervous system, focusing on neuroinflammation. It was a wonderful session, sir. Thank you. I also would like to thank Dr. William Stringer and Dr. K. K. Deepak, sir, for chairing our guest lecture for today. You have given your valuable time for us. 
Thank you, sir. I would like to thank our beloved Honorable Chancellor, Dr. A.S. Ganesan, sir, in absentia, and Dr. Anuradha Ganeshan, Madam Vice President, VMR in absentia. Together, they have been behind the success of all the academic programs conducted in our institute. Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Though you are far, your best wishes are always with us for the success of this conference. My sincere thank to, to our beloved Vice Chancellor, Dr. P.K. Sudhir, sir, who have always showed interest and supported us in conducting our conference. Thank you, sir, for declaring our conference open. I also like to thank the other VMRF administrators for supporting us in organizing this event. On behalf of our organizing team, I would like to extend my sincere thank to uh, Dr. J. Suresh Samuel, sir, member, board of management in absentia, the drive force behind all the academic events in our institute for his constant encouragement and support in organizing this conference. We thank you, sir. My sincere thanks to our beloved Dean, Dr. Rake Sehel, sir, for his constant support in organizing this conference and for his presidential address and releasing our E7 year. Your support has given us a framework upon which we have planned and executed this program. Thank you, sir. Sincere thanks to our provost, Dr. P. F. Kotur, sir, and our Dean HPE, Dr. V. N. Mahalakshmi, madam, for their felicitational address and for their constant support starting from the preliminary stage until this day. Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. I my sincere thanks to Dr. T. Rajan, sir, Vice Principal Admin, AVMC, for making us to recollect the path we walked through to reach where we are today through history and growth of our conference. Thank you, sir. On behalf of the team, I extend my thanks to Dr. Lakshmi Jatia, Vice Principal, Student Affairs, on enlightening and briefing us on the theme of our conference. Thank you, ma'am. My sincere thanks to all our advisory members, advisor research and publication, Dr. Vishnubhat, sir, Dr. Jai Singh, sir, Dr. Satish Kora Kurivilla, our medical superintendent, and Vice Principal Academic, Dr. Lata, our Deputy Medical Superintendent, Dr. Arunachalam, and Shankar, sir, and other administrators for their constant support. I also would like to thank the heads and staff of our other colleges under VMRF for their valuable support. My sincere thank and heartfelt gratitude to our esteemed speakers, chairpersons, and judges who have consented to support us in this venture. Thank you all. My sincere thank to our TNMC observer, Dr. T. Prasad, sir, for being with us today. I thank all our enthusiastic delegates who have readily spared their valuable time to show interest, register, and to participate live today and make our conference a benchmark in history. Thank you all. Thank you, one and all. Thank you, sir. That brings us to the end of the inaugural session. That brings us to the end of the inaugural session, and we uh, thank the dignitaries and everyone who's joined us. So, shall we conclude with our national anthem? I request everyone to raise for the national anthem. Janagana mana adhinayaka jayahe Bharat bhaagya vikhaata Punjab Sindh Gujarat Maratha Dravida Kukhada Vanga Vindya Himachal Yamuna Kanga Uchara Jagadhi Karanga Tava Shubha Nami Thaage Tava Shubha Aashish Maage Tahir Tava Jaya Gatha Jana Gana Mangala Dayak Jaya He Bharat Bhakya Vidhata Jaya He Jaya He Jaya He Jaya 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 He We thank everyone once again and we request everyone to stay logged in for the scientific sessions which will begin right away. Thank you.
स्ट्रीम क्या है माई ऑडिबल यस मैम ओके प्लीज चेक विद सुचेता मैम इज इन साइड इज अ पैनलिस्ट सुचेता डॉक्टर सुचेता इज देयर हैज शी बीन मेड अ पैनलिस्ट ओके मैम मैम कैन यू कैन यू स्विच ऑन द वीडियो मैम स्विच ऑन द यस स्विच ऑन द वीडियो Yes, madam. Good morning. Good morning, ma'am. Good morning. Okay. Shall we? We'll start, ma'am. Now. Yeah. Shall we start uh, sharing the slides? Wait, ma'am. Wait, ma'am. We'll just introduce okay. you. Then we'll. Okay. We'll... Okay. 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 So. Yeah. So we are uh, starting our uh, next session, scientific session. It is uh, by Dr. Sucheta, ma'am. She'll be introduced by our chairperson. First, let me take the honors of introducing our uh, chairperson for this session, Dr. R. Shashi Kala. She is a gynecologist by profession. She was she is a professor of obstetrics and gynecology in Arbury Vidya Medical College and Hospital, Pondicherry. Uh, she is she is retired as a professor and HOD of uh, OG in Government Thane Medical College, and uh, she has worked as professor and HOD in Sri Manakula Vinayagar Medical College Hospital. And at present, she is a uh, uh, in our hospital. She is a past senate member of the Tamil Nadu Dr. N. G. R. University. She has published papers in national and international journals, many. She is a very well-known teacher and a UG and PG examiner in Tamil Nadu, Kerala, Andhra Pradesh, as well as in Karnataka. She is a past member of the PG Board of Studies of the Pondicherry University too. With this small introduction, I hand over the stage to Dr. Shashikala, ma'am. Ma'am, over to you. Thank you, Manju. I'm I'm privileged, honored. and feel proud to introduce the speaker of today's session who is an eminent professor a renowned academician and a research scholar professor suchitra kumari professor department of biochemistry hegde medical academy mangalore karnataka she is also the principal scientific officer central research lab she has 3 decades of teaching experience and highly acclaimed researcher for the past two decades in the subjects of biochemistry molecular genetics cytogenetics immunology she has published in many national and international index journals and she has high index more than 42 plus h index she is a dynamic leader with extensive research expertise and experience as principal investigator and co-investigator in managing several international and national funded projects she has 10 icmr sts projects she has authored a book chapter of multidisciplinary research methods she has patented pomegranate herbal mouthwash for managing radiation induced oral mucositis in patients with head and neck cancer her areas of of interest include biochemistry molecular genetics cytogenetic biodosimetry immunology radiation biology nutrigenetics she has been an invited speaker to three international universities like ajman university united arab emirates indonesia bali and university of miyazaki japan and many national universities like srm chennai and reva university bangalore She is a visiting scientist in Wake Forest University, John Hopkins University, and Penn State University USA, and University of Miyazaki Japan. She has received many prestigious awards like Women Researcher Award, Most Cited Paper Award, Fellow Lifetime Achievement Award, Best Oral and Paper Presentation, Best Researcher Award. an all india women achievers award of 2022 when i go through her cv i see she has set her bars higher and higher today she is going to sensitize us regarding the impact of genetic diet and environmental factors on polycystic ovary syndrome this polycystic ovary syndrome it is a which starts from the intrauterine life 
a fetal origin of an adult disease. It is caused by many factors and it is controlled by various genes. Because of the altered lifestyle, the dietary habits and the adolescent obesity and the gut microbiopes, this bio, uh, biosis occurs there. And because of that, there is an increasing incidence globally of the incidence of PGYS. This is the only condition which involves many branches of medicine. The lady will come to us with AUB, abnormal uterine bleeding, infertility and failure of reproduction. And for the metabolic syndrome associated with it, such as a diabetes, hypertension, dyslipidemia, and coronary heart disease, and the fatty liver disease, she seeks the opinion of the physician and endocrinologist to reduce her weight. She goes to the dietitian, and because of the frustrating acne, hirsutism, and loss of hair, she seeks the dermatologist's opinion. Because of depression, anxiety, because of these factors, she seeks the psychologist's opinion. So. Left untreated, she may land in endometrial hyperplasia and adenocostum of the endometrium. Finally, the oncologist also become to play. So, it is a disease which starts, the syndrome starts right from the fetal life, spans through the adolescent period, the reproductive age group, and even beyond the age of menopause. And as a gynecologist, I feel excited to listen to this lecture. Now, the screen is yours, madam. Jitha, ma'am, you can share, ma'am. Ma'am? So, Jitha, ma'am? So, Jitha, ma'am? Am I audible? Hello. Ah, yes, ma'am. You can share yeah, the yes, screen, yes, ma'am. Uh, yeah, you are audible. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. We are sharing. First. Good morning to all of you. I am very grateful to all of you to give me the opportunity to present some of my work on PCOD. First of all, I thank the chairman. It is my pleasure to sit in front of the renowned gynecologist who knows everything about PCOD. We are researchers. We have taken this uh, opportunity to screen out just what are the other factors affect on the PCOD. So I especially Manju Madam who really uh, given me opportunity to talk about uh, uh, this particular topic. Uh, this is one of the very, very important topic nowadays. So my uh, more than five students are working on, on PCOD. Some are completed their work. So I thought I can uh, talk about what is the impact of diet, environment, and the genetic factor effect on the uh, PCOD. So coming to introduction, uh, I think uh, not much introduction is required because Madam already mentioned there are so many factors affecting on uh, PCOD. It is a complex, common metabolic and heterogeneous condition affected women of childbearing age. So it is start from 18 to 40 years. There are a lot of people are suffering from PCOD due to so many reasons. One of the common reason is a diet. Second reason is environment. We are not giving much importance for diet and environment, which we learn with the PCOD problem. Once we get uh, affected by the PCOD, then different types of, types of metabolism is changed. 
So we come to the PCOS develops when the hormone that is LH from pituitary gland or the levels of insulin from pancreas are high, which in turn causes the various to make extra amount of testosterone. Testosterone is a male hormone. So male hormone increases here and female hormone decreases and they also develop insulin resistant. But the major cause here uh, for Hello, ma'am. Hello, ma'am. She's differ. So I'm here. Uh, all of you hearing me properly? Yeah, ma'am. Yes, ma Please, 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 please share your slide again, ma'am. your slide, sir. Ah, yes. Yeah, yeah, we are sharing some yeah. problem with the internet. Okay. Yeah. Please, please, mm -hmm. please, 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 Okay, 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 okay. So, PCOS affect one in ten women. Incidence of, because, for example, those who are near the seashore cities, the exposure of various... Uh, uh, pollution is less compared to when we go away from the Mangalore. For example, Bangalore city. It is away from the seashore. One of my students is working from Bangalore. He gets PCOD sample like anything. But Mangalore, we find difficult to get that level of PCOD patients. So that when I thought we can, why can, why can't we think about various toxins exposure to the women. So we got a very good result uh, with, associated with this work. So as factors affecting, you know, the genetics, epigenetics, when we exposed, when our lifestyle changes, when food pattern changes, when exposed to environment changes, there is a epigenetic changes. When there is epigenetic changes, it may alter the genetic expression for various production of the hormones, all the requirement of various proteins or enzymes, all that. Then, in addition to that, when the carbohydrate accumulation increases, immediately they increase a lot of inflammatory markers. So the inflammatory markers is one of the factor which is uh, related to all types of metabolic syndromes. So when we see in PCOD uh, pay, uh, uh, subjects, they express insulin resistant one side, hyper androgonism another side, and another side genetic defect because of epigenetic changes. So all these factors we observed in, in our studies. So these are the various polycystic syndrome, etiology, clinical features, diagnosis. And risk factor associated PCOD, already hormonal, everybody studied very well. Genetic, uh, also there are a lot of work is going on. No, and non-genetic is environmental toxins, obesity, and diet. And then PCOS, if you see the environmental exposures in the life, that is uh, hyper, hyper androgonism, you see ovarian dysfunction, you know, genetic changes, transgenerational effect. That is also, we can know obesity, environmental factors, especially how it affect on the endocrine disrupting chemicals. Miscellaneous like diet, you can say all these types of pharmaceutical agents, vitamin D, psychological, all that changes. Epigenetic, we can observe with the microRNA assessment, DNA methylation, abnormal gonadotrophic hormone, all these changes we can observe in a PCOD patients. So environmental, bisphenol, this is one of the very important compound is exposed in the air due to the uh, uh, vehicle smoke and other smokes. See, that will affect 
all the bisphenol uh, is catabolism uh, decreases, it increases in the circulation. And this is the one factor which block the hormonal uh, production. That's why it increases the testosterone level. Estrogen decreases. So this uh, we, if you observe any friend, non-alcoholic uh, liver disease, this is another very important factor. When the carbohydrate intake or the sweet intake or junk food intake increases, it, it will accumulate in the liver. The carbohydrate convert into fat and accumulate non-essential fat. So the sex hormone binding globulin, SHBG level decreases. This is another one of my students did the SHB level in the PCOD samples. So there also we observed all the factors, how it impact on the metabolism of various uh, diet patterns. So this is the dietary intake and environment pollutants, sedentary lifestyle, stress on the uh, the, here, what we have to observe, uh, everybody knows, doctors know, scientists, that is the insulin resistant. It's a common problem in now in a, uh, ho uh, everywhere in the uh, whole world. Insulin resistant, uh, usually we never bother to know the resistant problem. The major problem is we are blocking entering the glucose inside the cell for metabolism. So the glucose is not entered in the insulin is there, but is not uh, used for the entry of glucose. Maybe the cell membrane is filled with the, that is the bilayers of lipids, maybe the non-essential fatty acids, not the essential PUFA. So the fluidity of the membrane decreases. So sugar level increases in the circulation. Automatically insulin production increases in the circulation. So this insulin level is high, Sugar is high, they will convert into fat and in, uh, accumulate in the liver and the fluidity of the cell membrane decreases. So that is the one of the very major uh, problem uh, develops in the PCOD or diabetic, which we call insulin resistance. So modification of diet is very important. We have to supplement with short chain fatty acids, omega-3 and decrease the uh, sugar, especially free sugar, decrease completely carbohydrate content. You have to reduce, increase the diet and we have to maintain the normal requirement for the various metabolism. So these are the various problems with the hormonal imbalance, uh, which already we know if the hypothalamic pituitary ovarian axis, the important pathophysiology underlying the PCOS because of all these reasons. And it is estimated that between 50 to 90 percent women PCOS manifest insulin resistant. This is the insulin resistant uh, uh, is one of the major problem in the PCOT. And these are about the hormonal connection synthesis. Then we also have the cytochrome P450 uh, level. Cytochrome 450 is a generic term for a group of oxidative enzymes all of all of which have about 500 amino acid and contain a single heme group. Human genomic includes genes for 57 cytochrome P450. These genes are now formally termed as SIP genes and the encoded proteins may be given the same name without the use of italics. So CYP11A1 gene encodes P450, where the suffix, this is uh, one of the gene which is essential for the, uh, uh, the control of the PCOS. So there are two genes we have analyzed here, G, uh, gen uh, genetic uh, variations. One is a CYP11A1 gene, cytochrome P450, side chain cleavage of the enzyme of uh, the cholesterol synthesis and CYP19 gene, it is aromatase enzyme. So these two genes we analyzed in the PCOD samples. Yes. So these two genes we have identified where which chromosome it is located and all that in detail. Um, uh, 
So we are study conducted with the, all these different. One is just, uh, simple 11 A1 gene variation and compared with the sex hormone and insulin resistant. Association sex hormones binding globally and abdominal obesity in patients with polycystic syndrome we studied. Non-pharmacological strategy in development awareness and intervention of polycystic ovarian syndrome we studied. Association of vitamin D gene receptor gene polymorphism in polycystic ovarian we studied. And now our ongoing project is gut microbiota derived short chain fatty acid as a regulator of hypothalamic pituitary ovarian axis in polycystic ovarian syndrome. This is the one of the very good result we are getting. Etiopathological role of toxic chemicals. This is another very important work is going on. Uh, and heavy metals on aromatase and its expression in polycystic ovarian syndrome. Effect of ghee on letrozole induced polycystic ovarian syndrome model in western rats we studied association between gut microbiota dysbiosis and polycystic ovarian syndrome effect of polyamines this is another very we never given importance that uh, the polyamines production is very important polyamines on the expression anti-mullerian hormone expressed by granulosa cells screening for putrosine in women with polycystic ovarian. These are the work is going on now. And uh, where I just give you a gist, uh, in microbiota short chain fatty acid like butyric acid is one of the short chain fatty acid which crosses the blood brain barrier. And this is the one which regulates uh, the hormone production and also enhances the uh, lifestyle changes in the PCOD patients. And second one, we have toxic chemicals. You may be surprised to listen which toxic uh, agents are effect on PCOD. One is the moisturizer. Most of uh, Bangalore, you, it is a slightly cold weather. They use a lot of moisturizer. So PCOD patients are very high in Bangalore. One is the moisturizer content chemicals. Second one, exposed to the bisphenol. Third one is the aluminium. What we found is when we analyze for the toxic metal ions, lead, arsenic, cadmium, chromium, aluminium is the one of the mineral which is very high in PCOD samples. So uh, which we are ignore so many things, but uh, we are not concentrated on that part. Then we have given the ghee. Uh, this is, uh, I think, nowadays it's a known uh, factor for all gynecologists and uh, also in Ayurveda. They will give a supplement ghee, which will uh, reduce the PC PCOD. And microbiota, microbiota, the intestinal microbiota, this is another uh, very important factor. Actually, if you take a lot of dietary fiber in your diet, it is, it is the base for the growth of the uh, probiotic in the intestine. So we have to increase our dietary fiber. So the micro the probiotic bacteria increases in the intestine and they are the one which gives all the micronutrients, mainly the short chain fatty acids, vitamin B12, folic acid, vitamin K, E, so many very, very important uh, um, micronutrients are produced from the probiotic. So that is one which controls, which uh, by taking all the junk food, all the fried items, all the uh, lot of carbohydrates, the whole probiotic is completely vanished and toxin bacteria are producers, thousand and one toxins, which leads to the various type metabolic syndromes. Then uh, uh, one of our group, uh, we were planned to, uh, by mistake, we have estimated some of the polyamines like putrosine, spermidine. We observed in PCOD, it is completely decreases. When we accelerate, when we see the changes by modification of lifestyle, polyamine production increases. So this is also one of the outcome of our uh, project. So these are the, we have taken ethical consideration, sample calculation, study design, study studying, duration, all that we are practicing.
strict inclusion exclusion criteria we have taken so then we have done the experimental workflow for the collection of dna analysis the sex hormone we have a fluorescent elisa method we used to all the hormonal analysis and we estimated blood glucose lipid levels and molecular genotyping we did uh, with uh, separate DNA and we screened and Sanger sequencing, we found the SNPs. So many work our uh, uh, PhD students are doing on PCOD. So these are the basic baseline characteristic among study group also we observed, we observed their uh, BMI is very high compared to the control we have observed and our marital status, married uh, women showed uh, uh, most of the PCOD compared to the uh, normal. So then uh, when we clinical characteristic also we observed there are 32 percent uh, weight gain observed and 54 oligor amnuria patients are we observed subjects sorry and 46 primary secondary infertilities out of the uh, uh, 400 samples and uh, some combined effect also we observed. So in this current study, uh, the current study we observed that PCOS was more common among the reproductive age women, especially between 25 to 30 years. Most of the PCOS women in the present study were overweight according to the characterization of BMI. This highlights the prominence of obese females in Karnataka in South Asian females have early manifestation with more severe symptoms including diabetic, hypertension, cardiovascular disease and other related metabolic disorders when we compare with the articles. When we compare BMI also we observed the same. Since abdominal obesity considered to be the related to women having reproductive issues we have had a waist hip ratio also increased. So then when you see the sugar level with the compared to, it is not very high, but compared to the control, it is high. Total cholesterol is almost not very changed, but triglyceride level significantly uh, high. So uh, these are our observation on a lipid profiles and sugar profiles. Then uh, plasma insulin. If you see the plasma insulin level, we observed the HOMOIR is uh, in the PCOS is high. Significant increase of insulin and HOMOIR we observed. And when we compared with the other article also, we found the same report. Then when as usually we know the different hormonal changes with the gonadotrophin and sex hormone among women, we observed significantly uh, low levels in the uh, PCOS uh, patients. So uh, these are the articles we compared and then we also uh, analyzed the CYP11A1 uh, allele uh, frequency. We observed the, the changes in the genetic expression of the SNPs. So here the CC has uh, more uh, uh, observed that genetic they have uh, consistence of PCOD and the uh, TT, the recessive alleles are not much showing the uh, differences. So this is what we observed in the PCOD samples. Then uh, these are compared with the various parameters with the different genetic variations. So our study, predominant pattern, mutant carrier allele type, both in case and control, but in the northern Indian region, Punjab, the predominant polymorphism pattern observed for the RS4077582 of CYP11A1 in PCOS was the mutant carrier allele type and for control pattern observed was wild type. But uh, our... Uh, uh, a report when we see the association of another CIP, CIP 11A1, we compared with the lipid profile BMI. So these alleles are associated with the hip ratio significantly. You find in all the allele it increases, triglyceride level is significantly associated with the um, these particular allele. 
So like that, even it affects on the hormonal changes, FSH, LH, and LH-FSH ratio. So these are the, our observation. We compare with the various uh, dominant mod model, also recessive model. We compared the various uh, uh, parameters, lipid profiles, BMI, and hip ratio. So inadequate secretion of gonadotropin are an important characteristic feature of PCOS. One of the most common reason for PCOS, uh, that is the LH level. Individuals with the different genotypes may react differently to LH uh, uh, surges due to differences in LH level in different genotypes. Levels of LH in the current study were significantly different among the three genotypes of the PCOS with a higher LH level in the CT genotype when compared to the CC and TT genotype. So uh, here, uh, real clarification we need. Still, we have to work with the PCOS sample with the different varieties of parameters affecting how epigenetic changes takes place, how the genotype effect on the PCOS. A lot of study we can do further. So in uh, as the study conduct on Chinese population reported similar findings, but with the control population stating that they were more likely to develop PCOS due to the abnormal internal secretion of LH, particularly those women of CT heterogeneous genotype. So various uh, uh, changes you observe in different populations. Interesting, in our population, control women showed no significant difference in LH level among the three genotypes. But genotype is there in both, but we are not observed in the control. Maybe it is the no epigenetic changes uh, appeared in that particular sub, uh, control. In the present study, Significant difference were observed in the pattern of FHS. A woman with PCOS where a lower FH level was observed in the TTM. So overall, what I'm going to try to tell you is the genetic variation also very, very important. We are not further studied. We just observed in the allelic changes and the mutation observation compared with the hormonal change. But further, we can control by doing the epigenetic changes. This is one of my uh, student was doing heavy metal toxicity on PCOS in, at Bangalore. What he observed is in his study, he observed data exposure to toxic environments such as traffic, cosmetics, food, etc. obtained through the valid questionnaires and levels of heavy metals such as aluminium, cadmium, lead, arsenic, nickel were measured. Yeah, and he they are observed the aluminium level is very, very high in the PCOD samples. So interesting, it was observed that aluminium was significantly high. So which we are not bothered much. The, what are the reasons, whether due to water, whether due to the vessels, all that. In addition, this age group using a lot of moisture were significantly high in the PCOS. So the chemicals which present in the moisturizer is one of the reason to uh, develop the PCOS. So the, the third point, our diet, whether does diet affect polycystic ovarian syndrome? So high sugar, uh, the especially age, children age from 8 to 13 or 14, 15, they take a lot of ice cream, sweets, and uh, different types of uh, uh, chocolates and so many types of sugar. Actually, we uh, we are born I like a ape where we used to eat only nuts. We never used to eat the carbohydrate or cereals. When the ape become women, uh, men, the human beings, that time we from the trees we came to the ground and uh, easiest available is the cereals. We are uh, we are like uh, addicted to the cereals. So because it's just like a drug addict, any addict, we are so addicted to the cereal. So the cereal intake increased so that our life, our cell started with the cell membrane by layers of lipids. Our brain is full of lipids. Like lipids are the major requirement for the maintenance of the 
uh, body function or the cellular level, we are replaced with the carbohydrates where it convert into the uh, saturated fatty acid and the it uh, uh, decreases the mobility of the membrane or fluid mosaic fluidity of the membrane so we are prone to get all different types of metabolic syndrome so uh, this is my conclusion on pcod that changes in the main in the sip gene changes is one of the factors maybe epigenetics may be exposed to the various uh, toxins or uh, any other uh, exposures. So these are the uh, findings in our lab. I'm very happy that uh, we should know a lot about the PCOD because the later generation, this is the reproductive age, they only become the diabetic patients or any other metabolic syndrome patients because it will continue like this. So we have to improve by giving a lot of dietary fibers, omega-3, and then the micronutrients increase the probiotic uh, level in the intestine uh, and cut down the uh, sugar, dietary, uh, dietary sugar in our diet. These are the ways we can improve the PCOD and also uh, decrease the epigenetic changes. So this is my take home message. All of us has to really bother about our diet. So management of PCOS is diagnostic PCOS mainly improved communication with the person's subject should explain properly and uh, improve the compliances and improve the self care and quality of life. Regular monitoring is uh, required for the PCOD patients. So many references. We had many publications on PCOD. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, madam. It was an interesting, inspiring, and informative talk. The clarity of presentation and the depth of the knowledge must be appreciated. To be frank. Thank you, madam. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I got some input for giving the thesis for my postgraduates. I should accept yes, this, madam, from yes. your thesis. <laughs> and only one question Thank I want you. to ask, madam, regarding the yes, supplementation of yes. ghee for induction of labor on patients <laughs> on letrozole. What was yes. your inference, madam? Sorry. Uh, yes, uh, my uh, yes, madam, it is very, very interesting. Uh, very interesting okay. uh, part we observed. Uh, okay. uh, even uh, we have some... Uh, naturopathy doctors they are treating pcod okay. and here my colleagues i am here last 39 years some of the reproductive problem infertility problem they used to go to uh, the ayurvedic doctors they will tell one week one month three months six months they ask them to take only ghee and they but then afterwards they are uh, uh, carrying and uh, give birth to the baby so when I started working on that, short-chain fatty acids are very important. And I had one NIH project where in the NIH project, it is associated with Wake Forest University and John Hopkins University. So they are given me the project thinking that the vegetarian Brahmins only take ghee more in their diet. Okay. They are, their function is what is the uh, different fatty acid level in that particular subject in healthy subject healthy mm -hmm. subject with the all the best diet especially we are taken the food frequency chart and we analyze and they compare with their brain and eye function so what we observed is they take a lot of ghee when you see omega-3 omega-6 ratio it is one is four Omega-6 is inflammatory marker. Omega-3 is pro-inflammatory. But still, they don't develop any inflammation. And then what when we compare, they were telling the ghee contain a lot of short-chain fatty acids. Short-chain fat directly absorbed into the circulation. Not necessary for the transporters. So they are found and crossing blood brain barrier also easy. So these are the things uh, the vegetarian Brahmin category are very intelligent, very plain and all that oh. they compared and found it very good. 
So that made me to think, uh, why can't we study? So we got a very good result on this also, madam. Thank you, madam. Thank you for the clarification. Ma'am? Um, yes. Uh, Sucheta, ma'am, it's me, Yes. Yes, uh, madam. Yes. First of all, thank let me so thank much. you, ma'am. Yeah, no, yes. let me thank you, ma'am, for such an overwhelming and such an insightful uh, uh, talk, madam. Though we all know too much of, we all speak and we all know the details of PCOD as insulin resistance, hyperandrogenism, etc. But today, when you were sharing your real, uh, what is it, ma'am, the study or the project results with us, it really increases our knowledge, ma'am, the sharing your study results like giving importance to the, or, uh, that it varies from SNPs. Uh, your SNP studies showed us yes, that from person to person, if it's a yes, mutant allele, so person to person, genetic variation also influences your even proved by your studies, by doing yes. your uh, Sanger sequencing and SNP genotyping. Then you also, yes, uh, yeah, and the heavy metal aluminum level thing that you've told, it is really a new thing, madam, for us. Uh, we have just heard that heavy metals can influence, but, giving importance on your, your study results, showing the importance of uh, aluminum in causing PCOD is really uh, eye-opener for all of us, ma'am. And actually, like what Shashikala madam was telling, your study yes. actually gave us lots of insight about doing a lot of other studies with our PT students and our PhDs, yes. ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Uh, yes. A role of all these genetics, environmental factors, as well as the diet. Uh, you yes. have not only just uh, put it as a thing, you have proved with your study results in yes, this talk. And thanks a lot, ma'am, for accepting our uh, invitation, sharing it, sharing your uh, personal project details with all of us in this uh, 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 conference. Thanks a lot, madam. Thank you, madam. Thank you so much for giving me opportunity. Thank okay, you. Ma okay, ma'am. Yeah. Now I would, uh, uh, we would you. like to, though it is a virtual conference, we would like to mm. honor uh, our uh, resource person first. With, an, uh, with a certificate and a memento online on a virtual mode. Okay, madam. One Thank minute, ma'am. Okay. Thank you. Have you stopped sharing, madam? Sujeta, ma'am? Yes, that stop sharing. No, no, no. One minute. Uh, please stop sharing, ma'am. That's fine. Can you please? Yes, yes. Oh, one minute, not one minute. One. Oh, no, no, no. They have to give access. I think you have to give access. Huh. Uh, huh. Yes. Yes, yes. Thank you. <laughs> Next, I think I, I should really thank our uh, uh, chairperson, um, uh, Dr. Shashikala, madam, as soon as I told, she uh, accepted and she prepared and she was... <laughs> thank, thank you both you, of you, ma'am, for thank sharing you, your experiences here. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you, madam. Thank you, thank you, ma'am. Thank you, thank you.
good morning everyone i welcome you all to the bmr presentation and today's presentation is about the single cell rna sequencing so i feel uh, extremely happy to introduce uh, today's uh, chat person details la varli chatting today's chat panel is from dr samandam ravikum he has been working in the abmc for the past 7 years he has joined the abmc in 2017 as a principal scientist now he is the associate professor and assistant director of research and head of department of medical biotechnology abmc his research interests are the molecular diagnosis gene polymorphism molecular markers extremophiles and uh, synthetic biology and uh, i invite uh, dr ravi kumar to introduce our today's speaker over to dr ravi kumar thank you dr ganesh uh, i'm i'm uh, very happy to introduce uh, dr ari balan perisami phd i uh, is associate professor uh, center for creative and uh, convergence education uh, is a from the research institute of next generation material design from anyong university seoul uh, from south korea his prior experiences as a research associate professor of cancer biology and uh, molecular biology at anyong university and research associate professor position at yenge uh, university at seoul national university focusing on the cancer bi biology and microbiology and natural product chemistry and he's also worked as a postdoctoral fellow in uh, seoul national university uh, dr aribalan perisami has also received uh, several grants and awards uh, in in, uh, in much noteworthy is that uh, he has received a special research grants from the national research foundation korea for a project related to alzheimer disease and nanotoxicity models uh dr aribalan has also published nearly 67 pre reviewed articles with uh, uh, 30 as a first or corresponding author uh, with a google citation score of around 1711 with an h index 25 uh he has uh, numerous articles in a reputed journal uh, covering the topics such as uh, cancer uh, research nanotechnology drug delivery uh and the research spans a wide range of areas from the development of nanomaterial drugs for alzheimer disease to the study of mass cytometry and multiomics analytical approaches for the nanotoxicity models he has a strong publication record has actively contributed to various interdisciplinary fields with the biotechnology and uh, cancer research i hereby request uh, dr aribalan uh, uh, periyasamit to give a today sessions on uh, transcriptomic profiling of heterogeneous immune cells by i dimension cells rna sequencing analysis Uh, good afternoon everyone uh, my name is uh, dr hari wal perumal sami i am working as associate professor in uh, hanyang university republic of korea uh, first of all i would like to uh, apologize uh, not having the live online presentation uh, i'm sending my recorded video uh, for this one uh, due to my uh, important meeting i am uh, unavailable for the live presentation and uh, i'm very far sorry for that and uh, also before beginning my presentation 
I would like to uh, congratulate for the organizing committee for the such a wonderful uh, e-conference on the biomedical or basic medical sciences field. So it's a great opportunity for me to present uh, one of my uh, research topic. And also I would like to thank uh, organizing committee member uh, to give me such a great honor to present my topics. And thank you everyone. So today I'm going to uh, present about the uh, single cell RNA sequencing analysis method, uh, one of the advanced high dimensional method, which is very useful for the uh, heterogeneous immune cell profiling. So when we are exposing some of the nanomaterial or drug, how these immune cells are responding individually at single cell level. So we need to have proper uh, comprehensive profiling so that we could have to avoid misconception of the homogeneous type of uh, cellular detection. So this is the main important topic I would like to uh, present today. So I hope you may uh, understand my presentation. However, if you have any doubt or comments, so please leave me in the, you can drop your comment or questions in the chat box. So I will try to replay as much as I can. So yeah, so let me explain uh, more detail on by one about my presentation. Yes. Yeah, so today I'm going to discuss about the different type of nanomaterials. So particularly I'm just selecting the silver nanoparticle uh, so because we are keep, keep on working on the uh, nanomaterial uh, exposure to the immunological uh, immune cells and also we are profiling the uh, how immune cell responses in the pathogenic sample like a deceased uh, patient sample as well as healthy uh, donors and also we are profiling the COVID-19 uh, samples when we are having the booster shot and when we are having the, uh, we don't like a COVID uh, patient sample as well as the booster shot the sample, we can do compare the immune profiling because it's very important for the vaccine development. It's very important for to understand the how immune, dis, uh, immune response or immune dis, uh, different systems are working. So we need to have these kind of uh, analytical method so that it will be very useful to make such a decision. So that is the main objective for our thing. So nanomaterial exposure is one of the uh, objective for our laboratory. So in here, I'm going to explain about the silver nanoparticle. Since silver nanoparticle, we, there are so many biomedical applications in case of viral, antiviral activity or anti-cancer, antibacteria. There are so many applications uh, so far in the biomedical field. So, however, in, in, in case of uh, frequent exposure of the silver nanomaterial, and we need to have proper in vitro toxicity assessment. So, for example, so far we do have uh, short-term in vitro toxicity assessment in homogeneous immune cells, for example, epithelial cell or cancer cell or different type of uh, immune cell or like raw cell or many things. And in case of the in vivo, we do have exposure to the silver nanoparticle infrequently and we don't have proper uh, X, Y, O toxicity evaluation in case of the PBMC because PBMC have the different type of leukocyte like uh, NK cell, B cell, monocyte. There are so many type of uh, uh, different type of uh, NK cells or like different type of cells. They can respond differently so that we can call it as a heterogeneous cellular environment. So for these heterogeneous cell types, we don't have proper assessment at a single cell level profiling. So we need to have proper high dimensional uh, profiling approach so that we could avoid min misconception of uh, homogeneous uh, in vitro as well as in vivo uh, analytical method or toxicological approaches. So that is the main objective. We do have uh, single cell RNA sequencing analysis.
so that is the main objective so before going into deeper let me explain about how immune cells are responding when you are exposing some kind of drug or nanomaterial to the immune cells i think biomedical students they do have understanding about the immune cell response so in case of uh, low immunogenicity for example if we are exposing some nanomaterial or drugs so they do uh recognize this will be the antigen or harmful to the cell then they may respond or activate t cell mediated autoimmune response or innate immune response by activating the msc1 major histocompatibility complex one or msc2 they will be stopped in case of they think there will be no harmful to that particular cell that will be the low immunogenicity so in case of they recognize that nanoparticle as a antigen so they do have respond quickly so they activated the antigen presenting cell which can recognize the uh, antigen and then they do activate the t cell which can uh, into adaptive immune response or they can produce some antibody mediated femoral immune response by b cell activation that will be the nanoparticle antigen specificity and third one will be the antigenic modulation so some nanomaterial they can modulate the uh, antibody mediated cell surface they do have some kind of they can lose the variant so there will be lost the specificity when we are exposing some kind of nanomaterial and some nanomaterial induced or suppress the immune system by showing the toxicity uh, to the cell so they may be upregulated or downregulated or they may be suppressed completely and then another one is the privileged side they will be target specific so they can be uh, a physical barrier to protect that immune uh, cell when we are exposing the cell nanomaterial so these kind of heterogeneous responses will be profiled or will be studied at a single cell level at the same experimental condition. So we don't have such a proper analytical approaches to analyze these heterogeneous differences at the uh, human PBMC. So there will be, uh, so for homogeneous single cell type, like I said, is insufficient and may cause the misconception of the nanoparticle response. So we need to have comprehensive toxicity assessment so that it can be contribute to the understanding precisely uh, in case of toxicity or in case of uh, immunological response, either will be hypo or hypo inflammatory response. So and similarly, after we identify the cellular response, we do have some kind of molecular targeting way. Those are the commonly available like uh, ROSA mediated uh, oxidative stress or inflammatory response or ap apoptosis or autophagy mediated response. So when we exposing the cells, for example, B cell or T cell or monocyte or hydrogranulocyte, so they may respond individually, they may enter different type of pathway by exposing inflammatory or anti-inflammatory responses. So that will be profiled individually at the same experimental condition at one by one at single cell level so that is also our second objective to expose everything so before going further let me explain the differences between most commonly available we can call it as a bulk rna sequencing analysis as a single cell rna sequencing analysis it will be the main uh, important to understand what is the difference between these and where we can apply for single cell RNA sequencing analysis. Since the bulk RNA sequencing is the most commonly used RNA sequencing analysis method, it will be like uh, there will be RNA isolation in all together as a one bulk RNA input. Then we can go for the sequencing. There will be the homogeneous expression and it failed to expose the cellular heterogeneity it will be masked together and there will be no differences what type of cell and how they responded when we are exposing some kind of drug or nanomaterial or 
some kind of disease uh, related exposure when compared to the healthy individual so these are the commonly available method which is not applicable for the heterogeneous immune cellular environment so we need to have or we need to profile cell one by one individually so that we can also have different type of unique specific expression and also we, we can reveal based on the cell type we can reveal the heterogeneity and also we reveal the subcellular population so that we could precisely expose all the type of phenotype as well as DAG differently expressed gene expression so in case of uh, healthy or pathological tissue sample when we have the tissue samples, we do have profiling using single cell RNA sequencing. It can expose the differences between the cell types based on the morphological changes or expression. And we can also identify what type of uh, cells can be uh, disease associated, uh, what kind of cells can be profiled differently between the normal unaffected cell. Then it easy to prepare the drug or we easy to target it that those particular cells for, for the further treatment process so these things will be explored or unrevealed all the, these things it will be very very important when we go for the single cell analysis and uh, the main objective for this one i already explained uh, the immunotoxicity response in here we just expose silver nanomaterial and also compared with the untreated control so we have cell type identification phenotype identification and we also expose the heterogeneity responses individually and also we also express the differentially expressed genes from all individual responses and finally we have interpreted the gene network and the molecular level pathway so this is our main objective like i said before uh, both identification as well as molecular target for the each individual so this will be help us to overcome the limitation whatever we have approached so far like in vitro or in my analysis in we soon the homogeneous as well as another uh expo so we do have overcome all these limitations by using or performing single cell RNA sequencing analysis and in our study the experiment design will be uh the human uh, pbmc will be isolated from the human uh, blood from the volunteers and then we have treated with the silver nanomaterial material uh, for the three hours into micrographer ml after that we have barcoding the cell individually and then we do perform the 10x chromium analysis it will be performing by the three different steps like a bead attachment and cell individually separate and it it, it coated by the oil layer so that it, that one oil droplet will having the barcoding and one uh, cell and we can have some kind of uh, uh, primer which can be uh, attached with this one so after we have isolated uh, individually is using the tennis chromium analysis and then we can go for the further amplification and library construction and pc analysis and then we go for the data analysis and finally we get the result and we can do for the data analysis in the another part huge part so this is the main thing I already explained for this objective. So when we get in the data, like a pre-processed data, so we do have the uh, like a different type of uh, processing method to have the whole sequencing read and we remove the unread un and we remove the unwanted thing. And then we do have many different type of uh, uh like files to have the uma code or cell bar code or transcriptomic and then we can go for the pre-processing one by one to get all the expressed gene and we performed many different type of program like for r to visualize high dimensional 2d uh, plot to expose the phenotyping using the uh, marker gene expression and further we do the differently expressed gene and also we do the pathway analysis to expose all the isolated things that is our main objective one part will be like experiment another part will be like a data analysis there will be two huge different part 
which can work on this one. So based on the cellular expression, initially we do have some kind of uh, all the exposed cell which can be identified in two different parts like a control and treated groups so that we can confirm all the cells are alive or exposed well even though when we are exposing the treated uh, silver nanoparticle treated group and then we do have the cluster identification for the unique expression so in here uh, we got more than 11 cluster with the unique identification clusters and each clusters will be expressed based on the marker gene references for example in t cells we can uh, have the uh, three different type of marker gene which can express uniquely in here which will be considered as a t cell and for monocyte that uh, green color like number five cluster they can express uniquely for these genes similarly for nk cell and b cell platelet and neutrophil all b cells are expressed uniquely for individual then we can phenotyping individually one by one and similarly we have finalized the sorry we have finalized the all the immune cell type like control and treated group and we do have naming like b cell nk cell t cell and all the thing like control and treated group and when we compare the immune cell population individually for the both like uh, both the individuals like t cell monocyte both control and treated group uh, there will be no for for the toxicity in case of the cellular nanoparticle so this will be a huge interesting so when we are exposing the nanoparticle, there will be no further toxicity. Similarly, for the expression individually for all different cell type by showing the different type of cellular marker expression. So in here, there will be not much huge differences. However, we do have the further deprofiling for the individually like B cell or T cell or NK cell. Then only we can expose for the subset identification so that we plan to profiling one by one so initially we profile the monocyte because monocyte will be the primary target for the any type of nanomaterial or antigen they will be captured and then they get differentiated into either pegocyte or they will be differentiated into dendritic cell antigen presenting cell then they will be activated for the b cell or t cell mediated adaptive immune response so that is the main important thing so we provide monocyte to explore the monocyte subset we isolated two different type of subset like uh, cd16 positive cd16 minor we can call it as a classical or non-classical monocyte so these things uh, will be like uh, when we do the initially there will be no differences in the monocyte also but when we go for the further deep profiling individually so we do have some kind of uh, slight changes in the population and also slight uh, huge differences in the up and down regulated genes so interestingly so monocyte particularly the metal ion uh, related gene which is called it as a cellular metal ion response gene is up regulated completely it's indicated that monocytes are primary target they can bind very well with uh, cellular nanoparticle so however they can closely uh, up regulated with the metal ion related uh, thing but however they don't have uh, for the inflammatory response, they all the inflammatory response genes like interleukin beta or TNF uh, alpha and chemokine genes are down regulated. This is a very interesting finding and novel finding for us because uh, nanomaterials we always consider or thinking that there will be always will be they produce the toxicity to the cell but this indicated that even though they are closely associated with the monocyte there will be no further inflammatory mediated cytotoxicity so that's why there will be no differences in the population differences so this is an interesting finding so there will be no further inflammatory response was activated because like i said before monocyte can be activated either macrophagian mediated engulfing or uh, B or T cell mediated 
adapt the immune response because monocyte can differentiate it into the dendritic cell or antigen presenting cells that is the important function of the monocyte so there will be no further inflammatory response to initiate either innate or adaptive immune response and similarly this is the gene ontology or molecular pathway detection for the monocyte the out down regulated genes like i said there will be no further inflammatory response were confirmed again by gene ontology as well as gene enrichment analysis the blue color all down regulated all the thing can also show the enrichment score it will be the minus score it will like an immune response or different response all the down regulated this right side image it's indicated that all the cellular metal response association was highly upregulated even though it was closely associated or attached into the monocyte, there will be no further immune defense response was initiated. So that is what concluded in the monocyte. In summary, whatever I said, it is a confirmed that metallothian associated genes were strongly associated when compared to the control gene. This is the result we have got in the monocyte. It will be helpful to maintain the hemopoietesis even though they initiate the pro-inflammatory response when they are initiate like acute uh, inflammatory response there will be no further uh, continuous inflammatory responses in case of b cell subset similarly we do have isolated two different type of b cell subset one will be like naive b cell and one will be memory b cell either both b cells uh, will be significantly activated either with the down regulator or up regulator however the down regulated gene the most important gene from sod or msn or thing will be like uh, down regulating the oxidative immune response it will be avoid the ROS mediated inflammatory cytotoxicity now in case of ms1 and aflt this will be uh like helpful to impair the t cell or b cell mediated uh proliferation or immune responses similarly for other one it also um like helpful to down regulate all lysosomal mediator it can suppress the b cell activation so these all down regulated genes or clearly notice that there will be no cytotaxis was produced by when we are exposing the cellular cell nanopartial in case of the both naive and memory B cells. And this is the gene ontology result. This indicated that uh, both naive and memory B cell, the naive B cell may be initiated initially to be activated the RNA related uh, uh, mechanism like cytoplasmic mediated trans translation process or protein process however the defense process will be down regulated in either uh, memory or memory cell. this is the memory cell source all the inflammatory response will be down regulated so this indicated that both naive and memory uh, could help researchers better understand how the immune systems are react when the metal lines are attached so that is that inhibition of oxidase stress indicated there will be no further toxicity and inhibiting the memory B cell this indicated that there is will be no immediate early response when we are having the external stimuli. So like all the silver nanoparticle when we are exposing particularly to the naive or memory B cell the inflammatory response will be suppressed or inhibited. This is what we have found in our thing. In, and finally, the T cell. So when we having the T cells, when we go for the further uh, deep profiling, the time the T cell will be uh, further divided into either T helper cell, which includes CD4, naive memory, and effector, and T killer cell or cytotoxic killer cell will be like. CD8 mediated because this will be activated by MHC2 complex and this will be activated by MHC1 complex. So there will be no differences in case of the population differences. However, the significant genes from the either naive uh, memory or naive T cell will be uh, upregulated or downregulated significantly. And like I said, all the genes from the T cells like all this one and this one will be down regulated because this will be the very important gene for 
like uh, T cell differentiation was down regulated. Uh, NF kappa B genes, which is very important for initiate the T cell mediated adaptive immune response, also down regulated. And uh, particularly the cytotoxic killer T cell, which is very important for toxic producing the T cell, it will be no uh, significant. So none of them are showed any significant. This also indicated there will be no cytotoxic response to the T cell. And also finally, all the different experts from, from the both naive and T cell, they prevent for the initiation of the adaptive immune response. This is what we have noticed in case of defense or response to cytokine or response to cytokine signal, all will be down regulated. So that's what we have noticed. And finally, the conclusion, when we are exposing uh, all kind of nanomaterial or all kind of uh, drug, the initial target will be the blood. So when they are entering into the blood, so they will be encaptured by the different type of heterogeneous immune cell. They will be activated either by the NK cell or monocyte or T cell or granulocyte or many things. In our study, uh, these three cells are significantly uh, responded into the cell nanoparticle. In case of NK cell or granulocyte, there will be no further a significant response. So we have selected those three for the further deep profiling. So in case of monocyte, so like I said, the metallothion genes was upregulated, which indicated that monocytes are closely associated with the metal cellular response or closely associated with the cellular nanoparticle. It can be activated metallothion related protein. So it indicated that there will be this slight oxidative degradation. However, there is no further inflammatory response. This is the pro-inflammatory or uh, cytokine response or chemokine response. This indicated that. So there will be no hyper-mediated or inflammatory-mediated toxicity response when you are exposed to the cellular. This will be observed both uh, classical or non-classical monocyte subset. And similarly, in case of B cell, we divide it into naive B cell and memory B cell subset. In case of naive B cell, like we already said, there will be uh, inhibition of the oxidase stress of the ROS generation and also impairment of the T and B cell lymphocyte. It will be helpful for the adaptive mediator or humoral mediator immune response will be stopped due to the impairment. Similarly, for the memory B cell, inhibition of growth factor or cytokine release will be stopped. There will be no uh, further memory related uh, inflammatory response in case of silver nanoparticle exposure. So finally, the T cell. The T cells also divided into two different things like a cytotoxic uh, killer cell or cyto. Uh, T helper cell. So in case of T helper cells, uh, that all the T cell differentiation, all the uh, T cell activation cells are down regulated when we are exposing the cellular nanoparticle, it denoted there will be no further adaptive immune response was noticed. In case of CD8 T cell, there will be no further significant differences were observed between control and theta group. It's indicated there will be no further cytotoxic killer T cell activation when we are exposing the T cell. So finally, silver nanoparticle can closely associate to the monocyte. Even though they have associated with the monocyte, there will be no further monocyte differentiation into to activate T cell mediated or B cell mediated humoral responses. So that's why monocytes are, even though they have closely associated, they have detected as a antigen, but there will be no further inflammatory response, which could, can activate into B cell or T cell. So that indicates that silver nanoparticle are not that much toxic or not produce any toxicological response or hyper-inflammatory response when we are exposing to the 
uh, human blood PBMC cells. So that is the overall story for today's presentation. And uh, also in our Center for Next Generation Cytometry, we do have two different type of analytical approach. That will be the mass cytometry analysis, this is the site of, and we are analyzing or deprofiling the immune cell based on the surface protein markers uh, for the mass cytometry analysis. In case of single cell RNA sequencing, we do have analyzed uh, cellular phenotyping based on the barcoding as well as gene expression. We do have identified the, all the cell at a single cell level and identify the molecular pathway by using the single cell. And the only different thing is this will be the biased or it will be the uh, selective protein markers to identify target immune cells and it will be unbiased one. So we can identify all the cell type with the huge data analysis. That is the two different thing we are doing. And also, uh, I would like to thank uh, Professor Yoon, also one of the colleague and co-worker of my uh, Ask the Four Star and my students, those who were supported and helped me for this uh, thing. So, and also this is the project that we have received on the left. So, once again, uh, thank you so much for the organizing committee uh, for giving me opportunity to present uh, our work. And, all, and also, like I said, and please drop your comment and uh, i hope uh, you can understand the, about today's presentation if you have any doubt or further clarification uh, please uh... so i thank uh... Dr. Haribalan Thermal Sami for his wonderful presentation on uh, transcript profiling, profiling of immune cells by single cell RNA seq analysis. As he has an important meeting now, he could not present on live. But anyway, we have shared his mail ID. If you have any queries, you can mail him. He assured that he would, de he would definitely reply to all your mails. So, as a token of appreciation, we would like to share the e-certificate and the memento to our speaker, Dr. Haribalan Perimal Song. Also, we would like to share the certificate of appreciation and the memento to our uh, chairperson, Dr. Reyes Ravi. Thank you, Thank Dr. You. Ganesh. I want to say a few things about uh, this study that I want to express my sincere appreciation for uh, outstanding presentation uh, uh, during this uh, conference. Your talk on silver, I mean, the Aribalan talk on uh, silver uh, nanoparticles and the impact on uh, transcriptome profiling of heterogeneous immune cells through uh, I dimensional single cell RNA sequencing analysis was truly expected. So here are the few specific aspects that I found particularly commendable. So I have two more questions for him that I will mail to him. One is that uh, what is a specific immune cell types shows a more significant alteration in the transcriptomic following the exposure to silver nanoparticles. Uh, and uh, second question is that can this single cell RNA sequencing analysis distinguish between a direct effect of silver nanoparticles on immune cells and the potential secondary effect uh, mediated through intercellular communications on signaling pathways. So these are the two questions I just want because I, we also work on this uh, pathway analysis. So these questions, uh, if he can able to answer us, it will be very nice. Uh, I found the particularly commendable of, about his work is that his presentation was very essentially clear and well structured. Uh, his ability to engage the audience was impressive. Uh, since uh, the talk was related to the uh, the next level, uh, next generation sequencing, uh, and all the research labs are moving towards that area, I think that, I mean, this study will help the young generation uh, how the, uh, the, the future of uh, uh, the mass spec analysis as well as the single cell uh, uh, sequencing of 
transcriptome profiling is very important to the uh, uh, to uh, understand the the uh, the what do you say the uh, the challenging molecular mechanisms. Uh, congratulations, Dr. Aribalan. Thank you for sharing the groundbreaking work with us. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ravi. I hope uh, Dr. Haribalan will answer all his queries. I thank each and everyone for joining. Thank you. Good morning. We'll continue with our next scientific talk presented by Dr. N. Mukundan Sir over translational research in anatomy. I'm happy to invite our chairperson for today, Dr. Sulokshana Saktivel, Additional Professor, Department of Anatomy, Jipmar Puducherry. Madam has done her undergraduate from Tenal Valley Medical College in 1990 and post-graduation from Tanjavur Medical College in 2006. She has added numerous publications in both national as well as international level and Madam has got an experience of more than 17 years in the field of anatomy. We welcome you ma'am. I also welcome our next chairperson Dr. Shantani Arul Selvi, Professor and Head, Department of Anatomy, Vinayaga Missions Medical College from Karekal. Madam has done her undergraduation and post-graduation from Alamula University and she has got more than 15 years of teaching experience for both undergraduate as well as postgraduate session. We welcome you ma'am. I also welcome our resource person for today Dr. N. Mukundan sir from uh, Sri Mukambike Institute of Medical Science. Uh, may I request our chairperson for today Dr. Sulokshana Saktivel to introduce the speaker today. Over to you ma'am. That is a slight interruption with the connectivity. I'll introduce the speaker. We have with us Dr. N. Mukundan, Professor of Anatomy, currently working at Sri Mukampika Institute of Medical Science, Kola Sekram, Tamil Nadu. Sir has gotten wide experience. Sir has been a former Professor of Anatomy at Sri Balaji Vidyapit University, Puducherry. Sir has completed his undergraduation in Government Ternal Valley Medical College in 2009 and from uh, is post graduation from Madras Medical College. And he took his DNB in 2012. Sir has completed his PhD in anatomy in 2016 from Sri Balaji Vidyapit University. Uh, I think Madam has joined. Ma'am, we, we are happy if you continue. Okay. Uh, Dr. Mukhutan uh, made an impact with his excellence as a teacher, research worker, and research guide for MBBS, MD, and PhD students in anatomy. He has published a series of research papers on the effect of mobile phone radiation on animal issues, issues in various national and international journals. He is a member of National Academy of Medical Sciences, New Delhi, and a member of various national and uh, anatomical societies. He is also a critical reviewer in many national and international anatomy journals. He is an American Heart Association certified instructor for BLS and ACLS courses since 2013. We welcome you, sir, and we are honored to have you here, and we are eagerly waiting for your speech. Uh, 
डॉक्टर इलंकते सर विल जॉइन विद इन फाइव मिनट Nike Missions Group where education meets healthcare excellence our academic landscape spans across 13 colleges and 11 schools situated in four vibrant campuses we are proud to serve the union territory of puducherry and extend our reach to selam and chengalpet districts in tamil nadu pioneers in private medical education we established the first private medical college in puducherry back in 2000 Today we operate two medical colleges in Puducherry where we provide healthcare services to an astonishing 4.5 lakh outpatients and over 50000 inpatients annually. We manage nine rural health centers where we attend to approximately 1000 patients every day ensuring quality healthcare for all. And now as we embark on our next level in healthcare We are proud to introduce the Vinayaka Karkinos Oncology Institute or VCOI in collaboration with Karkinos Healthcare. Karkinos Healthcare is a purpose driven technology led oncology platform revolutionizing cancer care in India with a primary focus on early detection, precise diagnosis, patient care and groundbreaking research. Through setting up of the Vinayaka Karkinos Oncology Institute The aim is to bring comprehensive cancer care closer to the communities under the distributed cancer care network. Our mission: early detection programs through community screening programs, identifying high-risk patients and guiding them throughout their entire care journey. The facility will be equipped with state-of-the-art diagnosis and treatment options. And as part of our commitment to the people of Puducherry, Vinayaka Karkinos Oncology Institute aims to screen nearly 1 lakh population within the next few months. This collaboration between Karkinos Healthcare and Vinayaka Missions Group, including Vinayaka Missions Research Foundation, in setting up of the Vinayaka Karkinos Oncology Institute, Vikoy in Puducherry and Salem, shall be a testament. where education research and affordable and accessible cancer care come together for a brighter healthier future sir is joined yes sir uh, extremely sorry for the delay in the start it's uh, because of the connectivity issue we welcome dr n mukundan sir from sri mukambika institute of medical science kola sekaram tamil nadu uh, sir Yes, sir good morning sir good morning sir and morning. may i request uh, dr n mukundan sir to present his talk on translational research in anatomy over to you sir oh thank you sir thank you sir very good morning to everyone at the outset i would like to thank the organizer of the fourth international conference the bms econ especially the professor and hod of anatomy dr telangadir sir and uh, the Uh, sir very very, uh, very very thank you very much sir uh, for sharing that uh, uh, regarding the knowledge of uh, francis the research in anatomy just a, a few things i would like to share uh, regarding the francis the research in anatomy am i audible to everyone yes sir you are loud and clear sir can everyone see my screen sir uh, 
can share your slides. Yes, sir. Okay. sir, everyone can see in the slides? No, sir. No, sir. No. no. Okay. One second. One second. Screen is visible, sir. You can go for the slideshow, sir. Yeah. Visible, sir? Yes, sir. Clear, sir. Yeah. Can you proceed, sir? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Very good. Okay. So that is a, these are the learning objectives in the translational research. First, I would like to explain what is translational research and what is translational research in anatomy. And I will give a few examples about the, the translational research in anatomy. Okay. So what is translational research? The definition is very simple. The process of learning observation in the laboratory the clinic and the community into intervention that improve the health of the individuals and the public it can be a diagnostic and therapeutics to the or the medical procedure and the behavioral changes. So simply that is we are turning the observations what we are seeing in the either in the dissection hall or in the clinic or even in the community into interventions. That will be helpful to that public. That is translational research. The goal of the translational research is very simple. That is to translate or move the basic science discoveries quickly into the practice, quickly and effective, efficiently into the practice. That is translational research. Just this, uh, I'll just explain this one with a small example. So uh, in our college during that, uh, the family adoption program, FAP program, the students are divided into that is the five villages. They visited to the villages about that is uh, each family and uh, taking the net and everything. When their health status and everything in one particular village, they found that the people, they all are having, there is a same complaint. That is the, the running nose and the sneezing and the nasal congestion due to that is a sinus that problem. So particularly that is nearly around, uh, uh, that is the nearly 30 to 40 families they have everybody having the that problem they reported to the that is the the, the faculty community medicine faculty sir this uh these families are they are having the, such a problem like that. fortunately their one student he already completed the siddha bsms and when he visited that near the house he found a plant there are a lot of plant that is called the parthenium plant and he understood that this plant is the culprit creating that is the allergic response. And he informed to the consent faculty that these, these, these all the houses, they all, they are, the houses are surrounded by the parthenium plant. And this plant is the one may be the cause for their uh, the nasal congestion and the allergic rhinitis and the sinusitis. Then the faculty okay, understood maybe a reason. Okay, the next day when they are coming to the visit, they requested the family that all the all the villages can you remove all this plant and this parthenium? It may be a, it is not good for your health. That's why maybe you are having this uh, allergic problem and such a thing. They agreed happily. Okay, sir, we will remove it. So within two three days they have removed everything. And the next week they have visited. Nearly that is the 50 percent of the people they were free from the symptom. They followed up again after two weeks. They were completely free from the, the symptoms. So it indicates that these students' family. We simply say that is a some we say some family adoption program, and they are going and in the first year. So they found that is a, in the they observed that in the community they found the problem. They identified the problem. What is the problem? What is the cause for the problem? So they identified the plant and they removed the car. Now they are full. Now it is. So this is simply like a translational research. So that is the, the observation what you are seeing in the community. They are putting into that, turning into that intervention. So that is the translational research. 
there are five steps in the translational research. Just I will just give a brief outline of it. So usually in the anatomy, the preclinical and the paraclinical department, that uh, the, the, the research will take place that is at the level of the T0, that is translational research at the zero level. So this we are calling it is the basic science research. It is, uh, it is uh, done in the preclinical and the paraclinical department. Especially this is an animal study. Not only it is not restricted to the animal studies, but for example, we are, found, uh, we, are we are formulating a device to diagnose a particular disease or particular that is things in the blood. Yeah, like a, simply like a, a glucometer, like that, a new device or such a thing. Yeah. So this is starting in the pre and the paraclinical department. Especially if we are there, uh, devising, uh, uh, formulating a molecule, drug molecule to prevent a particular disease and such things, it will start with an animal study. So here in the preclinical and paraclinical, we are defining the mechanisms and the targets, and, or it may be a molecule. We are leading the molecules. Okay, so that is the T0 level. Now that is the T1 level. Now we have designed a study that mechanism we have designed or a drug molecule or a device, whatever it may be. We have designed and we tested in the animals. Now we are translating into the human. This stage that is in the that is the, the phase one clinical trial. We have the T1 stage. That's what we applied in the animal studies, we are applying into the human. It will be the human volunteers. Okay, so that is we are giving the proof of concept that is in the phase one clinical trial. So now we are adapting a new methods for a, for a new molecule or a, a uh, diagnostic device or such. So this is the T1 stage. Next is that is the T2 stage here that is actually originally that is the phase two and the phase three clinical trial will be happen in the patients. We are administering the molecule or we are administering the device from the human volunteer to now it is in the, that is the patients. So the translation to patient. So we are translating from the animal studies to human volunteers and to the, that is the patients. So this is the, the controlled studies. We have a control and the, we are applying that. So now from this phase two and phase three two, we are moving to the phase four clinical trial that is, we are calling it is the translation to the, that is into the practice. So here that is the, the, the molecule is in the, uh, in use or say that is that the diagnostic device what you developed is in use. So here that is now we are uh, testing that is the it's outcome of this drug. What is the main outcome of this procedure or the drug or the device? So here the delivery of uh, recommended and timely care to the right patient we, are, we have to give. So that is the, the, the T3 stage. Now T4 stage is now that is the, the translation to the community. So already the drug molecule used by the patients already is in the use for say that is a three or four years or five years. Now what is the effect of that, uh, that uh, the research or that that is a particular device or particular drug molecule we developed? What is the that is the outcome in the community? So this is that uh, whether that drug or the device is. Uh, uh, is it uh, actually truly benefit to the society or not? What is already existing molecule will convert that, whether it is any new benefit to the community. So that is in the, the translation stage. But when we will consider in the preclinical and the paraclinical, we are mainly that is the focusing on that, that is the, the animal studies. So we, we are the one that is putting a foundation, the pre and the paraclinical department are putting a foundation for the transnational research. We alone cannot complete that because that our observation should reach to the community to get the benefit of our research. So we are the initial part, we are the foundations to provide that is that, that the, the basic for the transnational research through the animal studies. Okay. Now come to the transnational research in anatomy. What is transnational research in anatomy? So the process of turning observation in the dissection or the procedures in the cadaveric lab, not a new, new endoscopic procedures, so many new procedures we are doing in the cadaveric lab and also in the not only cadaveric lab, the histology and also in the genetic lab. 
into the interventions that intervention should improve the health of the individuals and the public so that is translational research in anatomy okay so simply that is whatever we are observing either in the dissection lab or in the cadaveric lab in the histology or genetic or whatever in division either in osteology class whatever that we are observing in the lab that is we are uh, turning into the interventions so that is that intervention will help in the health of the individuals and the public uh, that is sometimes you may think that uh, so what we can do in anatomy like simply observing the histology and uh, the cadaver and how we are going to help into the community especially when the that is the sts project in icmr comes the students used to come into the anatomy sir because they are very close with the anatomy and by comes the first year student after completing the first day they used to come to the first to the pre clinical department then most of the i i i, I saw that most of the faculty say sts uh, sts uh, project in anatomy what you can do we have only cadaver and the histology lab we can't do anything like that no don't say like that so we can do that is a many thing in the translation research see that is the uh, what we are observing for, for example your, the students are doing a dissection for example any variation in the nerve in the upper limb or in the abdominal organs anything we are putting a publication we are finding out present it and publish it bring it to the knowledge to the surgeons and the clinicians throw the clinicians it will reach to the community who will get the benefit the public the community is going to get the benefit through the clinicians who is the foundation we are the one foundation we are the one founding the variation so i will give the brief examples about that what are the translation research in anatomy and we will go for a few example in that also okay so again so the, the translation research in anatomy is scientific knowledge gathered via anatomical research being used to create workable solution for the, that is the, the human health and the medical facilities okay the integration of activities from the bench to the bedside bench is that, that is in the lab okay cadaveric or in the hospital lab to the bedside to the clinics to the patient okay so bridging the gap between the basic anatomical research and its real world application is the transnational research in anatomy okay so these are some of examples of the transnational research in anatomy in the clinical anatomy researcher may use that anatomical knowledge in the surgical technique in the medical imaging and diagnostic procedure we can use it for example that is the 3d printing technology has been approved to create a patient specific anatomical models for surgical plan okay so uh, for example that is a this 3d imaging of that uh, particular individual is admitted for a particular disease before planning for the surgery you can work out on that the 3d printing model that is the same exact detail of the patient so we can work out more in the that is the before surgery we can plan it so that will be that uh, more helpful in the clinical anatomy then in the disease research anatomical studies can contribute to understanding the underlying causes and the mechanism of the disease this knowledge can lead to the development of the targeted drug therapies and intervention for example this is the deep brain dbs the deep brain stimulation implanting the electrode into the brain to treat the condition like parkinson's disease and the essential trauma so to keep the that is the dbs that is the we need we must know that is where, where is the anatomical site where to stimulate the this this uh, neurons especially that is the, the corpus callosum and such either so we need that is the anatomical model then that is the lvids that is left ventricular assist devices are the surgical devices implanted to assist the failing heart by taking over the, the pacemaker function so for that that is the we need that is the, the basic now the drug delivery system researchers use anatomical data to design the drug delivery system that target the specific anatomical region this can enhance the effectiveness and reduce the side effect of medication this we all are know that is especially in the radiotherapy or in the brachytherapy and especially that is the so that is the uterine artery embolization and in the case of fibroid so many advances are there so for the drug delivery system we need that is the, the typical anatomical course of these vessels the variation in the uh, blood vessels such a thing so will be helping the anatomical education 
translational research can improve the methods and the tools used for teaching anatomy to the medical students and also the healthcare professional ensure that they are up to date and in the relevant anatomical knowledge mm -hmm. say that is say that is nowadays that is a lot of software the virtual dissection anatomy isn't it so that is a and then the now that is the artificial intelligence so these all are that is the helping that to educate that anatomy knowledge okay good the rehabilitation and in the prosthetics the translational research in anatomy plays an important crucial role in designing prosthetic limb and the rehabilitation programs the detailed knowledge of the morphometry of the hip and knee joints help in creating prosthetics with it mimicking the natural and that is the movement and the function for example most of the that is the these uh, devices say that is the knee implant and the hip implant that is manufactured in either in germany or in the usa their morphology of that that is the the tibial condyle and the femoral condyle or say that is the, the uh, head of the femur and the acetabulum will be different when compared to the indian asian population so we have to work out on that our population to find out the morphometry of the condyle and if you will devise if you will develop a device prosthesis for the indian people that will be the more fit more fitable one so that is the, the rehabilitation and prosthetics huh? now come to that one important two example i will give one is for the that is the research in the uh, research aspect uh, in the histology will be another one is that is uh, in the that is the grass anatomy so i will give that is the, the this uh, two example that is uh, for in the translation research when you will start that is a t0 stage that translation research in the the first the step is we have to identify the problem where is the problem where is the lack me where is the gap so in my research we have identified that there was some contradictory scientific reports on the effect of radio frequency radiation emitted from the cell bone on the biological tissues we found that that problem is there we identified that problem the world health organization and the international agency for research on cancer they classified that is the cell phone radiation the rf are emitted from the cell phone is category 2b it means it is possi possibly carcinogenic genic to that humans so that is category 2b so icmr has conducted asked to conduct a multidisciplinary study in the delhi to find out the adverse effect of radio frequency radiation emitted from the cell phone on the general population that is especially on the human volunteers okay the icmr also has cited that there are no conclusive data or evidence till date so far to show that radiation from the mobile phone or the towers have adverse health effects so icmr initiated the study with the statement that emphasizing the need for further investigation so we took that study and we found out yeah, that is the they have reviewed that literature and everything and they found out that is the effect of mobile phone radiation induced single and double stranded dna breakages there is lot of reduction of that is the parkinson cell number in the rat cerebellum there are significant reduction in the sperm count reduction in the serum testosterone level and also that is the short term memory affected in the mice there is short term exposure induced damages in the kidney and in the human volunteers the study include that says that there are risk of acoustic neuroma that is a long term exposure in a human volunteers 10 years because keeping the cell phone in the air and hear it so it will induce a, that is the acoustic neuroma there is a reduced that is the re reaction speed to a particular stimulus both increase in the systolic and the diastolic blood pressure and the genotoxic effect in human peripheral blood leukocytes decrease in sperm count motility and viability there was a question once that they asked that is sir where to keep my cell phone safely no way that is we always have a mail we always have a, on the left side that pocket chat pocket is on the left side not on the right side because we always use a, that is the right hand so whatever thing we put in the pocket it will be easy to take out if it is on the left side but the same thing left side so in that you will have the heart so those who are using that is the cell phone they are having that is a, a conduction abnormality in the conducting system of the heart especially that is the bradyhardia and the tachyarrhythmia and when you will keep the cell phone near your that is the inguinal region or the spermatic cord there also that is the sperm count is reduced when you will keep it in the pocket pan pocket in front side 
again that is the sperm count is reduced then where to keep the ideal place is put it over on the back pocket back one so that is the gluteal muscle only will be exposed this problem will not arise for the female because their ovaries are very safe in the abdomen okay so that is all the male has to take care okay so that is there are we found there are some contradictory finding also that is no breakage of the double stranded dna of the red brain, red brain no effect on the mouse embryonic lens development no effect on the psychomotor performance and no histological changes in the rat test okay so we made in a, that is the uh, aim and objectives to study the postnatal effect of radio frequency radiation emitted from the both at that time so our study was conducted from 2010 to 2016 that time that is the 2g and 3g phone was in use so we have studied that is the 2g and 3g phone in the mice from 0 to 180 days and we want to identify the gross anomalies occurred due to the radio frequency uh, exposure in the both 2g and the 3g cell phone on brain liver kidney testis and ovary of the mice and we want to establish a severity of the structural damage caused by the radio frequency radiation on the solid organs like especially brain liver kidney testis and the ovary okay and we want to analyze the structural changes in the quantitative tests using that is the, the histology and the histomorphometric data to prove the potential damage exposed in comparison to the non exposure and we want to evaluate the oxidative stress caused by the radio frequency exposure by um, measuring the level of the anti oxidant that is the superoxidant dismutase and glutathione peroxide and we want to assess the changes in the protein expression by single dimensional sds page we have done also this study in the that is developing chick embryo also we have done that is the comet assay and uh, the study in the in the mgmc ri that uh, they have conducted the study in also that is the 3g as well as that is the 4g comparing 3g and 4g now that phd scholars researchers are uh, now that is the because the emergence of that is the the 5g now they are conducting their study on the that is the 5g cell phone radiation okay that is just i am presenting that is the uh, my study only okay so this is our experimental setup in the cage that is the, the mice is there and we have kept a cell phone that is both 2g as well as 3g cell phone we kept and what you are seeing in here is the, this is uh, that is the that is the the rf meter is there to find out that is how much radio frequency radiation has been exposed and how much has been absorbed by the animal the various levels are there that is from starting from the green to that is the, the yellow and the red when the, that is the, the maximum frequency will be the record the cell phone will be kept here and uh, we have uh, uh, adapted with the, that is the auto answer mode that is uh, whenever we are calling that is uh, we made that is the 48 minutes per day actually every 30 minutes 2 minutes call will give and once when we are giving the ring this auto answer mode will be enabled either both in the 2g voice call also in the 3g that video call will be automatically on and that radiation will be exposed and that radio frequency will be measured by the rf meter kept inside here remember that animal will be the mice will be moving here and there in the end their cage and wherever that mice will go that is the, the rf meter will detect that radio frequency radiation and we calculate the dosimet okay so this is our setup and we use that is the standard mobile phone we, we uh, don't want to disclose that what type of mobile phone what company we have used similarly which network provider has been that is we use that network that don't also is uh, not disclosed and uh, the frequency range is from that is the for the 2g is 900 to 1800 megahertz uh, and for the 3g is 1900 to 2200 megahertz that is uh, for the video call and the power of the cell phone is 2 watts and the uh, specific sar the specific observed rate of the cell phone is 1 point the standard that 1.6 and recommended by who 1.69 watts per kg that is per 10 gram of tissue okay the duration of the exposure is 48 minutes per day from 8 am to 8 pm that is uh, every 2 minutes every 30 uh, every half an hour we expose for 2 minutes okay so this is uh, that is the study parameters we have studied in the brain that is we focus only on the of course we have taken this uh, sample for cerebrum cerebellum everywhere but i have concentrated only on the hippocampal region where that is a uh, want to know that is what are the changes in the neuron because it is mainly concerned with uh, that is the memory and everything so 
we want to confirm only confined to that area only hippocampal region okay so that is a uh, this is a uh, device that is a capturing device and we have used j software as well as that is the the ocular micrometer to measure the neuronal diameter and everything and the neural density the square graphically are used this is a hippocampal region that is the this is the ca cornu man is one and this is the cornu man is a region two and ca three region and uh, this is the uh, dentate caries dorsal blade and this is the dentate caries ventral blade we have examined that the neurons on these uh, the five regions okay then in the kidney that is uh, uh, we have measured the diameter of the glomerulus is that there is uh, the microglometer and the glomerular urinary space also we have measured and the diameter of the pct and the dct and the height of the cell lining the pct and dct we have measured and in the testis the seminiferous tubule that is diameter and the density of the seminiferous tubule the average number of the sertoli cells per tubule and the average number of leydig cells per unit area also we have measured okay so this is the that is the testis uh, you can see the the microglometer to measure the diameter this is that to measure the density the square graphically you have used and this is the uh, that uh, uh, We, it's all the all the all the five regions. That is, this is the in the CA one region. You can see here. This is the neurons in the pyramidal neurons in the CA one region, and uh, we have compared compared to the sham exposed and the two G and the three G uh, exposed uh, uh, hippocampal neurons. So what we found uh, here in the two G and the three G that uh, the intertitium is uh, you can see here. You can see the, uh, the 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 control group. So you can see the intertitium is wider. Okay. This is on the CA2 region again. That is the the pyramidal neurons are less densely packed and the wide intertitium. So this uh, wide intertitium is uh, due to that is the cell phone radiation induced endothelial damage and the more vascular permeability will lead to that is the wide intertitium. Okay, in the CA3 region also same. That is we have found that is the wide intertitium. And this is the dentate gyrus dorsal region that the granular neurons you can see that. Is the 2G exposed and 3G exposed here also? That is the that is the dentition will be a little bit wider, and uh, here in that uh, that uh, 2G exposed and 3G exposed in ventral bed there is not much. This is a silver stain now. Uh, that is a sham exposed CA1, CA2, CA3 region and the dentate caries dorsal bed and ventral blade. All the findings we have already. That is the this is our pub publications. Uh, uh, we have already. The uh, JCDR journal we have published the findings, and uh, come to this uh, liver, the histological study we have found uh, in the 2G and 3G exposed. That is the uh, liver. We found there are many cytoplasmic uh, vacuolations. You can see here that is a uh, lot of cytoplasmic vacuolations are there. That, that is the four mini spaces, and uh, many that is the uh, nuclear cells that is the pyknotic nuclei and hepatic sinusoids were congested. Okay. And the uh, 3G uh, exposed uh, liver shows the more marked changes, and we have seen that is a lot of total hemorrhages in the that is the liver parenchyma, and the more marked hemorrhages in the 3G. These all are induced that is uh, by the radio frequency radiation induced that is the endothelial damage increased more vascular permeability lead to these hemorrhages. Okay, so this is uh, in the you can see that is in the periportal region. This is a portal. Uh, the portal triad you can see that the periportal region you can see it is infiltrated with the lymphocytes a mixer type of both lymphocytes macrophages and neutrophils it is more marked you can see the lymphocytic infiltration mixed reaction you can see on the that is the 3g exposed liver okay so come to the kidney that is the, in the 2g this is the sham exposed this is the 2g and 3g in the 2g that is the you can see that uh, the, the glomerular capillaries are dilated and congested And you can see that the urinary space is increased, but in the the same thing in the 3G exposed uh, group, the glomerulus are atrophied due to the radiation, and also the same congested glomerular capillaries. And uh, because of the atrophy, uh, that is the glomerulus, the urinary space is also reduced. Then you will see that is in the parenchyma. We can see that is the, the in the 2G as well as 3G. That is the the peritubular lymphocytic infiltration is also there. And also along the peri capillary infiltration also. This this is the capillary you can see that is along the peri capillary that is infiltration. This is there is you can see this in the 3G exposed that is the the peri capillary 
region that lymphocytic infiltration here on the peritubular that is the lymphocytic infiltration be more marked in the preach come in the kidney also you can see there are a lot of hemorrhages focal hemorrhage in the 2g more 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 marked on the that is the 3g exposed that is the kidney so indicating that is a radio frequency induced damages coming to the proximal converted tubules in the proximal converted tubules see the 2g and the 3g the discontinuous or the, that is the the loss of breast border lining in the both in the proximal converted tubule of 2g and the 3g so the lumen looks like a wider one okay and and in the that is the this uh, this also you can see that is the well, the loss of breast border appearance and the lumen appear more wide okay so this is uh, similarly that is in the uh, peritubular that is a lymphocytic infiltration in the both 2g and the 3g and come to the distal converted tubule the same thing that is the psycho you can see the cytoplasmic coagulations and also that is the the pyknotic nuclei you can form that is the, the apoptotic changes in the cells okay and come to the testis that is a this is the 2g exposed and 3g exposed this is the sham control uh, the, in the 2g and 3g the capsule is thickened because of the radio frequency uh, radiation remember that testis is uh, placed in the scrotal region more the radiation exposure is more and you see that in the 2g and the 3g here is the sham exposed see the intertitium is here it is compact so here you can see the intertitium will be very wide both in the 2g and the 3g and if you see the seminiferous tubules here the compactness of this seminiferous epithelium here the seminiferous epithelium shows the maturation arrest and in, in the most of the peripheral tubules there is no spermatogenic cells the maturation is arrested here okay similarly that is the you can see the detachment of the spermato that is the setoli cells and the spermatogonial cells you can see here that is detached from the basement membrane this that is the detached cell. okay so the 3g shows that is the, the extensive changes is there okay similarly that is the vascular degeneration and disc formation in the seminiferous epithelium okay so 3g shows that is the more marked change so there we have conducted that johnson test for babs score the normal in the compact that score will be was 10 and for the 2g it was 8 and 9 and for the 3g radiation exposed group showed that is the 7 and 9 only so we have published the result we have published that on this uh, the effect of cell phone radiation in the paper and come to the ovary there is no marked changes okay no significant changes in the that is the ovary because uh, that uh, the ovary is kept in the uh, in the abdomen and maybe due to the hormonal uh, effect so the ovary is we could not find any significant changes in the, the ovary okay we have done the sds page analysis okay we have found that is the intensities of the band significantly higher in 2g and the 3g exposed mice especially that is a the 97 kda protein expressions are decreased and 29 kda protein expressions are unregulated in the liver and kidney also in the kidney that 66 kda protein expresses higher level it all indicates that is a, the rf for induced damage the protein expression okay so we conclude the study with the following recommendation that it is logical to minimize the cell phone use especially in the children and the teenage till further research on long term exposure to the rfr confirm that is the that is the cell phone uh, radiation induced damage the hand free device we can use especially the bluetooth device we can use okay or the speaker mode we can use so please never use the cell phone close to the tower and similarly that is the when the signal strength is very low children can be allowed to use the play the uh, cell phone games and such a thing after putting in a that is the uh, in a uh, airplane mode okay there are some limitation to our studies we cannot directly extrapolate this outcome of the present study into the, the human population that will be limited because of many reason due to differences in the species the volume and size the life span and the anatomical organization of the tissue and the duration of the frequency and the intensity of the transmission and the shape and the shape of exposed organs and the water and the mineral content of the organ tissues and the distance from the radiation source so we recommend that more comparative study is also needed and uh, the now that is the, the already that is the 3g and the 4g studies has been done and the reversal of the that is the 
that is the uh, exposure whether the reversal of the changes has been done that everything has been studied now that option is we can go for the 5g cell phone and study on the animal tissues okay now come to the grass anatomy that is uh, just i will present the, the a few thing about the the variation in the upper abdominal organs you can you all can see that is, is the celiac tract okay it is typically the three branches that is the left gastric artery this is the splenic artery this is the common hepatic artery it will give the gastrointestinal artery and the proper hepatic artery from there that is the right gastric artery so here the right hepatic and the left hepatic the right hepatic artery gives the cystic artery in the calyx square that is a normal isn't it so here that is uh, this the, the knowledge of that is the vascular anatomy in the upper abdomen is very very essential for the clinicians to perform a that is a, a surgical procedure or the even angiogram on the what is that the, uh, the either this either this is the gastrectomy or the hepatectomy is very very important that is so the, the so the, the success of surgery is uh, solely rest on the vascular anatomy the first step to that is the encounter in colostectomy is the cystic cut so that is that much important is there for vascular anatomy in the abdominal organ so just i will few uh, present a few uh, that is a variation in the upper abdominal uh, blood organs that is the blood supply to them you can see here that is the this the celiac tract gives the left gastric artery see that is a, the the common hepatic artery this is a proper hepatic artery is going to give only the right hepatic artery a small tick it is that is the middle hepatic artery so the left hepatic artery is absent so the left hepatic artery is arising from the left gastric artery left gastric artery is going to supply stomach that is the gastric branch and the main contribution it is going through the hilum to reach to the that is the left lobe of the liver so this is called that is the replaced left hepatic artery okay so why like it why doing a gastrectomy please consider these replaced left hepatic artery should be intact please don't like it proper to that okay to the replaced left hepatic so please preserve that the soul that it is a replaced one it is soul that is the left lobe will be that is a uh, 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 based on that uh, blood supply of the replaced left hepatic part okay so this is similarly that is you can see here that is the celiac tract giving only two branches this is a post mortem solution that is the splenic artery and the left hepatic that is the splenic artery and the, this left hepatic artery is That's not giving a proper hepatic artery. See, that is the superior mesenteric artery is giving that the right hepatic artery. It is so it is replaced from that. That is the superior mesenteric artery. So it is the sole artery that is supplying the right lobe of the liver. Okay, so that is. See, that is the, this is the another thing. That is the, the celiac tract. So the common hepatic artery is going to end as the only the left hepatic artery. So the remaining branch is the gastrointestinal artery. So the right hepatic artery is not there. See, the superior mesenteric artery is giving the replaced right hepatic artery arising from the superior mesenteric artery, putting into the potato patties and going to supply that, giving the cystic artery and supplying that is the right lobe of the liver. See, the other thing that is the left gastric artery is going to supply that is the this is the gastric branch and the esophageal branch. Along with it, you can see there is another tick that is going to supply the left lobe of the liver. Already, that is the 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 common hepatic artery end up with only with the, that is the left hepatic artery the another left hepatic artery is arising here from here so this is called that is the accessory left hepatic artery okay so accessory to the main left hepatic artery so such a variation will be you should then go so here is the another one thing you can see that is a normal normal anatomical pattern only vascular pattern only but you can see here that is the, the right hepatic artery is making here that munigan hump or caterpillar hump from the hump that is the cystic artery is arising sometimes surgeon may mistakenly that is the ligator this that is the right of this right hepatic artery as a cystic artery especially if the caliber is uh, very less okay so this is this is a uh, within the triangle you have to identify the cystic artery trace it if it is a uh, that is a atrapular hump that is a uh, found out that is it is a right hepatic artery please don't like it this only artery should supply the right lobe of the liver this is similarly that is the munigan hump or the caterpillar hump a huge one okay from the hump the cystic artery is arising okay so this is the uh, angiographic studies you can see that is the, the replaced right hepatic arising from the superior mesenteric artery what we have seen in the it is the grass anatomy so this is the once again the celiac artery 
you can see that is there it is giving the left gastric artery giving the replaced left hepatic artery also there is you can see uh, that is the replaced left hepatic artery. okay so that is the angiography story so on to sum up my that is the presentation see that so this is a uh, our research in that that in the effect of cell phone radiation on the animal tissue that is uh, we have that is a uh, 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 notice in the public cassettes so that is uh, not public cassette in the that is a newspaper the new indian express our studies is, uh, the excess use of mobile during pregnancy and childbirth will be so this is the one message we have to convey to the community what we observed in the histological lab what is our findings in the translational research in anatomy in the histological lab the observations we turned into the intervention we are giving that is the conclusion to the community or the to, to the society please avoid that cell phone during the pregnancy and also in the early childhood so avoid that that is a that the damage in the brain kidney liver okay so we have presented that is our that is a, the variation in the uh, upper abdominal organ in the blood vessels we have published that will be a lot of citations are there and that will be great help to the surgeons radiologists and throw them throw their hands they are helping to the public the communities are getting that is the benefit okay so translational research in anatomy aims to that is uh, provide that anatomic knowledge to solve the real world medical problems and enhance the patient care through the improved diagnostics devices and the treatments and the medical procedures okay thank you if there is any doubt i can answer for a few minutes i think so thank you for patiently watching everyone thank you sir thank you sir thank you sir that was a wonderful session we have a query in the chat box sir i'll read out the question oh okay sir okay sir okay sir uh, we'll, i will answer him sir yes sir. okay sir okay thank you by dr shah jahan since the sir consistency varies among mobile brands and models the penet uh, and the penetration of radiation how are we going to measure during the process of experimentation sir sir actually that is uh, that each phone has its own sir sir that is the specific absorption rate when you are purchasing that mobile you have to concentrate on that who recommendation the sir value should be that is the one point uh, less than 1.69 for 10 grams so this is the cut off value so it is indicates that is the, the specific absorption rate for 10 gram of tissue when you are using a cell phone that radiation emitted from the cell phone it will be absorbed through the tissues so if it is a more specific absorption rate say that is more than that is the 2 and 3 it means your our body tissue is absorbing more radiation so that can be measured by that is the radiation frequency meter that is how much it has been absorbed that we can that is a measure especially that is on the surface that is in the topography superficial tissue we can measure but it is very difficult to measure in the deeper tissues sir thank you sir thank you sir thank you sir what is answered dr sukshan dr sukshan time to appreciate our resource person for today uh, we are really uh, thankful to you sir and we present okay. to you the e certificate and the memento for the resource person thank you sir thank you sir thank you very much it's also time to honor our chair person for today we also are happy to honor the e certificate to dr sukesh <laughs> Shantini Arun Sen. Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you for the opportunity to just to share my knowledge on the transition anatomy. Yes, thank you, sir. sir. Thank you, one and all. Thank you, all the participants and the organizers. Thank you, thank, thank you, you thank very you, much, sir. Thank you. Thank you.
Am I audible? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Just, uh, just a moment, sir. Can I share my screen or I'll wait? Sir, uh, your screen is visible, sir. You are visible, sir. Just be there, just waiting uh, for some technical aspects, sir. We'll just okay, wait. thank you. Yes, sir. Good afternoon all. Good afternoon all. Uh, once again, uh, good afternoon all. Today is day one, the fifth scientific uh, session talk today uh, by our eminent speaker, Dr. Nihar Ranjan Jana, who's a professor in the Department of Biosciences. He's going to present on the topic of Huntington's disease. Uh, for that, I would like to invite Dr. D. Amudraj, uh, as cha to share the session, Dr. T. N. Satya Prabha, who is also the another chair, uh, due to some uh, uh, unavoidable reasons, she is unable to join us now for this moment. So only Dr. Ramudraj will be chairing the session. Uh, now I would like to uh, introduce our uh, chairperson, Dr. D. Amudraj. I am very happy uh, to introduce such a humble person I met in my life and uh, who's one of a senior to me. Uh, I'm very happy to introduce sir. Uh, he has completed his MBBS and MD from JIPMA in 2010, and he has finished his uh, DNB physiology in 2011. He has completed ACME course, and he is level two anthropometrist from the International Society for Advancement of Canthrometry. And he has experience of uh, 13 years of postgraduate training and then his area of interest is research such as cardiovascular autonomy physiology, medical education, and medical instrument instrumentation. Sir is pioneering in his institute, and uh, he's very much interested in delivering the cardiovascular autonomy function testing as a patient care in his institute. I welcome you, sir. Now I would uh, request- Thank you. I would request Dr. Ramudraj, sir, to introduce our uh, speaker, sir. Okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Frank. Thank you for the very kind words that you have uh, given to me. And uh, at the outset, I would like to thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity to the chair the session on a very important uh, topic, that is the Huntington's uh, disease, which is an autosomal uh, dominant neurodegenerative uh, disease that is affecting a sizable amount of population in the world. And unfortunately, we don't have a cure for this disease. And, uh, you know, people are affected with moderate disabilities, cognitive disabilities, and many of them have got psychiatric illnesses also. And, uh, you know, uh, ultimately, we lose them. After a long period of battle, we lose these patients uh, either mostly to pneumonia, and sometimes, uh, I'm sorry to say, even to suicide. So it always, you know, cries for attention, and, uh, you know, it has been in the attention of the scientific researchers of the medical community for quite a long time. Even till now, we don't have a direct cure for this disease and uh, mostly, you know, it's all going to be after supportive symptomatic treatment of variable success. So really, we are in a junction where we need to look upon this disease. And for that, uh, you know, we are uh, calling a very befitting scientific uh, personality who is an expert in the field. Uh, you know, uh, none other than, you know, uh, our uh, professor, Dr. Nihar Ranjan Jana from uh, the Department of uh, Bioscience, IIT Karakpur. I take a great deal of pleasure in introducing uh, Sir uh, to the August Guardian audience here. Sir has uh, graduated from uh, Bindrapur uh, College and uh, he got his uh, post graduations uh, from uh, Calcutta University. He did his uh, PhD from Viswabharati University in the year uh, 1996. Then after that, Sir had an international exposure. He went to Japan, that is Raiken Brain Science Institute, and he has uh, done his postdoctoral work there. Then after returning to India, he has uh, entered in a very premier institute, that is the premier institute of the country for neurological uh, studies, that is the National Brain Research Center as a faculty in the year 2001. He served as a faculty there and uh, up to 2018, he has done a lot of pioneering work there. And then now he has moved to IIT Karakpur, where he has joined as professor in the School of Bioscience. 
so uh, Sarah has received a number of uh, awards for his uh, work in this uh, neurodegenerative uh, diseases and the list is uh, quite a big number. So uh, with this uh, introduction, I welcome our speaker, Dr. Nihar Ranjan Jana, uh, to deliver his uh, talk on Huntington's uh, disease from genetics to pathogenic mechanism. So the stage is yours, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So can I share now my slides or guys? Okay. Yes, sir. You can share the slide now, sir. So I can share the entire screen or I can share only my, I think I can share my presentation only. And uh, share screen, sir. Share After screen. opening your PPT, okay. you can uh, put it share oh. screen. Sir. All right. Yes, sir. And so I, I hope you can see my presentation, right? Yes, sir. You can go to slideshow, sir. All right. I think everything is fine. Yes, everything. All right. So, thank you very much for inviting me to give talk in this forum. So, probably, you know, all of you are probably hungry at this moment, probably waiting for the lunch. So, I will try to as brief as possible. Okay. So, so I am from IIT Kharagpur. So, just a few lines about the institute, our institute. So, I think all of you are familiar about uh, IIT Kharagpur. So, on the premier institute and on the top ranking institute in India both in education and research. And it has actually, you know, more than 60 department centers and schools. So you can understand how big it is. So if you see here my mouse point, so this is our actually newly constructed life science center. So all the people who works on basically biological field, so we all actually housed in here. And just to tell you that the ID product is also planning to start medical education shortly. So our, our hospital as well as uh, other buildings are almost ready. So we are trying to recruit people to start the program. Anyway, so with all this, uh, let me start my topic. So it's on Huntington's disease, where we I am actually working last maybe more than 20 years on this disease on a particular aspect. So before coming to my area of you know, expertise, let me briefly introduce about the disease and then the problem that we particularly focused on, right? So if you look at almost all age-related neurodegenerative disorders, you will find out one thing is very, very common. That's the pathological hallmark. And you can see here, that's the abnormal deposition of proteins. If you look at Alzheimer's disease, I'm sure all of you are very familiar about it. It's an amyloid plaque, which is extracellular. And you can see the neurofibrillary triangles, which is intracellular. Similarly, you can see in the case of Parkinson's disease, the Lewy body, which is extracellular, sorry, intracellular component, but cytoplasmic. And you can see also in the case of ALS and Huntington's disease, right? So there are a lot of debates going on for a long time about whether these abnormal protein aggregates can cause the neurodegeneration or not. There are completely two school of thoughts, and right now, most people believe that the aggregates, not the aggregates actually, is the early intermediates, which are actually kind of amyloid fibril like structure. You can see here on the center. So those are called the culprit. Okay, and they probably try to induce the degeneration, neurodegeneration uh, by a number of ways. So the goal, I mean, Sir, excuse me, sir. Sir, uh, your audio uh, feed has been cut. Sir. Is it better? Yeah, yes, sir. Now it's better, sir. So what the, the current knowledge in this field is, this the aggregates or mostly the early intermediates are actually confer toxic gain of functions through a number of mechanisms that ultimately leads to neuro dysfunctions or neurodegeneration. So in my lab, what we do actually, we use Huntington's disease as a model system to understand how these abnormal proteins can induce neuronal dysfunction and neurodegeneration. So that's the problem, uh, that's the today's topic. So you know all, already, I mean, the, the, the already earlier person has introduced about the disease. So, so it is an autosomal dominant inherited neurodegenerative disorder and this is actually first discovered by George Huntington. You can understand this is 1872, more than 150 years ago. And that time, if you can read here, he described 
this is one of the incurable disease. And see, after 150 years, it is still incurable. Although there are a lot of progress have been made, but there is no therapy. I mean, real therapy is exist. All right. So now, if you think about the behavioral phenotypes or the typical you know, phenotypes or the problems that clinical problems that if you see, it at least three components actually primarily affected. So initial stage is maybe psychiatric problem followed by cognitive as well as motor problem. But over the time, the motor problems are so severe. It's typically called the classically is named is the Huntington's chorea. And it's very difficult for a patient to perform day-to-day -day activity. And this motor problem that classically in medical jargon is called the chorea, Huntington's chorea, is actually happens, this kind of involuntary movement because the specific regions of the brain uh, is actually affected. You can see my mouse point. This is, a, this is actually called, you know, called and putamen area. As you can see, in a, in a hunting the patient, it's almost not there. You can see if you see uh, compared with the control. And because of the loss of that area, or more selectively, it is the loss of you know, medium spiny inhibitor neurons. And because of that loss, you see the involuntary movement that the classically called chorea. So now, as I told you, this is an autosomal dominantly inherited disorder. So people are desperately looked for what is the gene that causes this problem? What is the gene or gene mutation that causes this problem? And in 1993, the first disease causing gene actually discovered by a, it's called Huntington Disease Collaborative Research Group. It's multiple peoples are involved. And one of the pioneering lady, I, I'll talk about the next slides, how she, become I mean, so popular and how she explored these things in a very general population. Let's first try to understand that discovered or the gene is actually called HD genes or Huntington's disease gene. It also another name, it's called IT15 gene. So IT stands for interesting transcript. So, so that's why I'm telling people might be, it will be easy for maybe person to remember. And this is one of the largest gene in a human genome. There's a multiple exons and introns, okay? And if you look at the mutation, that is also pretty interesting. So what sometimes we think is a point mutations or deletion, this kind of, it's not that kind of mutation. It's a mutation of abnormal expansion of a triplet codon. I hope everybody are familiar about what is codon. So a codon here is the CAG repeat, which codes for glutamine. So the mutation here is the abnormal expansion of CAG repeat in a coding region of this Huntington gene. So in normal individuals, the CAG repeat is highly polymorphic. Like in all of our normal individuals, repeat length might vary from 8 to 29. While in case of disease, it must be greater than 40 CAG repeats. So if somebody is having CAG repeats about 40, he or she might get the disease say about 60, 65 years of age. And there is a direct correlation between the repeat length and the onset of the disease. If you look at the graph here, so get at the repeat length, you can get early age of onset. So in actual genetics, there's a classic problem which is called anticipation, which explains that the successive generation of the affected family is actually experienced early age of onset. Like if I have the CG repeat 40, and I get the disease say around 65 years of age, my next generation, my next progeny, might get the disease much early age, say about 60 years of age, and the repeat length would be high. This is typically called anticipation. All right, so that's what 1993 Gina was discovered, and then there is a huge progress in understanding the disease biology, and in 1996, there's a first animal model of hunting the disease appear. It's actually made by Gillian Bates from United Kingdom. And the first, actually, this is one of the first not the transgenic mice model for any neurological disorder you can think about, the fast model system. And that mice actually showed a lot of behavioral abnormalities that are very, very similar like a Huntington patient can exhibit. So I'll just show you the video of Huntington patient. You can just sort of think about how the chorea looks like. It's an advanced stage of a disease. You can see how the abnormal movement can happen. Anyway, uh, so I told you the 1996, there's a fast animal model appear and which recapitulates most of the problem, clinical problem that a Huntington patient can exhibit. And the subsequent year, in 1997, first report came 
that the mutant gene, or another way, the mutant protein is actually from aggregates. You can see here, this is the transgenic mice brain. That's first discover, I first generated transgenic mice brain if you look at my mouse point. You can see every cell neurons have aggregates inside the nucleus. So this is 1997, same beyond Gates group. And if you simply introduce this mutant gene inside the mammalian cells, you can see here, this is the normal repeat length, normal CAG repeat length. And you can see here is a mutant protein, which has 150 CAG repeats. And you can see it from aggregates inside the cell. And subsequently, people have looked at you know, patient brain. And actually 2000, much later, people have demonstrated <laughs> that the mutant hunting gene actually form aggregates in Huntington disease patient. All right, so, so with this, I'll just go give you some idea which could be very interesting or could be, you know, for, for, for young student, it's very inspiring about the discovery of this gene. I told you that the gene actually one of the instrumental, the lady who was instrumental in discovering this gene, her name is, you see here, Nancy Wexler. You know, her mother was affected with Huntington's disease. So she knew because it's an autosomal dominant mode of inheritance, she knew she has a 50% chance to get the disease. But still, she didn't lose the hope. She was desperately looking for the cause of the disease, the gene that is involved for the disease. She went to the Venezuela. In Venezuela, there's an area called Lake Maracaibo area, where almost every family was affected with Huntington disease. So we went there, collected the blood sample, and that actually led to the discovery of the gene. So there's a series of papers our lab published, and also other people have published. But unfortunate story actually came in 2020, not very far away. So the first report came, and the report was that she was affected with the Huntington's disease. So you understand? At the age of 74 years. So you understand she discovered the gene and did a lot of groundbreaking work. And at the end of the day, she was suffering from the same disease. I wrote a line here that's very, 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 I mean, touchy story, of course, if you go and read. She never did take any genetic test that resulted from her own research. Can you believe this? So I hope this could be very, very inspiring for the young students, medical students, to think and to take, I mean, research as their integral part, which actually and seriously lacking in our country, in India. Most I mean, medical students actually go for their profession. Very few of them take the job I mean, as a responsibility as a researcher. Well, so with this, let me try to introduce the work that we try to follow up. So this, after the discovery of the genes, there are n number of models actually generated, including the animal models. So this is all the model that we use in our lab, the cellular model. So here we introduce the gene, normal gene and the mutant gene inside the mammalian cell. The system is, is called inducible system. The idea is normal condition cell will not die because you can't express the protein. When you want to express this mutant protein, you can induce with a particular inducer. The gene will be expressed, protein will be aggregated and cell will die. So this is how we can maintain the cell. So this is a stable cell line. All right, so there's another model. I mean, this is the model actually fast generated. So we have this mice. This is, the, this is often called the Bates, Gillian Bates mice, because she is the person first generated this transgenic mice. So if you look at the milestone of the disease, so you see about, first of all, this mice is generated, the transgenic mice with 120 CAG repeat. It's a little bit higher than what you usually see in case of patient, right, human uh, patient. But you see the disease progression actually started, like if you see about four to five months of age, five weeks of age, the first aggregates begins. And the, the cognitive and motor problem or psychiatric problem begins around eight weeks of age. And then the progression happens very rapidly. So eight, 10 to 12 weeks, this range, disease become very, very progressively increased severity. And then by 120, 130 days, animal mostly die. So I'll just show you one of the simple, very simple behavioral parameters that anybody can do without any expensive equipment. You just hold the tail of the mice. So first I'm showing the normal mice. You see how it looks. So all four legs were most touching in the four different directions. 
Now, if you look at a Huntington disease mice, you see all four legs are coming together. This is a problem, or this is a phenomenon often called clasping. And this happens because of the damage or the dysfunctions of the basal ganglia. Typically, you can correlate this phenotype with a chorea that happens in patient. All right. And you can see the mice, you can see frequently the motor movement and also sometimes the seizures. You can see the seizures happens in these mice. You see, the seizure happens. So this is the model system that we use to understand how these aggregates that I demonstrated can cause the neurodegeneration. Now let's try to understand the problem that I try to, my lab try to you know, investigate. So you have seen these aggregates, almost every cells or every neurons have these aggregates and that is in the nucleus. It's a very classic problem. So now the question comes, here we detected this, you know, the immunohistic of the staining of these aggregates by using a general marker, that's ubiquitin. So ubiquitin is a kind of a generic marker for any abnormal proteins, aggregates. So now we can think about if a, any abnormal proteins are detected by this ubiquitin, we simply, you can think or indicates the, the proteins or cells actually trying to degrade these abnormal proteins through a mechanism that is shown in the right side called ubiquitin proteasome system or autophagy. So if that happens, if cells are trying to clear these abnormal proteins, the question comes, then why the form over the time? Is this that the cellular that the control mechanism, the degrading controlling mechanism is failed. So that is the questions that my lab is last 20 years is trying to explore. So the question that we address, how this abnormal failure or abnormal degradation actually happens or why cell cannot degrade this abnormal protein inside the cell, in neurons. That's the mechanism that we are trying to explore. I hope you understand what question that we are trying to address. Now, if you understand that, how can you understand or how can you address this problem? So if you look at this ubiquitin proteasome systems, it's a very complicated pathway. I'm not going to describe that, but just look at the first phase that's called ubiquitin cycle, required three enzymes. There's a single E1 enzyme, but there are multiple E2, you can see here, conjugating enzyme, and E3, which is the ligase. This might be boring for many of you. Okay, so, but just think about the single E1, but there's multiple E2 and E3. This E3 is the ligase, ubiquitin ligase. And in any cell, you might expect 800 to thousands of different E3 ubiquitin ligase exist. It's not a single one. So I don't remember, there could be 800 to thousands of ubiquitin ligase in a single cell. So when I joined to you know, National Brain Research Center in 2001, my project was to identify which is this among this 800 or 1000 ligase, which is the ligase or which the multiple ligase could be, which are the ligase that are involved in ubiquitinism of this abnormal protein. Okay. And we identified, I'll go forward. So we identified a ligase which named ubiquitin ligase, which is called UBE3A, quite uncommon probably for most of you. It's a ubiquitin ligase. I'll explain one by one what it does. But you look at slide here, just to show you here that this ligase is, is associated with this, you know, abnormal aggregates that are found because of the mutant Huntington, not only in the cellular model that I described, also in the Huntington disease transmitting mice. You can see every, almost every aggregates are actually recruited with this ligase, which indirectly suggests that this ligase might be involved in the ubiquitination of this abnormal hunting team. So we dissected out, I'm not talking about, we dissected extensively and we find out that this ligase indeed involved in the clearance or in the degradations of this mutant hunting team. Okay, but because of the length of the mutation or maybe to CJ repeat, if the length of the CJ repeat or in other way you can think about when it translated into the protein, the length of the glutamine is high, the, this, this ligase would find hard to degrade them. If the length of the polygonomine is shorter, ev 3 can degrade it much faster, while if the length is larger, it can take more time. But it does in degrades. 
So now if you look at the Huntington disease mice sample, you see the different part of the brain. What we noticed is this ligase is, is dramatically low, protein level. The active level of this ligase, if you look at here, wild type versus disease mice, wild type versus disease mice, every part of the brain, if you look at the level, the protein level of this ligase is dramatically dropped compared to the RNA level. RNA level is almost nothing all the time. I mean, his expression level is not changed while his protein level is changed, which indirectly indicates the ligase activity is almost gone. And that could be, that time we try to explain because it might be recruited to the aggregates. So going to the insoluble fractions. So most soluble active ubiquitin ligase, EB3A, is probably not accessible to this mutant protein for the clearance. So that's why probably aggregates are forming as you patient goes older and older. All right. So now, so you might have any questions about what is this protein about? What is this EB3A? I told you it's very, a very unusual name. Well, I'll say, of course, it's a ubiquitin ligase. And another fascinating aspect of this, because my subsequent slide will explain that, is imprinted in the neuron. What does it mean? So it's the paternal copy in our brain. So if you look at almost all of the genes, it's a maternal copy and a paternal copy, both are biologically expressed. But in this case, this UB3A is actually maternally no, expressed which means the paternal copy is actually silenced, epigenetically silenced in the neuron. I hope I'm able to explain it. In all of our brains, or in other we can think, in all of our neurons, if you think about EB3A, it is the mother's copy that is expressed. Mother's copy is epigenetically silenced. I hope this problem is clear. And then now we can look at if there is a loss or defect or mutation in the mother's copy, there's a developmental disorder, which is called Angelman syndrome. I'm sure many of the medical students might have heard this name. It's a developmental disorder, which shows learning and memory deficiency. And recently, people have shown if there is an overexpression of UB3A, there could be chance of the child might get autism. So you understand how or the importance of this ligase. Other than neurodegeneration, it has heavily linked but it is heavily linked with developmental disorder. I hope with this, we can go much forward. So our intention, what I told you, or what I showed you, this ligase is involved in the degradation of mutant hunting. So what next we can do? So what next we actually did, this is just to show you the imprinting thing happens. If you look at here, we have another mice, that's called EB3 maternal deficient mice, or maternally knocked out mice, where you can see there's a clear absence of this ligase. I hope it's clear. That's what I've talked, I was explaining the imprinting phenomena. You see the normal brain, normal mice brain, EB3 is expressed and it's pretty nuclear, localized. But once you maternally knocked out, you only knocked out the maternal copy genetically. Maternal copy is there, right? But that is epigenetically silence. That makes absolutely absence of expression of EB3 in the neuron. You have to understand it can express everywhere in the body, but you get a restricted knockout in the neuron. I hope that problem is clear. If you are clear of this, then it's easy to, for you to understand what we did next. What we did actually, our goal is to generate a Huntington disease mice where ub 3 is knocked out. Is that clear? That's our idea. Idea is if you remove the ub 3 from a Huntington disease mice, what would be the phenotype? And you can expect if it is degrades the mutant protein, then, then the disease progression will be much faster. That's what you can hypothesize. Is that going to happen or not? So we use that typical imprinting strategy. So you see there's a male hunting for disease mice crossed with female this EB3 maternal knockout mice. And then you do all sets of screening. It's very complicated ways you have to screen. And then you will find a group of mice, group of hunting for disease mice, where UB3A is knocked out. You can see this last layer. That's the characterized. Fine if you are not okay, okay, but just simply think we have generated a Huntington disease mice from where UB3A is selectively knocked out in the neuron. I hope that's clear. And even then look at the phenotype. This is, if you look at this, this back bar, black, black line, this is the typical lifespan of a Huntington disease mice. They can survive hardly 
120 days maximum, right? But if you knocked out, this is the knocked out, TB3 knocked out Huntington disease mice, if you knocked out from the neuron only, you see the lifespan is almost half. By 60 days, they're all dead. Which indirectly suggests that this, this ligase is playing very, very important role, crucial role, you know, to some extent. And then you can see in body weight, that also dramatically dropped compared to a normal hunting disease mice. All right. So then you can look at some of the behavioral phenotype, whether the behavior of these hunting disease mice are, are really aggravated or not. I'll just show you the same clasping video, which I showed you earlier. You just see, I think it's going to work. All right, don't never mind. I think I think there is a problem of link probably. All right. Can you hear me? Yes, I, sir. You're audible, sir. I am audible, but I guess there is some problem of video. Oh, either my I think I lost my link, right? Yes, sir. Oh. So what I do need to do? Sir, you can restart your uh, presentation, sir, slide, and then you can share it. Reshare, sir, you can reshare. Yeah. Can we uh, switch off the timer for time being? Yes, sir, we'll do that. Yeah. Sorry, due to some technical error, he's got, he got logged out, sir. He has joined again. Sir, is, oh. uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Sir, is it okay now? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. But I still cannot see the pop up window. Oh, let me try. I cannot see my. In the share is, slide is there, right? Yes, sir. The screen is already yeah. shared, sir. You can... We are able to see your screen, sir. Okay. I am not able to. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Put in slides from home. So it is now okay, right? Yes, yes. Yes, sir. Maximize the screen. All right. So I stopped it here. So I think I will not show the video. So I think that's here's the problem. So what I am trying to explain is the motor behavior or motor phenotype of these mice, that EBC deficient Huntington disease mice, is actually more, more, and more severe. All right. So if I, I think this is working now. So if you look at the simple order of test, this is actually the Huntington disease mice. Sorry, this one. See, it's fall down. It's the EBC deficient Huntington disease mice. And this is the only Huntington disease mice which will perform much better than the earlier mice. 
all right so i was so bit and then you know, we did lot of you know, molecular studies which uh, i'm just showing few of them one of the interesting things that we should be seeing is there is not a single neurons in this mice diet i mean that by apoptosis or necrosis whatever you say it's very interesting not a single neuron you see all those absurd I and mean, behavioral problems which is very severe and mice dying also but not a single neuron actually died so what we noticed that's such surprising for us what we noticed is only the neuronal architecture you can see here neuronal arborization or the, 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 the dendritic branchings those are actually severely affected and that probably leads to the, the behavioral abnormalities and probably subsequently die in many of the mice die with epileptic seizure and this is what actually we wanted to see see look at here this is a p symptomatic hd mice we just started showing aggregates very early stage about 43 days old mice you can see few of the aggregates in the nucleus but you see that ev3 deficient mice where you can see the aggregates number is quite high in the different part of the brain which indirectly kind of suggests or indicates that this ligase is involved in the clearance or degradation of Newton Huntington. I hope that's that's clear for I mean to everyone. So we have an in vivo proof in animal model that this ligase can be able to clear this. Well, so with that, then we again next went forward. So we actually try to screen some of the drugs, some of the molecules, which can actually target CV3. All right. So there are a lot of failures, so that we cannot show now. We actually screened a lot of library, chemical library. And I'll just show you one of the compounds which somehow it worked. And that's one of the molecules you can see here called azadiradione. Its significance is this molecule is present inside highly concentrated in the neem seed in our you know, medicinal plant neem, we all know. And the seed of neem seeds actually have high level of azadiradione. It's very accidental study, so I mean findings. So you can see here, the EV3 level actually increased on, in the cell lines once we add these molecules. So then we went ahead to study in, in animal model, the Huntington disease mice model. And you can see here, the level of EV3A in wild time mice also increased as well as in Huntington disease mice. You look at, this is the Huntington disease mice, three mice, you can see here, the level of EV3A is quite low. That I showed you earlier. And also some part, Called some molecule called DAP32 is also significantly low. That's the material, but if you look at the as a data data treated mice, hunting the disease mice, you see the level is, is rescued quite normal level. And that's the proof. Even you might have doubt whether this molecule can cross the blood brain barrier or not, but it simply can tell this molecule cross the blood brain barrier. Well, then we also did some behavioral studies, it's not that dramatic changes, but you see they're easy. If you look at this black bar, which actually shows the body weight gradually decrease in case of Huntington disease mice. But if you see this drug treated mice, the dose is about 10 milligram per kg body weight. This typically rescued the body weight. And also, that's the most interesting thing that you might be looking at is the body, I mean, the lifespan. If you look at the black bar, that's the typical lifespan for a Huntington disease mice. And this drug treated mice has significant improvement of the lifespan. So this is kind of very, very exciting for us because we have not really optimized much because we only used two doses, 10 milligram and 20 milligram. And we could see much better in case of 20 milligram, uh, but uh, we need much more extensive studies to show that there's not much toxicity of this drug in the mice and that could be much more safer. So that, that those works, uh, still we need to conduct much more extensive ways but at least this findings is clearly pointing out with a mechanism that this molecule is increasing the level of EBTA and that might be involved in the clearance enhanced clearance of the mutant hunting team and ultimately leading to extended lifespan so this is my last slide this is the future i mean you can think about this molecule could be a potential you know, therapeutic molecule that we are looking for. Let's see. And uh, this is a summary I already told you. I think I should not explain, but just briefly tell about that we have identified a UBTA, is an important ligase, which 
not only could be useful in case of Huntington's disease, the abnormal protein clearance, this could also be involved in other diseases like Alzheimer's or even Parkinson's or ALS. So that's that's the implications. And then at the end, we find out a small molecules which have, I mean, for Indian context, has a huge importance, could be involved in, in, in treating this kind of, you know, disease which has no, almost no you know, therapeutic, uh, yeah, yeah, important drugs that can cure the disease or, or halt or slow the disease progress. So with this, I'll, I'll stop my talk. And this is just to acknowledge my funding agencies and all the collaborators, everything. I just mentioned, I think, our, who introduced me. So I, I was working around 19 years in this institute. It's a beautiful institute, beautiful campus in very close to Delhi. And this is my new building where I, I am now working. So thank you very much for for your attention, and I'm sure all of you are probably hungry, so I just probably waiting for for the lunch. Well, thank so you, I'm done. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much, sir. I think uh, today we have something uh, new take home message of UB3A, sir. Uh, now I request uh, the chairperson, Dr. Amudraj, sir, uh, to give his comments and queries, sir. Uh, thank, thank you very much, sir. Thanks for the very enlightening uh, talk. Actually, so far we have been uh, very indirectly looking only at the cytoplasmic inclusion, that is the Huntington, and you have taken us from that into a totally a new different uh, mistake. So, uh, sir, as a, um, uh, not as a chairperson alone, but even as a common delegate, uh, what are the different techniques that a person has to uh, uh, you know, upgrade himself to do this kind of studies? So what are the what are the techniques that he has to learn? Well, first thing is animal behavior. So you have seen that that's, that's not very complicated. I think very simple tales that we use to study the motor deficits, like rotor rot, clasping, then gait analysis. These are very common, routinely used techniques that anybody can use, and it's not so difficult. That's the first part. And second part is the molecular tools that sometimes may be difficult because. Once you try to maintain the mice, just to maintain the mice without any experiment, you need the genotyping. So you have to cut the tail, extract the DNA, then do a PCR. That's the regular tools you need to think which mice is your transgenic mice, which mice is your old mice, I mean, normal mice. Then you have to do a lot of molecular tools that commonly what we use. It's not an expensive things. I mean, there's very routinely used molecular and biochemical techniques that we use like Western blot. RT-PCR, real-time PCR, immunistic chemical staining. This is a very common. I think everybody is familiar about that. So, uh, usually many of our MBBA students, they used to come and ask, sir, is there a facility in our uh, country or nearby where uh, for a summer uh, uh, vacation, we can go and learn few techniques and come? So, is there anything like that in NBRC? Uh, I think NBRC has that. NBRC has a program with even doctors. Actually, with the AIMS Delhi, they used to have a program. So MBBS or even the MD students used to come to the NBRC for a, for a few days for their experience. And then they could have experience and then could go back. There was actually formal training. Now I think that stopped, but, but certainly MBBS students can even come. Actually in my lab, there are three or four MBBS students did PhD. And one of them actually from, two of them actually from Neiman's bank. They did from there and uh, they did PhD in our lab. So there are people, even in MBRC, there are other than this, you have a imaging facility, you have a fMRI, so that also you can give a different experience. Certainly you are, you can, you are most welcome to visit MBRC. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, uh, Dr. Frank, if there is any question from the audience, we can ask, sir, otherwise we can collect it. Uh, no, sir, uh, there is no questions from the audience, sir. Uh, thank you, Chairperson, sir. Thank you, Speaker, sir. For uh, another thank you for opening the observership uh, those for the MBBS students to NBRC, sir. I think uh, there were many applications will be waiting to uh, come as an observership, sir. And uh, now I, uh, uh, so for this beautiful talk, now we, we would like to appreciate you with an uh, e-certificate and then virtual memento, sir. Thank you. Thank, thank you, sir. <laughs> I would also now uh, like to appreciate our uh, chairperson, Dr. Mudraj, sir, who is a family member of our uh, conference team. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you. Thank you, one and all. Uh, now, there will be a lunch session. And uh, post-lunch, we will uh, rejoin the conference with uh, 
YRS presentation, Young Research Scholar presentations, and the oral free paper presentations today. The links have been dispatched separately into the group. Please kindly join in the specific links. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you very much.
welcome to Vinayaka Mission Screw where education meets healthcare excellence our academic landscape spans across 13 colleges and 11 schools situated in four vibrant campuses we are proud to serve the union territory of puducherry and extend our reach to selam and chengalpet districts in tamil nadu pioneers in private medical education we established the first private medical college in puducherry back in 2000 Today we operate two medical colleges in Puducherry where we provide healthcare services to an astonishing 4.5 lakh outpatients and over 50,000 inpatients annually. We manage nine rural health centers where we attend to approximately 1,000 patients every day ensuring quality healthcare for all. And now as we embark on our next level in healthcare We are proud to introduce the Vinayaka Karkinos Oncology Institute or VCOI in collaboration with Karkinos Healthcare. Karkinos Healthcare is a purpose-driven, technology-led oncology platform revolutionizing cancer care in India with a primary focus on early detection, precise diagnosis, patient care and groundbreaking research. Through setting up of the Vinayaka Karkinos Oncology Institute The aim is to bring comprehensive cancer care closer to the communities under the distributed cancer care network. Our mission: early detection programs through community screening programs, identifying high-risk patients and guiding them throughout their entire care journey. The facility will be equipped with state-of-the-art diagnosis and treatment options. An as part of our commitment to the people of Puducherry, Vinayaka Karkinos Oncology Institute aims to screen nearly 1 lakh population within the next few months. This collaboration between Karkinos Healthcare and Vinayaka Missions Group, including Vinayaka Missions Research Foundation, in setting up of the Vinayaka Karkinos Oncology Institute, Vicoy in Puducherry and Salem, shall be a testament. where education research and affordable and accessible cancer care come together for a brighter healthier future
Welcome to Vinayaka Missions Group, where education meets healthcare excellence. Our academic landscape spans across 13 colleges and 11 schools, situated in four vibrant campuses. We are proud to serve the Union Territory of Puducherry and extend our reach to Salem and Chengalpet districts in Tamil Nadu. Pioneers in private medical education. We established the first private medical college in Puducherry back in 2000. Today, we operate two medical colleges in Puducherry, where we provide healthcare services to an astonishing 4.5 lakh outpatients and over 50,000 inpatients annually. We manage nine rural health centers, where we attend to approximately 1,000 patients every day, ensuring quality healthcare for all. And now, as we embark on our next level in healthcare, we are proud to introduce the Vinayaka Karkinos Oncology Institute, or VCOI, in collaboration with Karkinos Healthcare. Karkinos Healthcare is a purpose-driven, technology-led oncology platform, revolutionizing cancer care in India. With a primary focus on early detection, precise diagnosis, patient care, and groundbreaking research. Through setting up of the Vinayaka Karkinos Oncology Institute, the aim is to bring comprehensive cancer care closer to the communities under the distributed cancer care network. Our mission, early detection programs through community screening programs, identifying high-risk patients and guiding them throughout their entire care journey. The facility will be equipped with state-of-the-art diagnosis and treatment options. And as part of our commitment to the people of Puducherry, Vinayaka Karkinos Oncology Institute aims to screen nearly one lakh population within the next few months. This collaboration between Karkinos Healthcare and Vinayaka Missions Group, including Vinayaka Missions Research Foundation, in setting up of the Vinayaka Karkinos Oncology Institute, Vikoi in Puducherry and Salem, shall be a testament where education, research and affordable and accessible cancer care come together for a brighter, healthier future.
Welcome to Vinayaka Missions Group, where education meets healthcare excellence. Our academic landscape spans across 13 colleges and 11 schools, situated in four vibrant campuses. We are proud to serve the Union Territory of Puducherry and extend our reach to Salem and Jingle Pate districts in Tamil Nadu. Pioneers in private medical education. We established the first private medical college in Puducherry back in 2000. Today, we operate two medical colleges in Puducherry, where we provide healthcare services to an astonishing 4.5 lakh outpatients and over 50,000 inpatients annually. We manage nine rural health centers, where we attend to approximately 1,000 patients every day, ensuring quality healthcare for all. And now, as we embark on our next level in healthcare, we are proud to introduce the Vinayaka Karkinos Oncology Institute or VCOI in collaboration with Karkinos Healthcare. Karkinos Healthcare is a purpose-driven, technology-led oncology platform revolutionizing cancer care in India with a primary focus on early detection, precise diagnosis, patient care and groundbreaking research. Through setting up of the Vinayaka Karkinos Oncology Institute, the aim is to bring comprehensive cancer care closer to the communities under the distributed cancer care network. Our mission, early detection programs through community screening programs, identifying high-risk patients and guiding them throughout their entire care journey. The facility will be equipped with state-of-the-art diagnosis and treatment options. And as part of our commitment to the people of Puducherry, Vinayaka Karkinos Oncology Institute aims to screen nearly one lakh population within the next few months. 
This collaboration between Carquinos Healthcare and Vinayaka Missions Group, including Vinayaka Missions Research Foundation, in setting up of the Vinayaka Carquinos Oncology Institute, Vikoy in Puducherry and Salem, shall be a testament where education, research, and affordable and accessible cancer care come together for a brighter, healthier future.
Welcome to Vinayaka Missions Group, where education meets healthcare excellence. Our academic landscape spans across 13 colleges and 11 schools, situated in four vibrant campuses. We are proud to serve the Union Territory of Puducherry and extend our reach to Salem and Jingalpate districts in Tamil Nadu. Pioneers in private medical education. We established the first private medical college in Puducherry back in 2000. Today, we operate two medical colleges in Puducherry, where we provide healthcare services to an astonishing 4.5 lakh outpatients and over 50,000 inpatients annually. We manage nine rural health centers, where we attend to approximately 1,000 patients every day, ensuring quality healthcare for all. And now, as we embark on our next level in healthcare, we are proud to introduce the Vinayaka Karkinos Oncology Institute or VCOI in collaboration with Karkinos Healthcare. Karkinos Healthcare is a purpose-driven, technology-led oncology platform revolutionizing cancer care in India with a primary focus on early detection, precise diagnosis, patient care and groundbreaking research. Through setting up of the Vinayaka Karkinos Oncology Institute, the aim is to bring comprehensive cancer care closer to the communities under the distributed cancer care network. Our mission, early detection programs through community screening programs, identifying high-risk patients and guiding them throughout their entire care journey. The facility will be equipped with state-of-the-art diagnosis and treatment options. And as part of our commitment to the people of Puducherry, Vinayaka Karkinos Oncology Institute aims to screen nearly 1 lakh population within the next few months. This collaboration between Karkinos Healthcare and Vinayaka Missions Group, including Vinayaka Missions Research Foundation, in setting up of the Vinayaka Karkinos Oncology Institute, Vikoi in Puducherry and Salem, shall be a testament where education, research and affordable and accessible cancer care come together for a brighter, healthier future.
Welcome to Vinayaka Missions Group, where education meets healthcare excellence. Our academic landscape spans across 13 colleges and 11 schools, situated in four vibrant campuses. We are proud to serve the Union Territory of Puducherry and extend our reach to Salem and Jingle Pate districts in Tamil Nadu. Pioneers in private medical education. We established the first private medical college in Puducherry back in 2000. Today, we operate two medical colleges in Puducherry, where we provide healthcare services to an astonishing 4.5 lakh outpatients and over 50,000 inpatients annually. We manage nine rural health centers, where we attend to approximately 1,000 patients every day, ensuring quality healthcare for all. And now, as we embark on our next level in healthcare, we are proud to introduce the Vinayaka Karkinos Oncology Institute, or VCOI, in collaboration with Karkinos Healthcare. Karkinos Healthcare is a purpose-driven, technology-led oncology platform, revolutionizing cancer care in India. With a primary focus on early detection, precise diagnosis, patient care, and groundbreaking research. Through setting up of the Vinayaka Karkinos Oncology Institute, the aim is to bring comprehensive cancer care closer to the communities under the distributed cancer care network. Our mission, early detection programs through community screening programs, identifying high-risk patients and guiding them throughout their entire care journey. The facility will be equipped with state-of-the-art diagnosis and treatment options. And as part of our commitment to the people of Puducherry, Vinayaka Karkinos Oncology Institute aims to screen nearly 1 lakh population within the next few months. This collaboration between Karkinos Healthcare and Vinayaka Missions Group, including Vinayaka Missions Research Foundation, in setting up of the Vinayaka Karkinos Oncology Institute, Vikoi in Puducherry and Salem, shall be a testament where education, research and affordable and accessible cancer care come together for a brighter, healthier future.
Welcome to Vinayaka Missions Group, where education meets healthcare excellence. Our academic landscape spans across 13 colleges and 11 schools, situated in four vibrant campuses. We are proud to serve the Union Territory of Puducherry and extend our reach to Salem and Chengalpet districts in Tamil Nadu. Pioneers in private medical education. We established the first private medical college in Puducherry back in 2000. Today, we operate two medical colleges in Puducherry, where we provide healthcare services to an astonishing 4.5 lakh outpatients and over 50,000 inpatients annually. We manage nine rural health centers, where we attend to approximately 1,000 patients every day, ensuring quality healthcare for all. And now, as we embark on our next level in healthcare, we are proud to introduce the Vinayaka Karkinos Oncology Institute, or VCOI, in collaboration with Karkinos Healthcare. Karkinos Healthcare is a purpose-driven, technology-led oncology platform, revolutionizing cancer care in India. With a primary focus on early detection, precise diagnosis, patient care, and groundbreaking research. Through setting up of the Vinayaka Karkinos Oncology Institute, the aim is to bring comprehensive cancer care closer to the communities under the distributed cancer care network. Our mission, early detection programs through community screening programs, identifying high-risk patients and guiding them throughout their entire care journey. The facility will be equipped with state-of-the-art diagnosis and treatment options. And as part of our commitment to the people of Puducherry, Vinayaka Karkinos Oncology Institute aims to screen nearly one lakh population within the next few months. This collaboration between Karkinos Healthcare and Vinayaka Missions Group, including Vinayaka Missions Research Foundation, in setting up of the Vinayaka Karkinos Oncology Institute, Vikoi in Puducherry and Salem, shall be a testament where education, research and affordable and accessible cancer care come together for a brighter, healthier future. Hello. Hello. Good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon. We'll start in another two minutes. Okay, fine. Hello. Hello. Oh, yes, sir. Hello. So this is a... Hello. Hello, sir. Can you hear me? I'm able to hear. I'm able to hear. Yeah, actually, I sent my people to your email address. They haven't said from uh, share the screen. Yeah, uh, we are doing it. Ganesh Babu, uh, 370.3. Yeah, yeah, I'll do it. 
are you understood sir got the mail sir yeah welcome you all for this yrs faculty presentation yes sir hello sir yeah sir there there is no uh, share the screen option here so how are we going to share the ppts your name no yeah one minute Uh, One minute, I'll promote it to panelist group so that you can get that option. Okay, okay, thank So when are the presentations going to get started? Yeah. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, ma'am. When are the presentations going to get yeah, started? Yeah, we are starting right away. Some uh, technical problem. We have with uh, with us for YRS faculty presentation three judges, Dr. Shivli Lassi, Professor, Department of Anatomy, okay. Siddhartha Medical College. Welcome, ma'am. Good afternoon, sir. Thank you. We have Dr. Ponnu Dali, Professor and Head, Department of Biochemistry, Vinaya Mission, Kurbanath Dwar Medical College, Salem. Welcome, you, ma'am. Thank. Thank you, sir. Hello. And we have. Third judge, Dr. S. Ravi Kumar, Associate Professor, Head, Department of Biotechnology, AVMC, Pondicherry. Welcome, you, sir. Sir, you're there. Yes, sir, is there. I will start with the first presentation from Anatomy. Shah Sumaya Jam. Are you ready, ma'am? Yes, sir. You have the sharing option, sir. Sir, could you please? I I don't have the share option, sir. I have already shared my PPT with you through the mail. Could you please share that? Yeah. Then give me some uh, two minutes, ma'am. Uh, yes, sir. Doctor Priya, and Marina. there is no video option as well, where I could turn on my video. If it's not necessary, then it's okay. No, I'll see. I'll see to that. I'll. Uh, We'll call the next participant, uh, Priya Marina. Yes, sir. You're there with your PPT, ma'am. Uh, I have also emailed my PPT. If it is to be shared, I can share with the screen. Yeah, possible. But I cannot see the option. The same here. I also cannot see the option. Oh, 
Gautam, I have given option to promote you as panelist. Please accept that, so that you'll come into the panelist list, so that you'll get the option also. You'll get a pop-up in your screen itself. Yes, sir. Yeah, please accept that, Dr. Ganesh Valuri. For all the presentation presenters, I'm giving that. Yes, sir. So shall I start? Shall I share share my screen? Yeah, yeah, fine. Your BMS okay, ID fine. is uh, an Anatomy two seven one. Am I correct? Okay, okay, fine, sir. Sir, wait, I'll be sharing. Desktop, can you hear? Desktop. Desktop, can you? Computer. Come Computer share. Come share. Share. Computer's business save. Can you? Sir, please give me some time. Fine. Sir, is it getting shared or not? No, ma'am. So can you see my screen? No, no. Is there any other? Uh, or else the PPT, I'll uh, get it from the department. Is there any other? So please get with the, Yeah, yeah. Is there any other presenters with their uh, PPT who can share? Good afternoon, am I audible? Uh, Dr. Ganesh Valuri, or uh, you are, can I present here things you can do now? Okay. My name is Adi Shankaran. I'm from Department of Biochemistry. Uh, am I yes, audible sir. to you? Yes. Are you yes. yes, sir. Ganesh, I'm ready. Please share the screen. Yeah, first we'll go with Ganesh Valuri. Please share the screen. Yeah, is it visible for you? Ah, uh, yes. Is it visible for you, Dr. Ganesh? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, please, judges, yes, uh, the participant is Dr. Uh, Veluri Ganesh. His ID bio 215. Yes, sir. Yes. Uh, can I yes, sir. sir. Yeah. The name is Raju Kumaran T. No, no, no. Bio Bio Ganesh. Bio 215. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, you can proceed, doctor. So I'm going to present in a recent topic. So title is correlation with magnesium vitamin medicine levels with microbiome for related property in nutrition Sorry to interrupt. Your voice is not clear. Your your voice is breaking up. Your voice is breaking.
हेलो क्या इज इट क्लियर सर हाँ इट्स क्लियर नाउ यू कैन प्रोसीड डाउट सर या सो कैन आई स्टार्ट सर या प्लीज स्टार्ट या गुड आफ्टरनून ऑल हियर डॉक्टर आई एम बेलूरी गणेश डिपार्टमेंट ऑफ बायोकेमिस्ट्री ईएसआईसी मेडिकल कॉलेज एंड हॉस्पिटल so here i am going to be present one of my research topic correlation of serum magnesium vitamin d and adiponectin levels with microalbumin for early detection of nephropathy in patients with type 2 diabetes so please change the slide coming to the introduction type 2 diabetes mellitus is a chronic metabolic disorder due to two major abnormalities including insulin resistance and dysfunction of insulin production leads to chronic hyperglycemia The prevalence of diabetes in worldwide population was 366 million by 2011 and expected to reach 550 million by 2035. In Indian scenario, 40.9 people millions were affected with diabetes, and potentially this number will be increased to 85 million by 2030. Apart from hyperglycemia, the other uh, factors like obesity, dyslipidemia also contributes to increase free radical production and decrease antioxidant level, leading to diabetes mellitus and its complications. Please change the slide, sir. So diabetic nephropathy. Diabetic nephropathy is one of the major microvascular complication occurs due to multiple risk factors like hyperglycemia, obesity, smoking, dyslipidemia, and hypertension in patients with type 2 diabetes mellitus. Globally, in 2015, the prevalence of nephropathy in type 2 diabetes mellitus was 20 to 40 percent. Among in this Indian population, had 36.3 percent. Microalbuminuria is currently considered as gold standard and is the earliest clinical available marker for detection of diabetic nephropathy. Nephropathy starts with normalbuminuria, microalbuminuria, and obesity. Microalbuminuria will make the failure and replicate the changes. However, it has having low to availability at the main. ियमिकेशन that the correlation of serum magnesium vitamin d and adiponectin levels with microalbumin for early detection of nephropathy in patients with type 2 diabetes mellitus sir please coming to the aim the present study was taken up to correlation of serum magnesium vitamin d and adiponectin levels for uh, microalbumin early uh, microalbumin for early detection of nephropathy in patients with type 2 diabetes mellitus objectives to measure the adiponectin levels in different stages of diabetic nephropathy among type 2 diabetic patients we compare with healthy controls to measure the serum uh, vitamin d levels in different stages of diabetic nephropathy among type 2 diabetic patients compare with healthy controls to measure the serum magnesium levels in different stages of diabetic nephropathy among type 2 diabetic patients compare with healthy controls correlation of hba1c urinary and with magnesium vitamin d Why is not audible, Mr. Luri Ganesh? 
Yes, sir. You are audible. Doctor Ganesh is not audible. I think he has lost his connection. Doctor Ganesh. Now you. Can you hear me? Uh, sir. Can I can I start? Sir? Can I continue? Uh, yeah, yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah. thirty thirty. Uh, next slide. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, proceed. Sir, please change the slides, sir. Sir, please change the slides, sir. Coming to the inclusion criteria of the study, so uh, age is all the subjects age is greater than thirty. The patient diagnosed with type two diabetes, mellitus, based on American Diabetes Association criteria. So, American Diabetic Association criteria. So in Different stages of nephropathy. Coming to exclusion criteria, the patients with type type one diabetes mellitus, non-diabetic renal disease, so urinary tract infections, individuals on thyroid and diuretics, anti-inflammatory and immunosuppressive drugs, thyroid thyroid and liver diseases. The patients who have macrovascular complications such as cardiovascular, cerebrovascular, and peripheral vascular diseases were excluded from the study. So I'm coming to the sample collection. Two different uh, blood samples were collected from the all the subjects. Five. ml of fasting blood sugar 3 ml of after food for post perinatal blood sugars and also we collected spot urine samples was collected from the all the subjects all the separate samples were transferred into appropriate labeled liquids and stored at so -50 minus 50 degree centigrade until biochemical analysis was done please change the slide sir sir please change the slide sir Coming to the methods, the fasting blood sugar, post-perinatal blood sugar, urea, creatinine, and HbA1c, magnesium was analyzed by using laboratory standard methods. Serum vitamin D was analyzed by uh, chemical elimination immuno assay. Microalbuminuria was analyzed by albumin creatinine ratio. So here, metoponectin was analyzed by enzyme-linked immunosorbent assay method. So please change the slide, sir. Coming to the statistical analysis, data distribution was. Tested using Kolmogorov's no test. Continuous variables are expressed as mean plus or minus standard deviation. Comparison between the two groups for continuous variables were assessed using independent sample details. Pearson correlation analysis was done to test correlations among the markers. Statistical analysis was performed using Microsoft Excel spreadsheets, SPSS software for Windows version 16. The p-value is less than 0.05 was considered as statistically significant. Sir, please change the slide, sir. Coming to the results, table one shows the comparison of biochemical parameter biochemical parameters in patients with hypertension blood tests and healthy controls. The parameters cholesterol, HDL, so mic microalbumin. So here, metoponectin was significantly elevated in type two diabetes mellitus patients when compared to the healthy controls. The magnesium diabetes mellitus patients when compared to the Healthy control. The p-value is less than zero point zero zero one. Is comparison of biochemical parameters in type two diabetes mellitus with normal bilirubin and type two diabetes with patients with uh, type two uh, micro bilirubin.
him. I think he's having a internet problem. Can can we proceed with the part uh, candidate now, or like? Yes, sir. Or we'll ask him to switch out the discussion or conclusion. Right? Yeah. I think he has lost his connection. Yeah. Sir, could I please present my presentation after this? What shall we do with the, uh, this uh, participant? Yes. Sir, can we go to discussion? Or... Sir, 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 actually, here, actually, we are in ESA. Sir, here, we won't get this proper signal, sir. Sir, yeah. sir correlation. Yeah, already we have uh, reached 10 minutes. Just go to yes, the slide with the permission. Okay, sir. Okay, sir. Okay, sir. Please, please. Yeah, discussion? Yes, sir. So, but, uh, can I start? The, uh, they are asking to tell the silent points alone and finish. Okay, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Please go to the. Can I start, sir? Yeah, shall I go to conclusion slide or you want to e tell something in the discussion? Yeah. No, sir. No, sir. Go, go to conclusion, sir. No problem, sir. Because I have yeah. issued yeah. to this. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, sir. In the present study, in the present study, we are included that uh, the reduced levels of serum magnesium, vitamin D, and increased levels of serum adiponectin levels was observed in patients with type 2 diabetes when compared to the three groups of studies. It increased the because of tubular injury, and also it is useful for preventing. magnesium and vitamin factors like type 2 diabetes mellitus and its complications. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Velluri Ganesh. Yes, ma'am. How did you calculate the sample size? Sample says, ma'am, according to the previous studies, our values, ma'am, we calculated, ma'am, and online by using uh, software. Okay. It came out to be 90? Uh, ma'am, by using software, ma'am, online software, ma'am, we calculated by using uh, previous studies, so our values, ma'am. It was a cross-section study, no? Yes, ma'am. By mistake, actually, in the uh, materials and material, we mentioned case control study. It was my mistake from my side. Okay. And um, what do you say about the adiponectin levels? Adiponectin levels are increased, no? Adiponectin. Yes, ma'am. Adiponectin levels are increased in uh, both the groups of uh, type 2 diabetes. Is there any difference between type 2 diabetes and nephropathy? Adiponectin levels? Yes, ma'am. Actually, it is having renoprotective effects, ma'am. It is to prevent the damage of uh, kidneys by activation of uh, AMP kinase pathway. Renoprotective effect, but it has been increased, no? But it has been increased in nephropathy. That's what I'm telling, no? Yeah. It is increasing, maybe, so to protect the uh, damage of the kidney. To prevent the damage of the kidney. To prevent the damage of kidney, it is increased in the nephropathy. Yeah. For prevention purpose. Maybe. Not only for our study, even uh, we have uh, references, uh, other studies also. It is background studies which is uh, mentioning and uh, reported uh, increased serum and nectar levels were observed in uh, nephropathy conditions. Okay. okay, thank you, doctor. Thank you. Sir, could I please present my PPT now? I can share the screen. Please wait a moment. Okay, sir. Any other questions from the other judges? Okay, sir. Dr. Ganesh, your uh, presentation is good, but because of the uh, interruption, uh, so maybe it was not very clear. Uh, yes. I'm not a subject expert, but uh, slides were good. 
but the interruption from my side actually so we are now and get the signal yeah. from here so yeah. we are in the forest area from that's way okay 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 no problem good presentation sorry. thank you ma'am thank you ma'am sorry ma'am sorry for the interruption from my side for all the uh, judges and Ravi sir is there any question from your side uh no sir oh, it's okay then we'll, then we'll go with the next question sir we'll yes. finish, with, finish off the biochemistry of kirtika are you ready with your presentation yes sir yeah can can you share it from your side one minute sir yeah could i please present because i have a doctor's appointment for my child Yeah, the screen is visible. You can uh, proceed. Yes, sir. Thank you. Good afternoon, all. I am Kirti Kam from uh, tutor in Biochemistry Department of Savita Medical College. I presented uh, potential antimicrobial activity of green synthesis copper nanoparticle and its characterization. So the introduction: the copper nanoparticles are one of the most significant transition metal oxide in nanotechnology. because it is simplicity and eco friendless and potential as next generation antibiotics uh, then uh, it synthesizes using green chemistry principle in gaining transaction at the same time the i use coriander leaf has encountered the numerous pharmacological exercise like uh, cell reinforcement and antimicrobial uh, because its cost effectiveness and lower toxicity in remarkable broad spectrum antibacterial activity against the range of bacteria through the generation of reactive oxygen species and release copper ions Uh, to assess antimicrobial activity green synthesis copper nanoparticles uh, coriander leaf in the aim in the objective to determine the physical chemical characterization of copper nanoparticles and to assess in vitro antimicrobial activity of copper oxide nanoparticle against multi drug resistant bacterial strains materials before we know about the preparation of coriander leaf extract so 20 grams of dry leaves of coriander taken into 250 ml beaker with 100 ml of distilled water and then boiled for 20 minutes in, uh, at 80 degrees celsius so copper nanoparticle synthesis to depend on the copper sulfate for use starting material and the reduction is carried by coriander leaf extract from copric ion to copper oxide Uh, so in the synthesis of copper nanoparticles is based on 10 ml of coriander leaf extract was added to 100 ml of aqueous copper sulfate solution it kept this flask at room temperature as overnight and the copper nanoparticles were separated at settle at the bottom of the solution so finally the copper nanoparticles obtained the purified uh, for the repeated centrifugation method at uh, 5000 rpm for 15 minutes followed by the derefreshing of the pellet in dnf water so copper nanoparticles were dried into over uh, at 80, 80 degrees celsius methodology physical chemical characterization of copper nanoparticles the first in spectroscopy in uv visible range i use double beam spectrophotometer in the range of 400 nanometer to 700 nanometer so it is examine the optical characteristics and in fact spectroscopy using fourier transform it is examining the perkin elmer with a spectrometer recorded in 400 to 4000 cm it generally identify the capping and efficient stabilization of metal nanoparticles so next in diffraction of x rays so copper potassium variation in two ranges from 20 degree to 80 degree so this x ray uh, diffract metal was used as a crystallized size structure and crystallity of nanoparticles 
followed by the data analysis in PowerX software. Then one I used uh, for transmission electron microscope because the size of produced particles were determined with the help of TEM. Uh, at the same time, uh, we analyzed for uh, various magnification and screening of copper nano particles. In in vitro antimicrobial activity of copper nanoparticles in multidrug resistant bacterial strain, I follow clinical laboratory standard institute guidelines. Uh, this is under two method is kit by disc uh, bureau diffusion and agar well diffusion method. In the gram positive is staphylococcus aureus, staphylococcus mutant, staphylococcus pyogen, and staphylococcus epidermis is used. Then gram negative is Escherichia coli and Pseudomonas. Each strain was tested around 50 liters of the test sample. So based on the concentration of copper and nanoparticles is 1.25 milligram per 50 liter. It is kept for 37 degrees Celsius. And standard positive controls is 50 microliter aqueous extract of a, um, uh, coriander was used as positive control. And 10 micro streptomycin disc for gram positive and 10 microgram norfloxin disc for gram negative strain. So antibacterial activity were assessed using the zone of inhibition measure after the inhibition period against each tested or microorganism. Time kill determination. The mixture of nanoparticles were also tested in investigate possible antibacterial activity and this minimized the potential toxicity and resistant problems. So the copper oxide and uh, sub-minimum bacterial concentration was used to uh, killing assay against following strains for S. Avurus strain, MRSA and S. Avurus Oxford NCTC 657171 and uh, S. Termititis SE51 and E. coli SCTC. So all the nanoparticles were prepared in phosphate buffer saline with sonic action. Uh, at the zero time, each microorganism was added to the nanoparticle suspension and dilution of 1 in 80. So inhibition was carried in shaking inhibitor in 200 RPM at 37 degrees Celsius in the air for 4 hours. After that, the plate were then inhibited at 37 degrees Celsius in the air with uh, carbon dioxide for 24 hours. It is statistical analysis are using one-way ANOVA. Uh, result, the pH of the copper sulfate solution is 2.16 and the coriander leaf extract is 6.78. When I added the coriander leaf extract to this solution, the pH will be changed to 2.16 to 2.64. So I confirmed that the capping between the copper and coriander leaf extract was taken places. Uh, next one, the UV visible, the reduction of copper sulfate to pure copper nanoparticles for monitoring with ultraviolet visible spectrophotometer. So UV uh, visual uh, spectro a spectrum of copper nanoparticle disappear as deionized water at room temperature is peak at 560 nanometer. And the diffraction of X ray, the sample demonstrated at high crystallinity level. Uh, the diffraction level is 22.74 degree to 33.12 degree. The size of copper nanoparticles was found in the range of 21.66 nanometer to 41.65 nanometer. Uh, the FV, FTIR, the biosynthesis of copper nanoparticles were recorded in identify the capping and efficient stabilization of metal nanoparticles by bio, uh, biomolecules present in coriander leaf extract. Uh, so band at the 3,500 uh, 3, centimeter to the correspondent of alcohol and phenol. So in the band at the 1,575 centimeter is uh, correspond to the primary amine. So that, so 3,500 to 3,200. 25 bands are responsible for the presence of phenol, flavonoids, aromatic amino acid. So the band at 600 centimeter is corresponded to presence of copper. So synthesis of copper nanoparticles was surrounded by the protein and metabolites such as phenolic acid, carboxylic acid and flavonoids etc. So I confirm the phenolic compounds have stronger ability to bind metal indicating that phenol could form the metal nanoparticles to prevent agglomeration and thereby stabilize in the medium. Transmission electron microscope to uh, demonstrate that the nano copper particles is exhibited for uh, axis shape with no sharp edges is observed. So the particle size was determined to be the range 22.4 to 94.0 nanometer.
Minimum bacterial concentration at kill time is using this kill assay, the population of gram positive and gram negative organisms tested were reduced by 68% to 65% is presence of 1000 microgram ml nano copper oxide within the two hours. Uh, the special the population of the SIURS and the MRSA, the epidermidis were reduced to zero by four hours in the presence of 1000 microgram ml nanogram of copper oxide. The conclusion, uh, copper nanoparticles been appeared the joint to microbial cell surface and enter inside and uh, were intracellular target and in including the respiratory catalyst and disturb. So the copper nanoparticles suggest to release of iron may be required for optimum killing. Uh, future plan to evaluate effect of uh, copper nanoparticles on bacterial genome and their genotoxicity. These are the reference. Thank you. Yes. Yes, my more demand. Shall I give my opinion? Yes. Uh, the study is very well conducted and a very detailed uh, explanation you have given. Okay. But I have some doubts regarding this. Uh, can only coriander leaves can be used for this nanoparticle synthesis or any uh, green leaf extract can be used? Any green leaf extract, uh, we're using the uh, copper nanoparticle extract, ma'am. Uh, but uh, very cheaply and at the same time, uh, we're using the coriander is every day our food. So only I choose the coriander leaves. Other leaf is also contain uh, nanoparticle, copper nanoparticles is presented in our other studies. Oh, in, by in, in what way this coriander leaves in our food is go, is related to your study? Uh, every day we're taking the coriander, ma'am. Uh, so okay. uh, some uh, bacterial uh, uh, resistant uh, coriander is copper acid is highly presented in the coriander. So it is also helping to prevent some bacterial infection, other disease. Okay. But with your uh, say, with your study, uh, what is the uh, um, scope? How is can how it can be applied in medical treatments? Because there are nanoparticles have some adverse effects also, no? So, yes, ma'am. Uh, nowadays, uh, we and how far it is superior to? Is it comparable to the antibiotics? the zone of inhibition you have talked about. No? Have you compared it with uh, regularly used antibiotics or you only you're using it as isolated assays with uh, copper nanoparticles? Um, uh, it, is, uh, it is isolated but um, it is uh, it is a suitable replacement for art, uh, antibiotics otherwise the disinfected part. Uh, nowadays is, uh, more studies are going on the copper oxide uh, nanoparticles uh, it is uh, compared to other drug, it is very fast moving uh, to target the particular cells and phagocytosis action. But it has some adverse effects also, no? Yes, ma'am. Immunotoxicity, genotoxicity. Uh, yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. So only I, I plan that future plan, uh, we evaluate the copper nanoparticles on bacterial genome and their genotoxicity. So it is very suitable replacement of antibiotics and disinfectant of the medical uh, clinical side. All this you expect, but we do not know how yes, the yes, Okay, that's all from my side, sir. Thank you. Dr. Ravi, sir, is there any question? Hello. Uh, uh, Kritika. So my question is that, uh, what do you think, what is the significance in the composition of coriander leaves in Australia? Did you check what are the compositions of the coriander leaves? Flavonoids are an all, uh, feed all primary amines, aromatic amino groups. Uh, so these are all generally presented and the flavonoids. Phenol the flavonoids and other things have been present in all other plant materials. Yes, sir. Uh, the reason for choosing this uh, coriander for uh, Capping agent, no? Yes, sir. Uh, because... Oh, uh, why, why did you choose this one? 
uh, because the in the band of the six uh, in the FTI or uh, TERS, the corporate will be presented, sir. Highly presented uh, indicate the band at 600 uh, centimeter. So it's correspond to presence of copper in the coriander leaves. Uh, so some other studies or coriander leaves uh, highly content in the copper. So only I check that. After that, I uh, uh, the, the nanoparticles are presented or not. Uh, the copper nanoparticles are presented or not. So only I do this um, test. No, in your FTI, FTI analysis, you 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 have you have done only one seam, sir. And the uh, and the peak which you got it also didn't uh, does not have any. Uh, uh, functional group explanation has not been provided in that uh, in the one run actually. How many times did you run the FTR? Uh, sir, only uh, one time I, I uh, ran this part. Okay. Uh, no, the, the thing is that, no, you have done only one set sense, right? Okay. Uh, you have checked the same also, that is also showing sir, 28, uh, 28 uh, micrometer. Yes. Okay. Uh, when you prepare other time, the size will be varied. Okay, sir. So, uh, what kind of optimization is needed for your uh, study, actually? Did you done any optimization study in uh, uh, developing the nanoparticles? And another question is that, uh, what is your actual uh, application of your study? So you have developed a nanoparticles. What is, what will be the application of your study? As uh, uh, the madam said that already the antibiotics are available. So what your uh, newly developed uh, uh, nanoparticles will do actually? Uh, it's a suitable replacement of antibiotics. Uh, so it's completing uh, bacterial microorganisms uh, uh, so yeah, antibiotics agent. will antibiotics will target on the specific uh, microbes. Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, how does your antibiotics? Did you done any kind of uh, uh, targeting studies for a particular uh, uh, bacterial species? If you use these uh, nanoparticles for all microbes, the good bacteria also will die, right? Yes, sir. Yes. yes. Then uh, how can it, it can uh, it can be a replaceable for antibiotics? Yes, sir. The next study only I of the future plan is particular uh, practical uh, bacterial genome. Uh, the effect of uh, open nanoparticles in bacterial genome and genotoxicity. See, actually, the plan, if sir. you take any heavy metals like zinc, okay. copper, no, if, that will be a, a toxicity to any of the species. It is toxic to ours also. Okay. okay? okay How sir. you are going to encapsulate it? Uh, the capping is very very important. That's why you are using different type of. Uh, uh, biological material for capping okay. for bio that that also you need a proper characterization is needed for your studies actually you have to do ftr you need to do uh, raman spec so there okay. are several characterization and okay. you have to optimize this uh, the single size or shape it should be a single size or it should be a single shape okay. but whatever you do will have a, uh, what do you say it's kind of a, a different size will you will be getting different uh, shape you will be getting uh, those things cannot be taken to the market, actually. So that's, you need to understand it. Yes, okay? sir. Yes, sir. Thank you from my side. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Is there, is there any questions from Dr. Shivrila, ma'am? Uh, no, sir. Yes, okay. They can proceed. Oh, okay. Due to medical emergency, like uh, one of our participants, like uh, Dr. Sumaya, she wants to present next. With the permission of uh, judge, can we go ahead? Yes, sir. Let her present. Yes, sir. Shah Sumaya Jan, Anatomy 271. So is it visible? Yes, yeah, it's visible. You can put in slideshow mode. Okay. Slideshow, fine. Yeah. Is it fine, sir? Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Dr. Shah Sumaya from Government Medical College, Srinagar. 
from the Department of Anatomy, working as a demonstrator. Today, the topic of my presentation is Anatomic Differences in Patellar Dimensions. It's a comparative study of left and right sides. Coming to the introduction, the patella is a sesamoid bone that is formed within the tendon of quadriceps femoris. And uh, coming to the contribution towards the knee joint, it forms the femoropatellar component. Uh, it has various variations in the position. We can call it patella alta when it's higher in position. It's attenuated patella alta when it's abnormally small above the knee joint. And patella baja, which is positioned very low and may hinder the knee extension. Coming to the structural features, uh, if we see it from the front, it's rough with vertical ridges from the tendon of the quadriceps, uh, femoris, the fibers that are coming from the tendon of the quadriceps. The articular portion, the facets for the articulation with the femur patellar surface and uh, in the medial border, it presents an odd facet in contact with the femoral condyle during the extreme flexion. And coming to the apex, lo it's lower and the non-articular part and it attaches to the patellar ligament. Now, what was the need for the study? There was an existing gap. There was lack of data on patellar morphology uh, in the Kashmiri population. So Kashmiri population is a unique population with distinct features, ethnic group and the genetic and environmental factors are there. Uh, while uh, coming to the geographic context, the Kashmir is located in the northern India that is bordered by Pakistan and China. Now relevance, we have to understand the patellar morphometry that is crucial for the diagnosis and treating the knee pathologies. Now, what was the aim of the study? This study will involve the uh, collection of dry human patella from the individuals of the Kashmiri origin and the measurement of the various morphometric parameters, including length, width, thickness, and the angles of inclination and rotation of both the left and the right sides. Coming to the materials and methods, it was a cross-sectional study that was done in September 2022 to December 2022 in Government Medical College, Srinagar, on the ethnic Kashmiri population. We arbitrarily took 42 patellas among we had, among them we had 22 right and 20 left. We included the patellas that were from the ethnic Kashmiri population and we excluded all those patellas that had any congenital abnormality or that had any fracture, that had any fractured bone. And before doing the study, we saw an, uh, this ethical clearance from the ethical committee. Then uh, CoinQ's classification, it provides the foundation for the patellar's morphological classification that's based on the measurements of the lateral and the medial patellar facets. The patella were divided into groups A, B, and C. The parameters used in the study were patellar's height, width, and thickness, the length and the width of the medial and the lateral articular facets, as well as their analysis were measured. A measurement of the central ridge length was also made. The digital vernier caliper were used uh, to take the measurements. The length of the patella was measured from the superior point as the uppermost point to the inferior point, whereas the width was measured at the broadest point that is perpendicular to the length axis. Regarding the thickness of the patella, it was measured at the mid patellar point, which is the thickest point of the bone. Now coming to table one, table one. Table one shows the descriptive statistical analysis, including the mean, maximum, median, and standard deviation. As shown in this table, no parameters showed a significant statistical difference between the right and the left patellas, except for the slightly higher mean patellar height on the left side. Coming to the table two, table two shows a statistical difference while comparison of the medial and the lateral joint facets of the right side. Table three, it shows a statistical difference while comparison of the medial and the lateral joint facets of the left side. The lateral facets were found to be wider than the medial facets in both table two and table three on both the right and the left sides. Now coming to table four, the queen case classification, according to that, here the majority of our petalas, they were falling into the group B. That means the articular facets on the lateral aspect were larger than the medial aspect, which is also supported by table two and table three. Now coming to our conclusion, 
The results of this study show that the average height, width, and thickness are 4.10 cm, 2.01 cm, and 4.1 cm, respectively. The information provided in this study may be useful for the forensic evaluation and the ethnic morphometry of patellar specimens. This study determined the important dimensions of the patellar bone in a North Indian population, which may provide guidelines for the fabrication of the patellar prosthesis implants. Thank you so much. Thank you. Shall I stop sharing? Yeah, you can stop sharing. The presentation. Okay, fine. Fine. Yes, Dr. Sumaya. Uh, yes, ma'am. All these were available in your department, 42 Patel? Yes, sir. We have. Actually, we had 46 patellas. Among them, I discarded four because they had some, uh, like, they were chips of bones and they were fractured. So, I didn't include them in my study. And one of the inclusion criteria you mentioned, all were uh, taken from ethnic uh, Kashmiri population. Yes, so, ma'am. How was that actually? Ma'am, actually, actually, we have here we have two lots of uh, like bone sets. We have we have dead bodies and we have okay. the bones that we extract from the population of Kashmir because we know that we are going to conduct the studies so that represents our Kashmiri population. So we keep them grouped together and we mark them, we label them, and we have other bones that we get from outside. So we keep them aside. We don't take them because it will fabricate the data. Okay. Then one more question from my side. Uh, yes, So you had uh, uh, taken articles for reference, right? Pro so yes, any differences are there in uh, your region uh, dimensions and from other studies which were done in other parts of India? Ma'am, actually, there was no such uh, study was done in uh, Kashmir. It was done in outside in other parts of India. So I thought that there is a lack of data that is in Kashmiri population. So I thought that it would provide some data to the Kashmiri population. That's why. Okay. So what is the significance of this? Ma'am, actually, if we uh, get to know, because from our uh, statistical analysis, we have uh, seen that we have uh, we got to know that according to the classification, the articular facets that are uh, on the lateral aspect, they are larger than the medial aspect. So according to that, uh, first of all, these uh, bone studies, they help in the forensic evaluation. And number two, because patella is the most important bone in the knee injuries or like in the old age, they get injured. So for the prosthesis, for the implant, implants we can get a clearer view so that we can plant them or we can manufacture them according to that that may be of some help to that yeah you can try to sexing also in this yes ma'am so it can yes, add some more information yes okay. ma'am yes ma'am i thank can you. do that good presentation. Do that. thank you ma'am thank you so much thank you ma'am thank you ma'am is there any questions from other people uh, Dr. Sumaya, I have yes, one. sir. Uh, uh, you have a very good presentation. Uh, Thank you so much, sir. So, how, how it will be useful in uh, forensic? Sir, because uh, here we can, if we have like unknown bodies that can be like uh, there is some encounter anywhere or some accident em emergency in the forensic like if we we have a clearer a, a clearer idea of what our ethnic kashmiri population we got a data according to that we got a data so we can frame out like uh, for in the forensic we have a, da a data like this particular bone or because something is like uh, that has a connection with the ethnicity and a particular group of population so th this way we can like so we it need will contribute a, to that. We, we need a earlier data, right? Uh, yes, sir. To understand. So you yeah, said yes, that's sir. the first uh, first of his kind in, in India, right? Yes, sir. Okay. Did you publish this paper? Sir, not yet. Okay. Good. Okay. Thank, Thank you so much, sir. Uh, good presentation, Dr. Sumaya. But I have certain doubts. I have certain yes. doubts in your uh, study. Yes. Uh, yes, did, did it uh, did it compare the petala morphology with other ethnic groups so that you can yes, say it is very specific to your group to your Kashmiri population? 
Yes, ma'am. We did because uh, as I have already uh, shown that in table one, there was no significant statistical difference. And while in table two and table three, there was a slight statistical difference. There was like the lateral facets were found to be more wider than the medial facets that was shown in table two and table three. And according to table four in our study, most of our patellas, they fell into the group B that showed that the lateral aspect is larger than the medial aspect. So that had a slight significant, slight significant difference was with the other ethnic population of other parts of the zone. So actually you didn't compare, you just took the data, like how it differs from the other populations, no? Yeah, yes, ma'am. And do you have the history of the petala, just doing a study with the petala without any prior history, uh, how do you correlate the age, sex, does it matter or not? Like madam was asking, we should have noted on the sex of the individuals also, no? Yes, ma'am. We can do. We can add that in the. I can further extend my study, and we. We'll, I can see it in the further study. I will extend it. Any uh, sure. bone or any structural component without any history of who it belongs to? How can you tell the validity of your results? No, it should be comparable. Yes, yes ma'am. And only you have done in your population. You don't know how it. Based on studies, you say, but it is not a part of your study, no? Yes, ma'am. No, all that should have been. If you do that, it will become your study will become more right. Yes, ma'am. Surely, I'll do that in future. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for the insight. Thank you, Thank Thank you. you ma'am. We'll call uh, the next participant, Priya Marina. You are ready, ma'am. Yes, sir. You'll share from your end, or uh, I should. Uh, I can share from my end. Yeah, I have the presentation also. If you want, I can. Yeah, it's visible. Uh, Is it visible? It's visible. You put in uh, full screen mode. Is it fine? Um, please put in slideshow mode. It's on slideshow. Sir. It's not reflected. Can you see? No, madam, it's not reflected here. Where is that option, sir? Yeah, like I can see. Uh, top top ribbon home insert design animation slideshow. Or at the bottom, you can see here. You have to zoom. Uh, yeah, next to that slideshow. Design animations and slideshow. Uh, Priya, you stop sharing. No? You stop okay. sharing. And then uh, you, you, can, uh, you can share it in the. Uh, Without uh, screen mode, actually, without I mean slideshow mode. Or shall I do it from my? Is it visible? Ah, ah, ah no, it's okay. okay. Yeah. Uh, very good afternoon to the respected judges and uh, all the delegates present for the international conference. Uh, it's my pleasure to present uh, part of my study at uh, the Young Research Scholar presentation among the co-presenters. So thank you for the opportunity. My study is on determination of sex by hand read dimension and finding index and ring finger length among uh, the students of Kerala origin. I'm uh, hailing from uh, Anapoya Medical College, Mangalore, from the Department of Anatomy. Next slide. Hello. You have said from your end, I think so. Not able to change. Yes. Yeah. The aim of the study is to identify the sexual dimorphism by studying hand length, hand breadth, and hand index and ratio of the index ring finger length. And the second objective is to study among the variables which can better predict sex. What is the need for the study? 
This study will be helpful in establishing the biological profile of individuals in forensic investigation. This study has implication in mass disaster, criminal cases, wars, and other disasters which are happening where an isolated hand is recovered and needs forensic identification. An individual's identification is the most important part of the forensic investigation. It is prevalent to discover the dismembered human remains and peripheral sections of the body with growing frequency of disasters. A, person, a person's features will uh, restrict to a geography and an individual's hand can uh, probably provide useful data about the stature, sex and age when retrieved and taken for examination. So sex determination from hand dimensions can greatly assist forensic scientists in identifying human remains. These are some of the literature reviews which shows the earlier studies which are done in different parts of the world. GSE et al. in Korea, he has done a study of 321 measurements of males and females and analyzed to investigate the sustainability of detailed hand dimensions as discriminators of sex. Uh, around a total of 29 variables were included in his study, including length, breadth, thickness, circumference of fingers, palm, wrists were measured. And according to his study, the result showed a highest accuracy of 88.6% for predicting sex for males and 89.6% for females. Kanchan et al. also did a study in North and South India uh, using 500 females and uh, did a similar calculation as well, where the variation is seen in different percentages. Ishaq et al. conducted a study to determine the sex using dimension of various hand parts and hand prints collected from 200 Australian subjects, wherein there is a similar uh, measurements which are done of hand breadth and length were reported to offer highest identification accuracy. As well as another study was done by Abol Hagag et al. attempted sex determination by using variables such as hand length, hand breadth, and index finger versus ring finger length ratio. And in this study, he predicted the hand index, hand breadth, and length, which showed 80% of accuracy for males and 78% for females. Now, I have concentrated to study the same in the region of Kerala population because as per the study, as per uh, my uh, uh, review, uh, there are a lot of uh, students which are located around this region of Venapoya Medical College. And uh, I thought it would be a great uh, contribution towards the forensic medicine if we can have something uh, uh, done for an age group of 18 to 20 years. So we have taken the study group uh, which is conducted in Venapoya Medical College and with the 50 undergraduate students, students of Kerala origin, including both male and female, age group of 18 to 20 years, hand length and breadth, index finger and ring finger measurements are done using digital vernier calipers. And these are the parameters which are used. The length of the hand will be assessed. Now, how do we assess the length of the hand? Is It is a straight line between the distal crease of the wrist joint and the tip of the middle finger. Second dimension is the hand width. It will be assessed as a straight spectrum from the second metacarpal side's most laterally placed point to the most medially placed point of the fifth metacarpal surface. Third one is the hand index where we do a uh, uh, hand width versus hand length into 100. That is a measurement we get for the hand index. Fourth one, a hand, uh, the index finger measurement where the index finger length will be measured, tip of the index finger to the metacarpal phalangeal crease. And the ring finger measurement, the tip of the ring finger to the distal metacarpal phalangeal crease. So this figure shows how the measurement goes about. For the calculation, all the measurements were statistically analyzed using software and Microsoft Excel. A t-test was used to compare the hand length, breadth, and hand index, index finger length, and ring finger length. Descriptive, uh, descriptive functional analysis was done. These are my results, which you can see. This is the uh, table one, which shows measurements and calculation of right hand, where you can see the length, width, index length, and ring finger length, which is measured mean and standard deviation is calculated and you can see that p value is less than 0 0.001 which shows it is statistically significant this is the measurement for left hand you can see the length of female and male width of female and male index finger length measurements of female and male and ring finger measurements of female and male the statistically significant differences in right and left hand measurements of male and females are evident in the above table. We can see that females have a very particular measurement in all uh, the calculations, whereas male measurements are a little higher compared to the female. This indicates the hand dimension are 
can be better used as a predictor of sex. In case we find an unidentified hand, in case of any disasters, this would be a great contribution for them to compare the lens and to determine which geography the person may belong. The following table gives a canonical uh, coefficient, uh, co correlation coefficients for the right hand. You can see the co a correlation for width, length, right, uh, ring finger and index fingers. This is for the right hand. And this is a correlation coefficient for the left hand. So we compare the same as the standard values and we have used a formula for this. This is the formula Fisher linear discriminant to calculate. How do you calculate the left, left uh, hand measurement? This is a LF is for left hand of female. And this is a calculation where uh, after discussion with my statistician, this is the calculation we have come up and the formula we have come up with. And this is the left length measurement in case of females. L F is for female and M is in males. So we uh, replace the exact values, length of the right hand, width of the right hand, index finger, length and ring finger measurements. And according to this calculation, we get a coefficient which is compared with the standard values. And if these values are correlating with if it is greater or lesser than if it is a female or male otherwise. As and I come to a conclusion that right hand, left hand dimensions, when they are used separately or together, they give almost same accurate predictions. So either if we have one hand or two hands, either with one hand, we can also predict what this uh, particular hand may belong to which sex, is, if it's a male or female. That is what the sentence says. Evidence favors to right hand dimensions than left hand dimensions for prediction. That's that more right hand dimensions are more uh, predicted well than left hand dimensions. When both hand dimensions are used together, the accuracy improves only by 2%. So there is only difference of 2% when you calculate together and separately. So the accuracy is just a difference of 2%. So the results may be skewed because uh, the male-female ratio is not 1 is to 1 here in my study. So it may vary accordingly. So uh, in summary, the developed equations offer a reliable method for predicting sex based on right hand dimensions and, uh, ident and the identified predictors contribute significantly to the accuracy of the predictions. These results may have a greater implication in various fields such as forensic anthropology or medicine where sex prediction based on physical characters is relevant. So that's my contribution to this study. These are my references. Thank you so much. Judges. Yes, Dr. Priya, yes, uh, you are working in Mangalore, right? Yes. So uh, you have taken uh, uh, hands of uh, Kerala origin students, right? Yes. So what was the sample size? You have taken 50 students, 50 undergraduate 50. students. So 50 students. So how yeah. many were male? How many were female among the 50? We have uh, 37 uh, male and 13 females. 13 females. Yeah. So both the hands. So same right and left yes, hands. So yes. these people only. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Sample sizes just... comparatively less, I think. No, you could have taken. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, it's the yeah, 37 females and 13 males. Yes. Right. It's a cross sectional study, right? So how did you yes. calculate the sample size? Uh, we. Um... We took it from the other uh, studies, ma'am, but uh, due to the time constraints, actually, we couldn't do more of it. We are extending the study to further 200 samples. Okay, okay. okay. Yeah, yes. One, one more thing you could have done. Uh, you could have taken uh, other students, like you had students from Karnataka also and other places also. Yes, yes. And you could have compared the dimensions hmm. of different states. Yeah, so okay. So it would have been a good study. Or okay, you have we... taken references. Uh, you have uh, taken references from uh, the studies where they have done from only Kerala. So you could have compared that. Okay. Like you have taken the references in common, right? Not only from the students from the Kerala. You have taken no, no, uh, no. students, right? We also have yes. Yes, yes. So I think you cannot compare once you take the different places uh, references. So when you're taking dimensions from only Kerala students, so you can do a comparative study in your uh, place only with other okay. people. And then you can compare. That will be a better study, I think so. 
Yeah, yes, ma'am. We are planning on to continue it further uh, in like different uh, groups and different age groups as well. Yeah, increase the sample for... size also. Increase okay. the sample size. Uh, yeah, that's from my side. Thank you. Thank you. Is there any other questions? Uh, what is your uh, future plan from this? Uh, sir? What will be your future plan from here? Uh, future plan is to uh, publish the results uh, so that it would be no, of no, some I'm, help I'm just in, talking uh, about uh, how you're going to extend your project from here onwards. Extend, you mean? Hmm. Uh, we are planning to take up, uh, as I said, more... Uh, size, sample size, and up to 250 students, including equal number of male and females, mm -hmm. so that it will be, results will be more accurate, as well as uh, compare it with the, our region as well, because I've just restricted it to Kerala origin. I can compare it with the Mangalorean origin as well, and uh, because if there are any other regional uh, people there of the same age group, we can compare with different regions. Mm -hmm. So how long it will take for a person to measure, if, I mean, uh, whatever you are measuring, the length or height or weight now? So uh, per, per person, yeah, per person, it would take maximum of 15 minutes for all these measurements. Okay. Then you do it, everything manually, right? Yes. So it's my, by, by using my, a digital webinar. Uh, okay. My suggestion is that why don't you implement artificial intelligence in your... Okay. Um, so that you can able to collect a lot of data and analyze that uh, your uh, data so that okay. it can give more uh, uh, direction, I mean, mm -hmm. uh, positive direction, where mm -hmm. you can take it further to a much uh, larger sample size, more than 2,000 or 3,000, where you can able to reduce your uh, statistical uh, deviations. Okay. Yes, so sir. this is my suggestion. So you can okay. take it forward by using, now a lot of softwares are available and a lot okay. of uh, algorithms are available. You can choose any, uh, I mean, uh, you can talk to any any person who is expertise in artificial intelligence and then you can take your project towards that direction. That is my Yes, suggestion. sir, I can try to collaborate somewhere with our research center. We have the uh, uh, okay. people working for artificial intelligence. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, doctor, yeah, yes, uh, I have two. I have two basic doubts in your study. Okay. Uh, first of all, the uh, statistical relevance. The thirty-seven males and thirteen females. Um, I think it is quite difficult to come to a conclusion like what you have given. No. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Actually, uh, mi some... minimum. See, you can. Uh, how can yeah. you defend your sample size? Because you are it's sort of a declaration, or it's you are you are trying to say something new, no? That yes, uh, fem females, uh, uh, fing index finger, ring finger, that palm width are uh, less comparable to compared to males. Yes, so in that case, your female sample size should have been equal to males, or even a little bit higher than males. Mm -hmm. no? Yes, that is what I mentioned. And, uh, that the ratio I think is it not... is. Yes, it is very difficult yeah. to even come to a conclusion with this sample size. Such yeah. a, a major yeah. difference. Okay, ma'am. We are, we are, yeah. Yes. See, at least it should have been equal. You know? uh, to come to any conclusive evidence, and you cannot say it as a general, it's, is it generalizable with this sample size? First of all, variation in sample size. And how did you calculate the sample size? Sorry, ma'am. How did you calculate the sample size? It's 37, 13, or just like that you took 50 students and you came to your... Yeah, we your actually have taken a group of students that are available for particular no, batch. Actually any, actually, any research should not be conducted that way, to my knowledge. First of all, you should fix the statistical number, sample size, okay. and then only you should go about with the study. Yeah, we, we wanted to take around 150 students. And uh, but uh, just because of the time constraints, like I, for this presentation, I couldn't finish all of it. So I'm extending it to around 250 students again. And uh, one more basic doubt I have. Um, did you take the height and weight of the individuals into consideration? Did you standardize the students or the individuals before you say that the finger size is different from females and males? Some males well, can be... Uh, males yeah, yeah, that, that's all 
Uh, yeah, yeah, ma'am. That is also one of the parameters which has not been mentioned. I believe. Yeah, sorry for that. We have taken that into consideration because the long, the taller the person is, the dimensions will uh, change accordingly. No, I don't want to, whether, to know whether it is taken into consideration. The research means you should have definitive data. No? Yes. Uh, what sort of standardization did you do? It's all evidence based, and you cannot just say that we have to take taken into consideration. What? Just my doubts. Yeah, it is not mentioned in the calculation. How did you standardize? How did you standardize the height and uh, weight? We, no, I mean, we are just ref uh, just referring it, but not mentioned anywhere in the calculation. We are just basically, we're just taking up a hand, which can be male or female. The person hmm. can be bulky, tall, short. Based on that, uh, this yeah, we are just trying to take up the yes. parameter of for determining the sex itself, because according to those calculations, yes. if you can determine if it's a male or female, that was the. Uh, uh, so, focus of the study. Without uh, standardizing, I think it's very difficult to come to a conclusive evidence. You please concentrate in those areas if you want to publish it or continue with this research. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. We'll go with the next presenter, Dr. Adi Shankaran, Bio 414. Mm -hmm. Sir, I'm audible to you. Yes, sir. Uh, good afternoon uh, to the organization. Uh, first, let me share the screen, sir. Uh, is the screen is visible, uh, sir? Is the screen is visible to you? Yeah, yeah. It's visible. Okay, sir. Okay, sir. Okay. Yes. Sir, shall I start? Yeah, proceed. Proceed. We can start. Okay. Uh, good afternoon to all. Uh, uh, good afternoon to the organizing uh, secretary, organizing chairpersons, and the judges and delegates. I am Dr. Adi Shankaran to present my work on the effect of particulate matter PM 2.5 in tuberculosis granuloma formation and reactivation of latent tuberculosis. As we all know that uh, after inhalation of mycobacterial tuberculosis, that basically like, only 10 percentage of the individual uh, general population develop active tuberculosis, whereas in the rest, the basically like, resides in the dormant state in the form of granuloma. And WHO and some other studies also says that prolonged exposure of PM2.5 <coughs> is associated with more TB fatality, as well as exposure of PBMCs and airway epithelial cells to the pollutant affects host innate immune response. But no study have observed the uh, direct impact of PM2.5 in granuloma formation in vitro, as well as reactivation of latent bacilli, which is content in the granuloma. So, uh, with this, we had uh, two objectives for the study. These two objectives, if we see the clinical relevance, it is like two clinical scenarios. The first subject or the first scenario is like, there is a person who is exposed the first time to the tubercle basal aid. Simultaneously, that person is exposed to the PM2.5 also. So the objective one was to evaluate the effect of pollutant PM2.5 on the formation of PBMC's granuloma using Mbovic's BCG. And the second objective is like, uh, Another scenario in which there is an individual <clears throat> who is already having the latent uh, tuberculosis in the form of granuloma. But if this individual is exposed to PM2.5, what will happen? So the objective two was to assess whether PM2.5 can reactivate the latent mycobacterial bacilli contained in the preformed PBMC granuloma. So in order to uh, ex execute these objectives, we had to standardize few things. First, we had uh, collected PM2.5 in Teflon filter and uh, that was extracted by a sonication, filtration, and lyophilization. This stock concentration was made. And PBMCs were isolated by using density gradient centrifugation. Now, these isolated PBMCs were subjected to different concentrations of PM2.5 to see whether this PM2.5 is itself causing any uh, uh, cyto cytotoxic effect to the PBMCs. And that, this was done by using MTTSA. And simultaneously, Mbovis BCG culture was done and the granuloma was induced with this PBMC and Mbovis BCG in the extracellular matrix with MOI, that is multiplicity of infection 0 0.1, which means one bacilli is required. Uh, one bacilli is required for uh, 10 PBMCs. This is the minimum criteria to form a granuloma. And these granulomas are then harvested in the actual experiments and were subjected for human cytokine assays, histopathology examination, gene expression studies, and colony forming unit enumeration. So this slide shows how I induce the granuloma and how I har harvest it. 
So first, the PBMCs were isolated from the CD subjects and the viable cells were counted. These viable cells are then mixed with the extracellular matrix made up of predominantly collagen and fibronectin. And the PBMCs were added at a ratio of 5 lakh PBMCs per 50 microliter of the extracellular matrix and they were dispensed in the 96 well tissue culture plates. Simultaneously, when the uh, Mbovis BCG attained the log phase, they were added over the extracellular matrix in a ratio of 50,000 bacilli for 5 lakh PBMC so that it will attain a MOI of 0 0.1. Now, these uh, culture plates were uh, maintained 37 degrees Celsius for 7 days. Here, I did not add any pollution. So, this is going to act as a control group. But for the objective one, I had to add the pollutant at the day zero itself. So I used two concentrations of PM 2.5, 0 0.1 and 10, mic, um, uh, 10 uh, microgram per ml. These were added at day zero itself to the tissue culture plates. And the grand loma for the objective one were harvested on day 10. Whereas for the objective two, the grand loma was allowed to form first. So we waited for 10 days to the formation of grand loma and uh, different concentrations of PM 2.5 were added after day, that is after the formation of grand loma and they were maintained for three days. They were harvested on day, day 13. So <clears throat> I had different sets of experimental wells. So from few wells, I have taken uh, the supernatant and subjected for human cytokine assay by using <clears throat> flow cytometry. So these are the seven human cytokines of T helper cell 1, 2 and 17, including TNF alpha and interferon gamma. And the remaining of the extracellular matrix were treated with formalin and they were scooped out and made for a uh, paraffin blocking and subjected for histopathal examination like hematoxin eosin staining and zeal nielsen staining. And the, some other wells were treated with collagenase type 4 to lyse the extracellular matrix and then they were treated with triton X to lyse the PBMCs and they were centri uh, and they were centrifuged to collect the pellet which are predominantly uh, rich in the bacilli. So now this pellet were suspended in trizol and subjected for RNA isolation by bead beating method and followed by DNA treatment and then uh, complementary DNA synthesis was done and the primers are designed for quantitative real-time PCR to see the expression of dormancy-associated genes like triglyceride synthase 1, isocitrate lyase, heat shock protein, and reactivation-associated genes like resuscitation promotion factor B. So dormancy-associated genes are the one which should be appropriated when, when whenever, whenever there is latency, whereas reactivation-associated genes <clears throat> will be appropriated whenever there is reactivation. And gene expression is captured by using LIVAC method. The other set of pellets were suspended in 7H9 media and they were plated on 7H11 agar plates and maintained for 21 days uh, without any contamination and CFU counts for enumerator. So first we will see the results of standardization. So this is the MTTSA. Here we can able to see the PBMCs before adding the <clears throat> MTT and these are the PBMCs after adding the MTT. So MTT is the one which will uh, taken up by the only by the live cells because of the oxidative activity of the, in the cytoplasm that will be converted into crystals. So here we can well appreciate the crystals in the cytoplasmic area. So based on this data, we have made a, we have plotted the, this bar graph in which it is clearly shown that whenever higher concentrations of PM 2.5 is used, it is itself is creating cytotoxic effect on the viability of the PBMC. So we thought we will go with only these two concentrations, one with the lower and one with <clears throat> acceptable higher concentrations of PM2.5 for the following experiments. So this is the control granuloma, which is formed in the extracellular matrix phase contrast images. Here we can able to see um, the well-developed granulomas uh, where the PBMCs are uh, clustered uh, together. And uh, this is again the images in ATX magnification, here we can see all the PBMCs were clumping around um, uh, something forming the grand omom. So this is going to act as a control group. So this is going to act as a control group. So next we move on to the results of objectives for which the actual experiments are carried with the steady subjects more than 18 years working in indoor environment so that they are least exposed to the outdoor pollution. And the chronic lung disease individuals, HIV patients and immunosuppressed patients were excluded from the study. And for each study group, we have used 20 in vitro granulomas for each study groups. And the one-way ANOVA test was done for these two groups by using SPSS software. And zero point p value 0 0.05 is considered as significant. <clears throat> so coming to the gene expression studies. In both the objectives, we can able to see with respect to the dormancy uh, associated genes, the TGS1 and the HSP ex except this ICL, everything is down regulated whenever we are treating with either lower concentration or higher concentrations of PM2.5. 
whereas the reactivation associated genes were upregulated and also it is very much upregulated <clears throat> in the higher pm 2.5 group the same thing is observed in the objective 2 the dominant associated genes are down regulated and the re reactivation genes with higher concentrations are up regulated so we can infer that in both conditions with higher concentrations of pollutant the basically either survives in its active states or gets reactivated so these are the um, human cytokine assays here we can see with respect to tnf alpha when he, when it is compared with the um, Sorry, control group there is no no pollutant Sorry. group with higher concentrations of PM2.5, it is significantly upregulated. And the same thing with the interferon gamma, we can see when compared with the uh, control group, here also there is a increased levels of interferon gamma. Sorry, so we can that. infer that higher concentrations of PM2.5 promotes inflammation in the granulomatous microenvironment, suggests the active status of the mycobacterial <clears throat> bacilli. And these are the histopathological examinations. We can see with lower concentrations of PM2.5, here there is clumping of PBMCs, here and there suggests you of the granuloma, and these are their respective AFB staining. Here, in the presence of bacilli, we can able to... Dr. Yes, sir. Ah, yeah, already seven minutes over. Just in oh. oh, Okay, okay, so just two slides completing. So here, uh, in the presence of uh, P, uh, bacilli, we can able to see the clusters of uh, uh, mononuclear cells surrounding the, um, the bacilli, indicating granuloma, whereas with higher concentrations of PM2.5, there is no any granuloma. And uh, even though that bacilli is there here and there, but uh, there is uh, nothing suggestive of granuloma, even though mononuclear cells are spreaded apart. So we can infer that even in the presence of mycobacteria, the granuloma architecture was disrupted if treated with higher concentrations of pollutants. And these are the CF enumeration images <clears throat> with in both objectives. With when we compare with the control as well as with the PM two point five pollutant treated group, pollutant may not significantly affect the multiplicity of tubercle bacilli. So summarizing the study findings, gene expression study showed with the higher concentration of PM two point five, it prevents the granuloma formation at the first place itself as well as reactivates the latent mycobacterial bacilli, which is supported histologically, where it converts well defined granuloma to a ill defined form. And increased levels of cytokines in PM with higher concentration of PM2.5 suggests the active status of the mycobacterial <clears throat> bacilli. So, concluding the session, when uh, due to increased inter industrialization, there is more PM2.5 produced, which, if inhaled by the person who is already having granuloma, that is latent tuberculosis, will get reactivated, leading to active tuberculosis. Uh, thank you all for this uh, wonderful opportunity. A very well done study. Mr. Yes, ma'am. Mr. Yes, ma uh, it's an in vitro study or uh, what are the study subjects? Who are the study subjects here? In vitro or you took it in some 18 number you had given? No, no, ma'am. Actually, we collected samples from the study subjects and we isolated mm -hmm. PBMCs from those study subjects. And okay. uh, these PBMCs were uh, <clears throat> then mixed with the extracellular matrix, subjected with uh, this Yambovis BCG strain, and granuloma was developed, which is subjected to further experiments, ma'am. Uh, very thoroughly conducted study. Thank you, ma'am. Very good study. But still, uh, it is still an immature study, which is to be further carried out in and poppy have to uh, yes you... ma'am yes, ma actually this is a baseline study it has to be it has its own future perspective